Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. <laughs> Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. I understand there are no proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate, so I will call on the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response No. 1, Bill 2020, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Watt. Good morning, Mr President. Nice to see you. Um, sorry, I'll just organise my material here. <laughs> How was, your, how was your night, Mr President, while I organised my material here? It was what, sorry? A bit wet, a bit damp. It was a bit damp last night. Um, good for the farmers. <laughs> if only we had more damp. Indeed. Labor supports the passage of this bill, uh, but I'd like to foreshadow that at the end of my remarks I'll be moving a second reading amendment. Uh, we're of course talking about the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, uh, Royal Commission Response Number 1 Bill, uh, and I think all Australians would recognise that um, administration of the aged care system in this country has been one of this government's greatest failures, uh, and that is saying something. This bill will make urgent and needed amendments to the Aged Care Act to implement three measures in response to the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety and, in the case of restrictive practices, in response to the independent review of legislation provisions uh, governing the use of restraint in residential aged care. But it needs to be made clear that the government's response to the Aged Care Royal Commission falls far short of where it needs to be in terms of solving a number of key issues in the aged care system and fails to deliver enduring changes and reforms for the long term. Uh, dealing with the first key change in the legislation, the overuse of restraints in aged care. Substandard care can take many forms, and the Royal Commission concluded that 30 per cent of older people in aged care, almost one in three, has experienced some form of substandard care. The Royal Commission specifically heard about the excessive use of physical and chemical restraints in residential aged care which robs older Australians of their dignity and autonomy in their final months. Older people with mental health issues, particularly those suffering from the later stages of dementia, are often heavily medicated or physically restrained. In the final three months of 2019-20, residential aged care services made 24,681 reports of intent to restrain and 62,800 reports of physical restraint devices. Far too many people experience the aged care system as uncaring, unkind and even inhumane in its response to them and their needs. This bill will make a number of important changes in regards to restraints and restrictive practices. It will clarify the definition of restrictive practices in the Aged Care Act so that it is in line with the NDIS definition and ensures all restrictive practices that limit the freedom of uh, movement of an aged care resident are included. It will expand the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner's ability to respond to breaches of approved aged care providers' responsibilities in relation to restrictive practices with new abilities to issue written notices and make applications for civil penalty orders. And it will provide that the quality care principles are set out clearly when an aged care provider is able to consider the, the use of restrictive practices, importantly, only ever as a last resort. While it is disappointing to see the Royal Commission's recommendation around the introduction of independent expert approval for the use of restrictive practices, this bill will help prevent the use of uh, overuse of restraints and uh, restrictive practices in aged care. 
Uh, the second key change in this legislation is the introduction of assurance reviews. Uh, the introduction of assurance reviews, while not specifically recommended by the Aged Care Royal Commission, is welcome if they do as described and increase the effectiveness, efficiency and transparency of the home care system. While this move is welcome, it is disappointing that the government has not followed more closely the recommendations from the Aged Care Royal Commission to increase transparency and accountability measures. We know there are many aged care providers doing amazing work who are dedicated to the health and well-being of those in their care, uh, and that's not to mention, of course, the incredible work that aged care workers themselves perform. But we also know that there are far too many aged care providers who are not doing the right thing. While the government likes to appear that it's being tough on bad providers, when you dive into the detail of its response to the Royal Commission, so often it turns out that they're letting those providers, the bad ones, do what they want. These assurance reviews are fine, but why not make the reports and recommendations that come out of these reviews all public? Why leave this up to the Secretary of the Department of Health? This is the same person that is in charge of system governance. Could there ever be an opportunity when it wouldn't be in their interest to release one of these reviews? Labor is committed to doing things very differently here. We want to see a transparent and accountable sector, a sector where, where bad providers are not allowed to run riot and do what they please, as this government has let them do for so long. The third key change in the legislation is, repla is replacing the Aged Care Financing Authority. The government agreed to establish an advisory group to replace the authority, which will commence operations from July 2021 uh, to ensure the government continues to receive advice on financing issues of the aged care sector. A new advisory body will be established to provide advice to government on aged care financing issues. This bill and its changes are welcome. There is no doubt that these changes to rules <coughs> excuse me, around the use of restraints and restrictive practices are needed. There is no doubt that transparency and accountability in the aged care sector need to be dramatically improved. But why is this the only legislative action the government is taking right now in response to the damning and wide-ranging uh, findings of the Aged Care Royal Commission? Why is this the only bill we are seeing months after the Royal Commission handed down its final report? Where is the sense of urgency on aged care from the Morrison government? They have received 21 expert reports into the state of aged care in Australia since 20, uh, 2013. Reports that largely foreshadowed the shocking findings of the Royal Commission's eight-volume report that told us just how bad the crisis in aged care is. Given just how shocking and damning and completely unacceptable those findings were, where is the sense of urgency to fix the problems identified? Where is the sense of urgency to improve the level of care that older Australians are receiving? But maybe we, should, we shouldn't be surprised. Maybe it doesn't matter how bad things are in aged care for the Morrison government, because they like to take things slowly and take things easy. The Morrison government has neglected the aged care sector for eight years. If you need any further proof of that, just look at the title of the Royal Commission report, Neglect. That is the way the Royal Commission summarised uh, the work of this government over eight long years. This government has neglected older Australians who have received aged care services for eight years. It has neglected hard-working and dedicated aged care workers for eight years. And don't just take my word for it. The Royal Commission described the government's approach to aged care in its final report where it said, quote, At times in this inquiry, it has felt like the government's main consideration was, what the, minimum commitment it could, was, was the minimum commitment it could get away with rather than what should be done to sustain the aged care system so that it is enabled to deliver high quality and safe care. In fact, that really does sum up the approach of this government to so many issues, in particular aged care. What is the bare minimum they can get away with? This is a damning finding from the Royal Commission, absolutely damning. The crisis in aged care has been brewing for years. The 21 expert reports that are gathering dust on the minister's desk warned them that this was coming. But the government chose to neglect the aged care system for eight long years. It is a national disgrace and the ministers responsible should be ashamed for the part they have played in this crisis. Uh, despite the Royal Commission's damning words, this government's approach still seems to be to do the minimum it can get away with. At the end of the day, this is the Prime Minister's crisis. It's happened on his watch. 
When Mr Morrison was the Treasurer, he even cut funding to the sector by $1.7 billion. How can anyone trust Mr Morrison to fix the aged care crisis? How can older Australians trust Mr Morrison? How can their families trust Mr Morrison? How can aged care workers trust Mr Morrison? The Aged Care Royal Commission graphically highlighted the tragic failures of this government, failures that have happened on their watch and while they have failed to act. Failures including maggots in the wounds of residents and two-thirds of residents who are malnourished or at risk of mal malnourishment. That is two-thirds of residents who are literally starving in the care of their own government. How can anyone stand by and let that happen for eight long years? How can the government sit there and still refuse to show any real urgency while this is happening? They should be ashamed. The Morrison government has failed to listen to Australians in aged care, to their families and the workers in the system when they raise the alarm bells about the absolutely dire conditions in some residential homes. They have failed to listen to families about the impact on their lives of having to wait years to get high care needs home care packages. They have failed to listen to workers about being exhausted, about being overworked, about being under-resourced, about being underpaid and undervalued. And who can forget the performance of the aged care minister at the recent Senate estimates, where yet again he refused to back in a pay rise for aged care workers? What a way to treat the people that we depend upon to provide services and care to our elderly in our community, to our grandparents, to our parents, to our loved ones. And of course, uh, this minister, along with his predecessors, failed to listen to those 21 expert reports that the government has received on these issues. If you ask anyone to describe this government's record on aged care in one word, they will all say the same thing, neglect. But they still aren't listening, not even to the Royal Commission that they were forced into calling. They haven't learned their lesson, because their response to the Aged Care Royal Commission is, as the Royal Commission itself found, the bare minimum they think they can get away with. Not a single issue is actually fixed. The Morrison government's response to the Aged Care Royal Commission falls so far short of where it needed to be. It failed to deliver enduring improvement uh, and reforms for the long run. They have fobbed off, delayed or outright rejected key recommendations. Of the 148 recommendations, over half are not being implemented or aren't being implemented properly. So often in their response, the government claims to have accepted a recommendation, but when you actually look at the detail, times are pushed back, sometimes by years. Key sections of recommendations are often excluded. Sometimes they say they've accepted a recommendation and their response doesn't even pretend to match it. That is a very strange definition of the word accept, which is what the government claims to have done. But it's the same old behaviour we've come to expect from a government that says one thing and does another, that does the bare minimum uh, to deal with the aged care system. That, this is a government that makes a big announcement but never follows through on the detail on aged care and so many other things. The government's response to the Royal Commission falls flat in five major areas in particular. Firstly, Nothing will change without reform to the aged care workforce. There was nothing to improve wages for overstretched, undervalued and aged, uh, aged care workers. Secondly, the government is gifting $3.2 million, $3 billion to providers via a basic daily fee increase with no strings attached to ensure this goes to actual care or better food, not management bonuses or a new office fit-out. Thirdly, the government has failed to clear the home care uh, package waitlist of 100,000 people. Only 80,000 packages were included in the, in the budget over the next two years, and thousands joined the waitlist every year. The maths don't add up. This government is not going to keep pace, not even going to clear the current backlog uh, before a single new person joins that waiting list. Fourthly, the government has ignored the recommendation to require a nurse to be on duty 24-7 in residential care. This is core to improving clinical care for frail Australians. And fifthly, the government's promise of mandatory care minutes for each resident is also full of holes. It doesn't meet the Royal Commission recommendation, and we now know that cleaning and some admin will be included as care. As important as those, those roles are, um, they don't satisfy what the Royal, Royal Commission was talking about. Why bother calling a Royal Commission and then ignore so many of its recommendations? Why bother calling a Royal Commission and not fix the crisis it identifies? And that's before we get to the impact of COVID and aged care. Recently, we've seen the government's neglect of aged care residents and workers play out yet again with potentially deadly consequences. 
Because of this government's failures in quarantine and its failures in the vaccine rollout, we saw COVID-19 cases in aged care again. People are angry about it, and they have every right to be so. Last year, we lost 685 residents in aged care to COVID-19. This government left the door open to this tragedy happening again. What residents and staff went through last year was nothing less than absolutely traumatic. Residents lost their friends and their companions. And just this week, we found out that still only 30 per cent of aged care workers have had their first vaccination, and we found out yesterday that it's about 15 per cent of aged care workers who've been fully vaccinated. These people were supposed to be fully vaccinated by the end of March. They're the government's top priority, and it's only 15 per cent of people who have been fully vaccinated. But if you listen to the government talk about it, you'd be unable to tell. The Prime Minister says the vaccine rollout is not a race. The aged care minister says he's comfortable with the speed of the rollout, and neither the health minister nor the aged care minister can seem to get their numbers straight. Unless the government acknowledges their faults and their mistakes in aged care, how is anyone supposed to trust them to fix it? Right now, there is no plan from this government, and no, no plan and no targets means no urgency. In conclusion, what is absolutely clear to me is that wherever you look now, the story of aged care is don't send the Liberal and National parties on a job you only trust the Labor Party to do. The last eight years of neglect by this government has shown another three years won't make a difference. To summarise, while we welcome the changes in this legislation, the government response to the Royal Commission falls far short of where it needs to be. Uh, I have moved a second reading amendment. I'm not sure, Mr. President, whether I need to read that out in full. It's fairly lengthy. You can move it. And yeah. So I'd like to move the uh, second reading amendment in my name, which, among other things, <coughs> notes the government's failures All in relation to aged Senator care. Senator Watt, thank you. Second reading amendment is moved. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to make a contribution to the debate on the aged care and other legislation amendment, Royal Commission Response Number One, Bill 2021. The Greens welcome this bill as the government's first attempt to address the Royal Commission. But we don't think it goes far enough, and the government's response to the Royal Commission um, is basically designed to make it look like they're accepting most of the recommendations to the Royal Commission, but if you look in the detail, in fact, that is not the case. In addition, it is going to take far too long to roll out the recommendations that they do truly accept, and it's going to take far too long before we see the changes needed to our aged care system put in place. And I'll come back to that uh, in a bit more detail later on. I wanted to address some of the, the provisions in this current bill. Um, restrictive practices, which are addressed in this bill, um, have been a serious issue in aged care for more than 20 years, for a very long time. And in this place, a number of us, including myself, have been strongly advocating to an end to the use of physical and chemical restraints in aged care. Uh, for, a, for too long, restraints have been used to control older people's behaviour, including the use of dangerous antipsychotics. And they've been used to quieten people down and because the aged care facilities are not designed the way they should be. So instead of addressing the issue, what they do is restrain both physically and particularly chemically older people that are in need of, our, uh, of care um, and also of our compassion. And it is not a compassionate approach to drug somebody up to manage their behaviour or um, to physically restrain them. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety found that prevalence of restrictive practices in aged care is unacceptable and the ongoing use of restrictive practices represents severely substandard care. As expressed by the Commission in their final report, the inappropriate use of unsafe and inhumane restrictive practices in residential aged care has continued despite multiple reviews and reports highlighting the problem. It must stop now. That's the end of the quote. My comment here is, in terms of those reviews, governments, governments have not taken into, not uh, enacted those recommendations. They have been slack when it comes to these issues, and it's about time that we finally started addressing these issues properly and sending a strong message to those providers. And I'm not painting a wide brush here, but to those providers that are not doing the right thing. The introduction of the minimising the use of restraints principles in 2019 represented an important step forward in regulating restrictive practices in aged care. However, 
As I articulated in this place, they fell short in many areas, including the absence of behaviour support plans and the absence of any requirements to gain informed consent by, uh, before using chemical restraints. I'm pleased to note that this bill provides a stronger framework and better safeguards for the use of restrictive practices in aged care. Importantly, it aligns the definition of restrictive practices with the definition used in the, in the disability sector. I'm also, it also provides the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner with additional powers to respond to providers who break the rules around restrictive practices, including through the application of civil penalties. Another positive step forward is the requirement for providers to create behaviour support plans when using restrictive practices from 1 September this year. I believe that this will help providers to think through um, how, they use, how they are using restrictive practices and ensure that they are only used as a last resort. I would like to go through some of the areas where the new restrictions do unfortunately fall short. For example, the new regulations do not apply if the use of restrictive uh, practices is necessary in an emergency. Stakeholders noted concerns that the use necessary in an emergency is broad and subjective. COTA in particular raised concerns that there are no timelines in the regulations attached to an emergency. They believe that no more than seven days should be the absolute maximum period that emergency rules should apply. Allowing aged care providers to determine when an emergency has passed would provide, could provide a loophole. From our discussions with the department, we understand that using the emergency provisions on the same person more than once will constitute a red flag for the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. I, will be seeking, I do seek clarification on this matter to ensure that this is um, the case and um, uh, will be continuing to follow this up. The Royal Commission recommended that restrictive practices should only be used after alternative evidence-based strategies have been explored, applied and documented. I am concerned that the regulations qualify the need to use alternative strategies through the phrase, to the extent possible. This leaves the door open to aged care providers to determine alternative strategies only to the extent that they believe it is necessary. The Royal Commission also recommended that restrictive practices should be prohibited unless recommended by an independent expert. The regulations required approved health practitioners to approve the use of restrictive practices. However, it is unclear whether these health practitioners will need to be independent of the facility and the provider. There's a conflict of interest there if they're the health practitioner of the actual facility and the provider. As a result, aged care providers may be able to use in-house health practitioners to approve the use of restrictive practices, which, as I said, is, a, in my opinion, a clear conflict of interest. The draft regulations include chemical, physical, environmental, um, mecha uh, mechanical um, restraint and seclusion as restrictive practices. Some providers were concerned about the need to obtain consent from substitute decision makers where a person lacks the capacity to give their consent, particularly in the case of locked or secure facilities, and the impact this could have on public guardians. My understanding is that secure facilities were um, already uh, in the scope under the existing minimising the use of restraints principles. So for providers should have been seeking consent for locked or secure facilities under existing provisions. This is a really important point. I was pleased to see the draft regulations were put out for public consultation as an exposure draft, and I understand that the department did not receive much feedback and anticipate that the final version will be similar to the draft. While the regulations will provide more guidance and stronger protections, it's clear that we need to address structural issues in aged care if we are going to end the use of restrictive practices altogether. Things like staff training, minimum hours of care, adequate mixtures of staff and enough registered nurses. The Royal Commission found that the overuse of restrictive practices in aged care often comes from a lack of knowledge about restraints, their impacts and alternatives. The department must ensure that we have adequate training and education in place for providers if they are going to successfully end the use of restrictive practices in aged care. This bill also introduces home care assurance reviews on the delivery and administration of home care. Under the changes, the secretary will be able to collect information in relation to assurance um, reviews. 
The Secretary will be able to publish information on providers who do not comply with notices to produce information or provide reasonable assistance. My understanding is that the government plans to undertake, and as they said, in the, um, uh, said to the committee, um, to undertake uh, 500 home care assurance reviews in the first 12 months with a uh, focus on unjustified administration charges and overheads. Given that there are around 928 home care um, providers operating in Australia, not all providers will undergo assurance reviews, which is a concern. The department also clarified that the results of the reviews will be published on its website. While I welcome attempts by the government to approve transparency of home care fees, it's critical that the government takes more action to improve transparency and accountability across the whole of the aged care sector. Finally, this bill abolishes the aged care financing authority. Our understanding is that a new uh, advisory group reporting to the new National Aged Care Advisory Council will replace ACFA from July. We don't have further details about the new advisory group, including who will sit on the group and what level of independence it will have. Given um, the ACFA will be abolished, we expect that the government will publicly commit to a process for commissioning and publishing independent reports on the financial performance of the sector. Today, I'm calling on the government to ensure that there is no gap between the dismantling of the authority and the introduction of the new group that will provide advice on financing issues in aged care and to continue to fund and publish independent annual reports on the financial performance of the sector. The government has started its reform agenda, but there is still much work to be done and many, many unanswered questions. It's up to the government to lead on these reforms. We will continue to do everything we can to demand significant ongoing funding commitments to achieve the structural reforms required to build a safe, accessible, high-quality aged care system. At this stage, we have still got far too many issues going on in aged care. We still have enormously long waiting lists in aged care, and the ridiculousness of the situation where you, can, you have to wait nine to 12 months for levels three or four packages, and in the meantime, you get put on interim packages. Interim package wait lists for some of them are nine to 12 months. Nine to 12 months for your interim package while you're waiting for your other package, which is also a waiting list of nine to 12 months. It's a farce, an absolute farce. This situation needs a lot more urgency than the government is providing to these reforms. Where is the money in the budget for workforce pay rises? We get this weak excuse from the government that they're waiting for the fair work case, when everybody knows, everybody that has any understanding of aged care knows that carers and nurses and personnel working in aged care need a wage rise. Put it in the budget, because we are not going to, sub to improve aged care until we have a workforce that is significantly increased. And we all know, everybody again knows that we need a significantly increased workforce, and we need to pay them properly for the, for the work that they do, for the dedication that they show. Why wasn't it in the budget? Why wasn't it there? Don't hide behind the fair work case. And they're taking the fair work case because, they, because for years and years and years, aged care workers, personal care workers, nurses have been underpaid. We haven't had the right skill mix. And you're not, you can't get your workforce at the levels that you need until you're paying them properly for the hours that they put in and the work that they put in. We can't deliver the hours of care for those older Australians in aged care until we have a workforce, a workforce that is properly supported with ongoing training, with ongoing supports, where we have, a proper, where we have proper ratios in aged care. The way that the government's going when to achieve the sort of aged care system that Australians can only dream about at the moment, we are years and years and years away. Not only are we not addressing those issues, not only have we not put the, has the government not put the funding in to, so, to properly pay aged care workers, but we can't even get the vaccination process working properly. 
We can't get older Australians vaccinated, and we can't get our workers in aged care vaccinated, <coughs> despite, despite the deadly and awful lesson that was learned in Victoria last year when we saw so many deaths. You would have thought that no matter what, that the government would have guaranteed that those living in aged care, those providing the care and working so diligently in aged care would have been vaccinated by now, all those that wanted it. You would have thought that would have happened at the barest minimum, but no, it didn't happen and it hasn't happened, nor has it happened in the disability sector. We have a long way to go before we fix aged care in this country. Where's the government's commitment to all those other recommendations and making it sure it happens at a pace that is needed. It isn't there and it needs to be there. The Greens will be supporting uh, these amendments and I'll indicate that we are supporting Senator Watt's second reading amendment because we need more sense of urgency to make sure those home care packages are rolling out, to make sure that we've got the workforce there and that these the Provisions that we are actually agreeing to today, such as restrictive practices, are put into operation as soon as possible to, so that we can guarantee to older Australians that they're not going to be restrained, either physically or chemically, when they enter into aged care. Thank you. Senator Polly. Yes, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission No. 1, Bill 2021. This bill will make urgent amendments to the Aged Care Act 1997 and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission Act 2018 to implement three measures in response to recommendations of the Royal Commission into the Aged Care Quality and Safety. In the case of restrictive practices, this bill responds to in the independent review of legislation provisions governing the use of restraints in residential aged care. The Royal Commission handed down a damning account of the state of Australia's aged care sector. It's a national disgrace. Scott Morrison is responsible for the aged care system. He is responsible for the funding cuts and is responsible for the terrible neglect identified in the Royal Commission. The Liberals failed to listen to Australians in aged care, to their families and to the workers. He failed to listen to the 22 expert reports and now, even after his own Royal Commission, so we argue that this is not a, and I quote, a once in a generation reform to aged care. The Liberals had ample opportunity to reform the sector, and now I feel that they have fallen short again. In question time yesterday, we learned that only 15.6 per cent of the residential aged care staff have been fully vaccinated. They still have, don't have a register set up to track the number of staff who have been vaccinated. Just a few months ago, aged care workers were told they will get vaccinated on site in their aged care homes. That never eventuated. The Morrison government also said that they would be first in line. Now they are being told that they have to drive hours out of their way in their own time at their own expense. These workers are some of the lowest paid workers in this country, and yet they're on the front line during this pandemic. They don't necessarily have ready access to transport, and they have other commitments. So these workers should have been able to be vaccinated in their workplaces as a matter of priority. The government, the federal government, the Morrison government, have failed in the rollout of the vaccine program in this country. But let's go back to the bill. Schedule 1 of this bill makes amendments to further strengthen the legislation on the use of restrictive practices in aged care. The bill defines the term restrictive practices in the Aged Care Act in alignment with the definition applied under the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS. This is something that the Labor welcomes as the new definition is clearer than the one it replaces and ensures that all restrictive practices are included. 
The bill also expands the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner's ability to respond to breaches approved aged care providers responsible in relation to restrictive practices, which is very important. The Commissioner can issue written notices to providers who do not comply with their responsibilities, and they can also apply a civil penalty order if a provider does not comply with the written notice. The schedule will also provide that the quality care principles must set out matters in relation to restrictive practices, including when an aged care provider is able to consider the use of restrictive practices. While this schedule does provide more guidance at the first glance of the bill, in my work as the chair of the Scrutiny Bills Committee, we have questioned why a number of key matters and definitions regarding when it is appropriate to use restrictive practices will be left to delegated legislation. It is concerning that matters such as these cannot be scrutinised appropriately by the Senate. Additionally, with this uh, schedule, it seeks to provide that the quality of care principles may provide that requirements of the principles does not apply if the use of restrictive practices is necessary in an emergency. This provides the minister with extensive power to determine in delegated legislation when the requirements for the use of restrictive practices no longer apply. I will also add there is um, also nothing on the face of this bill which defines what constitutes emergency. The Royal Commission specifically heard about the excess excessive use of physical and chemical restraints in residential aged care, which robs older Australians of their dignity and autonomy. Older people with mental health issues, particularly those suffering from later stages of dementia, are often heavily medicated or physically restrained. It is so important that we help prevent the use of restrictive practices and restraints so that older Australians can age with dignity. This bill will also help issues which I still question why the minister has so much discretionary power to determine when it is appropriate and, when a definition, and why a definition for an emergency is not in this bill. I would argue that administrative flexibility is not a significant or a sufficient response. The second schedule of this Act will amend the Aged Care Act to empower the Department of Health Secretary to conduct reviews. These assurances um, reviews will ensure the arrangements for the delivery and administration of home services are effective and efficient. The assurances review will inform the continuous improvement of the home care policy and the education of approved aged care providers. The introduction of these reviews, while not specifically recommended by the Aged Care Royal Commission, is welcome. However, that is only if they do as described and increase the effectiveness, efficiency and transparency of the home care system. We know that there are many aged care providers doing amazing work who are dedicated to the health and well-being of those that they care for in particular. It's not just the providers, it's more important the workers who are carrying out this care. But we also know that there are far too many providers who are not. It is highly concerning that an additional $17.7 billion will be spent throughout the aged care sector without what Labor would deem an adequate level of transparency and accountability measures. Every dollar that is spent in the aged care sector by the government should be going into care and not per providers' profits, and we fear that given the current parameters, this cannot be guaranteed. Now, the third schedule makes there are amendments relating to the Aged Care Financial Authority, the ACFA. The government replaced ACFA with a new working group that will report to the National Aged Care Advisory Council. The council was recommended by the Royal Commission under Recommendation 7. It is also about time. The Liberals did overall ACFI and the Aged Care um, uh, financing instrument, because we've known for many, many years, and the eight years of which this Liberal government has been in power, that it was an outdated system and it did, in fact, need replacement. The government has only just sat on reports, and this re 
support um, in particular they've had for the last four years. So this government has been dragging its feet, trying uh, to delay putting appropriate levels of funding into the aged care sector, uh, then had to call its own Royal Commission into their own failings and what five or six ministers sort of had responsibility for aged care sector in this country under the Liberals during the last eight years. They finally called a, a Royal Commission into their own failings. But it is disappointing to see that the government's response to the Royal Commission's final report, titled Neglect, falls short of resolving a number of key issues within the aged care sector. It will also fail to deliver the improvements and reforms for the long term. Mr Morrison's failed to listen to Australians in the aged care sector. He's failed to listen to the family and, in particular, he's failed to listen to the warnings of those people working in this sector. There's been 22 reports handed down to this government alone, and they've failed to act. And now we see they're still failing to act on all the recommendations of their own royal commission. Now the Liberals are failing to deliver significant reform. We know that the aged care workers in this country do a fantastic job. The majority of them are very dedicated, but they're overstretched and they're underpaid. And we know that there was an opportunity for this government to put in a recommendation of support to ensure that aged care workers in this country received a pay rise. But what did the government do? Nothing. Nothing at all. Now we know that the number of aged care workers will almost need to triple to over a million workers by 2050. How can we attract people into the sector if we, st we are allowing wages to start, currently stay at $21.09 an hour? How can we improve the care and quality in the aged care sector if we don't acknowledge the properly remunerated staff? is warranted and is deserved in this country. Yet they're, sen they're sending $3.2 billion to providers with basically no strings attached. There is no real guarantee that any of that money will go to provide actual better care, better food and better uh, pay to these workers. That money should not be going into management's fitting out of their offices. That money needs to go to ensure that older Australians are treated with dignity and they get the care that they deserve. This government has also ignored the recommendations of the Royal Commission to provide a nurse 24-7, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, because without having appropriately staffed nursing, um, available to them, what we see is older Australians ending up in accident and emergency, being left in emergency rooms, waiting for hours and hours to be treated. This is not good enough. What we need to see is that the full recommendations that 250 mandatory care minutes per resident is provided in residential aged care. Again, staffing levels are central to many of the areas of quality care problems that we have seen and has been reported over so many years to being rectified. Now, look, I am happy to say that the Tasmanian Liberal government yesterday made the announcement that they're putting $3 million into training for aged care and disability workers. Fantastic. Always acknowledge money that's invested into these areas. But again, what we aren't seeing is any assurances that we are going to stop. What we see is a transient uh, workforce within the aged care sector. People are using it as a measure to have a job while they're looking for something that pays better wages. What we need to ensure is that we have the best trained, highly skilled, motivated, well-paid workforce in this sector and in disabilities. But again, we've seen, if we go to the area of home care packages, we've seen the failings of this government under Scott Morrison, who used this sector as his own personal ATM machine, left minister after minister who has failed in this sector 
day in, day out. He reappointed uh, Senator Colbeck, again, Minister for Responsibilities in this area, overseeing, and I must say, most of the real decisions are being made by Minister Hunt. So what is left is uh, somebody who we have seen demonstrate in this chamber every single time he's asked a question in relation to aged care or vaccination of older Australians, vaccinations of aged care workers, we see him fail to be across the issues. This government has failed to deliver on home care packages to people who have been assessed at needing the highest care in this country. The level four package failed to deliver that in a timely manner. They have announced more money to go into aged care packages, but they've done nothing to ensure that there's the aged care workers who can deliver that care in a timely manner at level four and level three. So again, this is a government uses smoke and mirrors. They like to make these announcements, but they are never there for the follow-up. Now, Scott Morrison is responsible as a former treasurer in taking billions of dollars. Time and time again, he has used this sector as his own ATM and spent that money in other areas. And now we're in a crisis. We have been in a crisis for the last eight years, and we've seen this government fail at every opportunity to turn this around. They failed so much that they had to call their own Royal Commission into their own failings. That's how good this government is. And Mr Morrison says to the Australian people, aged care is a priority. Well, I would hate to see this Prime Minister if this wasn't a priority Time. because it's a bungled Senator Polly system. Has expired. Gu Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also rise to speak on the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response No. 1 Bill 2021. Now, this bill is in response to the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety, which handed down its final report in March this year. And while Labor supports this bill, the government's broader response to the Royal Commission has to be said has been inadequate. And I want to use this opportunity today to speak to that because the Liberals have failed to provide an adequate and sufficient plan to provide the reform to the aged care sector that we know we need. They have failed to listen to Australians in aged care, to their families and to the workers in the aged care sector. They are not stepping up to deliver all of the enduring improvements we know are necessary to ensure all Australians live out their later years with the dignity that they deserve. Let us be clear. Aged care is a responsibility of the federal government. This makes aged care Prime Minister Morrison's responsibility. The Prime Minister, we've seen time and time again, likes to shirk his responsibilities. There's always someone else to blame. It's always someone else's problem. But on aged care, he cannot. The job of regulating aged care and the providers within it fall squarely on the shoulders of our federal government, a federal government that for eight long years has presided over a system that the commissioners evidently felt in handing down their interim report could be summarised in just one word, neglect. The Royal Commission heard absolute horror stories of the treatment of older Australians of black and blue bruises from falls ignored or dismissed, of the abuse of chemical and physical restraints. We heard that an appalling two-thirds of aged care residents were malnourished or at risk of being malnourished. That's two-thirds of our elderly fellow citizens in residential care not getting enough to eat. And we heard of people being fed on just six dollars a day. It's just absolutely grotesque, absolutely grotesque, and of 100,000 people waiting for home care packages, which would allow them to enjoy some independence while they remain well enough. And we've had 28,000 Australians die waiting for one of these packages in the last two years alone. We owe so much more to older Australians. In many ways, they built the society that we share now. Everyone knows 
someone in aged care, has a loved one in aged care or expects to have a loved one in aged care at some point. All of our elderly, everyone, every Australian in aged care deserves so much better than what this government has presided over. So while Labor supports this bill, it has to be said the government's broader response to the Royal Commission has not been good enough. And through the term of this government, they've received 22 reports while in office about the state of aged care. Now they are ignoring or failing to fully accept the key recommendations of their Royal Commission. So, sorry, key recommendations of their Royal Commission. And the government's failure is particularly pronounced when it comes to workforce issues in our aged care sector. They have either ignored, delayed or outright rejected key recommendations designed to address the poor wages, conditions and job security of workers in this sector. Now, Labor knows the vast majority of aged care workers are dedicated individuals who go that extra mile to do what they can with already stretched time and resources to care for people's loved ones. I know many of them suffer immense distress when they're not able to provide the level and standard of care they know residents deserve because they are not being supported to do so. These workers are truly essential to our society and to our economy, and that has just been on full display these past couple of years, how incredibly important and essential that their work is. But you would never know that from the way that they've been treated by this government and the way their needs as a workforce have been ignored. The government has failed to implement the Commission's recommendation of minimum standards for the amount of time qualified staff spend each day with residents, and the Prime Minister needs to explain why he has failed to accept this recommendation. Also the recommendation that a nurse be on premises at all times in residential facilities. Labor has been consistent in arguing that nothing will change in aged care without better support for the workforce. The Productivity Commission estimates Australia will need 700,000 additional aged care workers by 2050 due to our ageing population. It can and should be an opportunity for well-paid, secure and profoundly meaningful work for hundreds of thousands of Australians. Yet the government has no plan to increase wages of nurses and carers. Can they name just one thing, one meaningful thing they've done to provide genuine and meaningful support to workers in this industry or to make it an attractive industry, one that matches the level of importance to our society that it deserves? It is for these reasons, amongst others, that Labor is moving a second reading amendment to the bill, calling out the government's broader failures in aged care, and I hope it enjoys the support of this chamber. After eight long years of neglect of our aged care system and our older Australians, it is only Labor who can be trusted to design and implement the real reforms necessary to ensure every Australian gets to age with dignity, comfort and respect. Unlike this government, who has taken a bare minimum approach rather than the deep structural reform required to fix residential aged care. Before I conclude my remarks, I do just want to take an opportunity to acknowledge the incredible aged care workers in my home state of South Australia, some of whom I was lucky enough to meet when they came on a parliamentary delegation recently. These were aged care workers in all sorts of roles, from caring for residents but also working more behind-the-scenes roles in our aged care facilities, working as cooks and attendants, supporting our elderly in need. And these workers had harrowing stories for me of the things they wanted to be able to do, the support they wanted to be able to provide to the residents in their care. But they felt so under-supported and they felt so undervalued. They felt like, particularly during this pandemic, where their work has become incredibly dangerous and they've feared what might happen if they contract COVID and, and pass it on to residents within their care. They've been very distressed about that reality and they're very distressed about failures in the vaccine rollout, failures that mean that they're not protected at work and they're not able to provide the protection for the residents they care for and that the residents they care for 
aren't protected to the extent that they should be. It's very distressing for these workers, very distressing. And I just want to acknowledge them and acknowledge that the incredible work they're doing. They're waiting for more support from the federal government. They're waiting to be heard and to be given the reforms in their sector, which mean they can go into work each and every day and provide that care and assistance to those that they look after. And Labor supports those workers. We're listening to them. We understand how tough it has been, how very, very tough it has been. And we will continue to raise these issues in this chamber to make sure that aged care workers' voices are heard, to make sure that residents in aged care are heard and supported. Because it's just not good enough to let these workers and these residents be ignored. The Royal Commission findings were absolutely harrowing. And I know everyone in this chamber found them deeply distressing and disturbing. So now as legislators, it's our opportunity to act, to get it right, to look at the recommendations to not do the bare minimum to just get by, but to do everything we need to ensure that, that we are doing the absolute maximum to support our workforce and those living within aged care. In conclusion, Labor will be supporting this bill. We are supporting this bill because it goes some of the way towards fixing serious problems within our aged care system. But we do not stand here pretending it fixes everything. We think it does the bare minimum that it needs to do, and that's simply not good enough. It's simply not good enough for workers in residential aged care. It's simply good enough, not good enough for residents who need genuine and meaningful reform. But that said, we will support it. We need some action. We need some action, and we'll, we will be moving amendments to try and get this right, to get it done better. Okay. I'm, I can keep. You okay, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I thank senators who have contributed to the debate. Uh, this bill makes uh, three urgent changes to deliver the first stage of aged care reform delivered in response to the Royal Commission and to ensure that senior Australians receive the high quality and safe aged care they deserve. From 1 July 2021, this bill introduces important limitations on the ability for approved providers to use restraints and strengthens protections for aged care recipients from any abuse associated with this practice. The term restraint will be replaced with restrictive practices, continuing regulatory harmonisation with the disability sector. Further and more specific details of the strengthened obligations on approved providers will be prescribed by the Quality of Care Principles 2014. The bill and the amended principles provide a framework to minimise the use of restrictive practices. The amendments do not authorise the use of restrictive practices where it is otherwise unlawful. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner's powers will be expanded to include the ability to give a written notice if a provider does not comply with its responsibilities relating to the use of restrictive practices and the ability to apply for a civil penalty order if they do not comply with the written notice. The bill establishes an annual program of risk risk-based assurance reviews of home care providers. The Secretary of the Department of Health will be able to require approved home care providers and their employees to provide information for the purposes of program assurance and to prepare and publish reports on the assurance reviews. This builds on our existing work to improve transparency of the aged care sector and fosters community confidence in the costs of the care they receive. <coughs> Excuse me. The bill also repeals the requirement for the Minister to establish the Aged Care Financing Authority, the ACFA. An advisory group will be established to replace ACFA from July 2021 to ensure the government continues to receive advice on financing issues of the aged care sector. Again, I thank senators for their contributions to debate on this bill. The health, safety and well-being of senior Australians is of the utmost importance to the government and is driving our plan for generational change of the aged care system. 
Senators, there is, I understand there is a second reading amendment, so I intend to put that question. I put the question that the second reading amendment on sheet 1337 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Never. I don't think Labor were put for the second Sorry, reading. Sorry, just have to change that. Yes. Sorry. With the forbearance of the uh, senators, I will Sorry. wait. Sorry. So I had put. I, I had just. I can put the question again. So we, no. The division has already been put. So. So I'm happy to put the question, the question again. This is on the second reading amendment on sheet 1337. So I have put that question, but I'm happy to put it again if you seek leave. Yes, is leave granted? Leave is granted. So we're, we're at the juncture that uh, we've come to the end of me member senators' contributions on the second reading and the minister has spoken. And I'll put the question again, which is in relation to the second reading amendment 1337. I I already, yeah, it's already been moved. I had moved the amendment earlier. With me to proceed yes, thanks. Yeah. So I'm going to put the question again. I put the question that the second reading amendment on sheet 1337 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Yeah. Seek a division. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is, the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt be agreed to? The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell her for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 27. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Thank you. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care and for related purposes. The question before the chamber is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of the question say aye. Being circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care and for related purposes. The government business order of the day, number two, COVID-19 disaster payment funding arrangements bill, 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak in support of the COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill 2021. Labor will be supporting this bill because we stand in support of workers across Australia who face lockdowns as a result of this government's gross incompetence in managing uh, the COVID outbreaks and particularly the vaccine rollout and quarantine. Let's be really clear. The only reason this bill is necessary is because of the Prime Minister's failure on vaccines and quarantine. If the Prime Minister had done his job, he, we wouldn't be in this situation. 
This Prime Minister and this government began this year with two simple jobs. Get the vaccine rollout happening, build purpose-built quarantine stations to keep Australians safe, to keep Australians in work, to keep our economy ticking over. They have comprehensively failed on both of those jobs. And hour by hour, this situation gets worse. We know that Melbourne in, in recent weeks has been through more lockdowns uh, because of breaches from hotel quarantine uh, and because of the low rates of vaccination in the community. Two jobs that were the Prime Minister's job and this government's job that they failed to do. In the last few days, we've seen much of Sydney all but locked down, again, because of breaches of hotel quarantine and because of the low rates of vaccination uh, uh, overseen and delivered by this government. And only in the last hour we have learned that in my home state of Queensland we now have three cases of COVID, possibly more. And again, what is the cause? Hotel quarantine breaches and a poor vaccination rollout. The government's failures aren't just talking points, they're not just academic exercises, they have real life consequences for Australians. We are now in a situation where, across the entire eastern seaboard, in each of the capital cities, we are facing some combination of lockdowns, of restrictions, in some cases people losing their jobs, and of course, terribly, some people actually contracting COVID. The government's failures have consequences. The consequences aren't only the need to introduce this legislation and put more uh, of the responsibility for payments onto the taxpayer. They are costing people their health, they are costing people their jobs, they are costing people uh, their movement. We look around the world and we see comparable nations like the US and the UK having vaccinated tens of millions of people. Every week the United States, for example, is vaccinating more people than what Australia has managed in months. These are the nations that we seek to compare ourselves to, and they are so far ahead of us it is not funny. And again, because of the government's failures on quarantine and vaccination, Australians are paying the price. It is a very serious issue that this government is not taking seriously. Three capital cities on our eastern seaboard now facing lockdowns or having just come out of them, uh, and job losses, money lost out of the economy, people getting sick, with the potential for things to get worse. Let's just look at what's happened in Sydney over the last few days. The numbers started out small from one hotel quarantine breach and have escalated to a point where several councils, several sub suburbs are all but shut down. And now we're seeing it in Brisbane as well. At some point, this Prime Minister has got to take responsibility for this matter. He has got to take responsibility for the two jobs that he had coming into this year. Building quarantine stations, purpose-built quarantine stations, and getting the population vaccinated. I, think I've, I don't remember the exact figures, but I think we're talking about, at the moment, it's about 4 per cent of the Australian population has been fully vaccinated. 4 per cent. If you did an exam and got 4 per cent, that would be a miserable failure. You're barely even on the scoreboard. And that's what this government and this Prime Minister, that is the situation that he's left our country in. Again, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think we're up to about 24, 25 hotel quarantine breaches. Probably with today's example, it's even higher still. How many times does this Prime Minister and this government need to see quarantine breaches, poor vaccination rates before they actually take control? It is, it is an absolute repeat of what we saw from this Prime Minister during the bushfire crisis. He didn't hold a hose then. He doesn't hold a dose now. This Prime Minister just will not take action. And, and his coalition partners, the National Party, what have they spent the week doing? Stabbing each other in the back. How do you think Australians feel when they look at this government at the moment? Despair. I'll take that interjection, Senator McCarthy. Total despair, 
total distrust, what they see is a government that is completely focused on themselves rather than on getting Australians vaccinated and kept safe from uh, COVID through quarantine stations. I mean, we know that this Prime Minister, if he's nothing else, he is a poll-driven marketing man. Every poll you look at—I mean, let's forget about the public health benefits of this for a moment—every po every poll you look at, Australians want purpose-built quarantine stations. But we have a Prime Minister who is so belligerent, so stubborn, so focused on constructing fights with state premiers that he won't even sit down and talk about a quarantine station in Queensland. The Queensland government has been trying for months to get this government to engage on a, on a quarantine station in Queensland, right next to an airport, right next to a hospital. And this, all you ever hear from this Prime Minister is there's not enough detail, there's not enough detail. But you ask, OK, what detail do you need? There's not enough detail, there's not enough detail. It is just absolute rubbish from this Prime Minister just being stubborn because he doesn't want to sit down and take control of this situation and take responsibility for what is going on and lead the country. And as I say, it, we, his coalition partners, the National Party, completely obsessed with who gets to drive in the big car, who gets the big office, who gets the biggest hat, who gets the biggest pay rise. As our leader Anthony Albanese has said, it is time for this government to get focused. More jabbing, less stabbing. That's what we need from this government. So obsessed with stabbing each other in the back, which they've been doing for three years, let's face it, in the National Party. Plus photo ops. And let's not forget the photo ops. I mean, remember the photo op with the Prime Minister, you know, with his Australia mask? He, he didn't wait to get vaccinated. He was out there, he was quick out of the blocks with the, you know, V for victory. That, that, that's how this Prime Minister, it's, it's, he, he had a victory, he had a personal victory, he got a vaccination. He was fine. What about the other 96 per cent of the Australian population who can't get a vaccination? Because this government didn't do enough vaccine deals. And he can travel overseas. The Prime Minister can travel overseas. No other Australian can. The Prime Minister can get a vaccination, two vaccinations, fully vaccinated. He can travel overseas. He can go and do a bit of sightseeing. He can go and have a pub crawl. Not in si you can't even have a pub crawl in Sydney, mm. but this Prime Minister is having a pub crawl in Cornwall, overseas, half, half a world away. He can go and inspect the graves of his dead relatives who have been dead for 200 years. I know Australians who can't go to the funeral of their parents and their grandparents who died last week, but this Prime Minister can do that. And of course, he gets his own little quarantine arrangement where he sort of beams down Orwellian style into the parliament that no other Australian can get. It is one rule for this government and this Prime Minister and one rule for everyone else. We see it over and over again. And we see this complete failure to take responsibility that is literally putting Australians' lives at risk literally putting Australian jobs at risk, because this Prime Minister is so belligerent, so stubborn, so refusing to take responsibility that Australians pay the price. It's happening in Brisbane now, it's been happening in Sydney, it's happening in Melbourne, and it won't take long, I'm sure, before it starts happening in other states and territories. It is unacceptable. If there, is, if there is one thing the Australian people want this Prime Minister to do, it is to take responsibility, get us vaccinated, build purpose-built quarantine stations so that we don't have to turn on the news every night to learn about the next breach of hotel quarantine, because there will be more. Jane Holton, the government's own appointee to review the quarantine system, recommended months ago that we have purpose-built quarantine. But that's just yet another report delivered to this government sitting at the bottom drawer. They know what to do. Every expert has told them what to do. Get people vaccinated, sign multiple vaccine deals, roll out the vaccine, 
build purpose-built quarantine stations, but they continue to refuse to do it. And as I say, it has consequences. Australians pay the price. And that's what brings us to this bill, which is about providing financial assistance to some of the victims of this Prime Minister's complete failure to do his job. Now, I'm sure that the Victorians who will receive these payments and have been receiving these payments are grateful for the fact that payments are being made. That is a good thing. It is another example of something that Labor had to drag this government to do. Just like we saw with JobKeeper, where they didn't want to have wage subsidies, I think the Prime Minister's quote was that it was a dangerous step. And we all remember those queues outside Centrelink, people who were forced onto the dole queues because this Prime Minister was too stubborn to do wage subsidies until he was kicks, kicking and screaming into doing it, and the same with these payments. For days we saw Victorians locked down, losing their jobs, the Prime Minister refusing to step up. Oh, it's a state responsibility, it's a local government responsibility, it's someone else's responsibility, it's this responsibility, but anyone else's responsibility. He's got ten arms running around pointing at other people rather than actually having one finger which puts it on him, his job. So Victorians, I think, will be happy that they're getting these payments, but you know what? I reckon they'd be a lot happier if they didn't have to get them in the first place. I reckon they'd be a lot happier if they could just get vaccinated and be kept safe from hotel quarantine breaches. So this bill will provide time-limited assistance to eligible workers who are unable to earn their usual income as a result of public health restrictions. It contains two parts. The first creates a special appropriation to draw funds from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the payment of the COVID-19 disaster payment over the next financial year. The second part of the bill creates a reporting requirement through the new National Recovery and Resilience Agency for payments through the special appropriation. So essentially this bill guarantees that funding will be available to activate recovery payments for workers affected by lockdowns. And that's why the opposition will be supporting this bill. It's something we called for well before the Prime Minister agreed to it. What this bill doesn't do is lock in eligibility criteria for this payment, which we know during the recent COVID lockdown in Victoria left many struggling workers and families out in the cold. Labor will continue to fight to make sure that all workers hit by COVID are properly supported by this government. Supporting this bill will not change that. Now, as I say, we know that the Prime Minister was dragged kicking and screaming by the opposition and the Victorian government to provide any support to workers during this lockdown, just like this Prime Minister and this government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to make JobKeeper payments available when COVID first hit this country. If it were up to the Prime Minister, he would have done what he's always done—blame the states and then do nothing. But Australians are starting to see through this Prime Minister. And the truth is, the reason we're still having lockdowns and the reason why this legislation is necessary is because the Prime Minister has failed to bring this pandemic under control. He's had two jobs, the vaccine rollout and quarantine, and he has failed at both. Only about 4 per cent of Australia has received both doses of a COVID vaccine. We're so far back in the queue, you can't even imagine seeing the front of it. And last week, the government said that only one out of 11 workers were fully vaccinated. Yesterday, we found out it's about 15 per cent of aged care workers have been fully vaccinated. It, that's priority 1A. It doesn't get any higher than priority 1A, and it's 15 per cent of aged care workers. You know, it is a disgrace, and it's a high-risk situation. Get with the program. Get on with it. Every other country around the world that we like to compare ourselves as getting on with it, they've vaccinated millions of people, tens of millions of people. We can't even get to 5 per cent, and Australians are paying the price. How much money has been lost from local economies, local economies because of lockdowns? How many jobs have been lost because of this government's failure? And he continues to say it's not a race. It is a race, and we are coming bone miserable last. We support this bill, but we really want to see the government do its job. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the debate on the COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill of 2021. This bill establishes a special appropriation to allow the Commonwealth to fund the, Commonwealth, uh, to fund the COVID-19 Disaster Payments. The two most recent week, the two um, week recent lockdown in Melbourne was the first following the end of the JobKeeper wage subsidy. 
This left many workers, particularly casual workers and those, looking, those on temporary uh, visas, without a source of income. And that takes me first off to the fact that we are doing nothing about addressing the increasingly insecure work in this country and the fact that so many people have to pick, put together a series of casual jobs on casual, insecure hours. In, resulting in insecure wages in this country that leads them to being in this position where they are without uh, income from, in many instances, from if they're working two or three jobs, from the two or three casual insecure jobs that they have. The government ended JobKeeper much too early, despite warnings that there, there would be more COVID uh, outbreaks, particularly when you bear in mind the issue around the failure shambles of the rollout program for the vaccines and also the failures in hotel quarantining. Hotels are not meant for quarantining. They were absolutely essential as stopgap measures when the pandemic first hit, but we've had a significant period of time now to put in place secure, purpose-built quarantine facilities modelled on the Howard Springs approach. It's not as if Australia doesn't know what works and hasn't got the experts that have been providing expert advice on what does and doesn't work, not to mention the fact that the government well, it mouths the words about aerosols and the need to improve ventilation, and yes, we're paying attention to, vent to aerosols. We still don't have nationally consistent guidelines on aerosols. They mouth the words, but they're not doing much about it. So, because of that, it was inevitable that we would have further COVID outbreaks, unfortunately. And they very cruelly, very cruelly cut the job seeker payment, as we know. They did the right thing at the beginning. And we all in this chamber said they were doing the right thing in terms of doubling the rate of job seeker. Um, but what they did in the midst of this pandemic took it back, took that away in a cut by cut process, took it away. And then pretended that they had increased job seeker. Pretended, I say that because it's now it was forty dollars just forty dollars a day, and now it's just under forty four dollars a day. I challenge anybody on the government benches to try and live on forty four dollars a day, and we all know you can't. We all know you can't, and the government knows that because they doubled job seeker at the beginning of the pandemic. They did the right thing. They knew people couldn't survive on just $40 a day in a lockdown, and they doubled it. And we saw and I, in this morning, and I was at a, at a breakfast about women's uh, economic futures. And in fact, we were talking about the fact that it was raised by Theresa Edwards, who's the CEO of Single Mothers and Their Children's National Council of that where she very clearly articulated the benefits that that doubling had on families, on, particularly on single parent families and single mothers. It had a significant positive benefit, and here the government is not taking those same measures but, in fact, inflicting uh, a may, may, doing it in order, doing it in a way that they could say to the public and the, to Australians, "Oh, we've increased job seeker. Don't you worry about that. We've increased it." Well, measly three dollars a day um, does not address the significant poverty that people are living in. So, in the middle of the pandemic, people are back to, just, to trying to survive on a payment on job seeker of just forty-four dollars a day. This bill gives minimal support and does not go far enough to ensure that people who can't work or have additional costs due to lockdown are adequately supported. It's simply inadequate. It really is just plain, plain cruelty that people on income support are denied access to this disaster payment. The low rates, the way it's being imposed, and I'll go into more details of that in a minute, but to add insult to injury, people on income support um, can't get it. We know very well that people on the job seeker payment, youth allowance, DSP and carer payments also lose work during lockdowns and face additional costs to stay safe at home and healthy during lockdowns. This bill also says that if people have got some savings, they, what they call liquid assets, above $10,000, they are not entitled to any payment at all. So if you've been saving for your first home, and then you've found yourself without any income, through no fault of your own, the federal government would say, says, 
dip into your home savings and do it potentially indefinitely. If some people drew down their savings from their super and put, or put it in and put it into their savings to try and get through the lockdown, they will get punished for doing something that the government encouraged them to do. In other words, they're dipping in, they're having to dip into that to get by when if they hadn't done that, that money'd still be in their super. They're not going, if they've done this, to be able to get access to this payment. This bill needs to be fixed. It's got a number of flaws. This bill needs to be fixed to ensure that people don't fall through the cracks and to ensure that people aren't left in poverty during these lockdowns. If, you've had an income support, if we had an income support system in this country that gave people enough to live on and doesn't condemn them to poverty, we might not have to be in this situation where the government has to make hotspot by hotspot refinements. If everybody had, a, had at a minimum an eligibility for the amount of money that they in fact got when JobSeeker was doubled, which the government by its own omissions knows is what Australians need to get to live on so that they can live above the poverty line, then we might not need to be making such special purpose payments. Let's fix our social security system. If the minimum wage were higher and casual work and contracting didn't leave people living hour by hour, hour by hour of work that they can find, struggling to make ends meet, then we might not have the need to have these sorts of payments quite so much. If people weren't in insecure work, if people didn't have to stitch together several casual jobs and insecure jobs to make ends meet, we might not, we might not be in this situation. The government should look beyond what is the very least we can do. The need to look at what has happened as a sign of a huge problem of growing inequality in this country, of growing insecure work, and look at how we fix it. Instead, we have a, system, a piecemeal approach that leaves people anxious, insecure, which has a significant impact on their well-being. We've already seen the huge impact that the pandemic has had on people's mental health, on their well-being and anxiety. We've seen a huge increase in the need for uh, mental health supports, for example. This is, of course, the pandemic is having an impact on everyone in this country. But if you don't know literally where your next dollar is coming from, it has an even more significant impact on your well-being and mental health. We have a huge problem where we have a significant number of people that are literally living pay to pay, week to week. If they miss shifts or if they have to pay for extra services because of lockdown, they are simply unable to make ends meet. It is critical that people who have lost income through lockdown have access to adequate support to ensure that they, to ensure that they can put food on the table and they can keep a roof over their heads. The criteria set by the government in the middle of Victoria's last lockdown just doesn't do it. It doesn't go far enough. Too many people are left behind and have just been ignored. The Greens will be moving amendments, as I have already circulated in the chamber, to fix this bill and to make it fairer. The Greens amendments will remove eligibility criteria requiring the chief medical officer to declare the location a hotspot change the eligibility criteria from more than seven days to seven days or more, remove the criteria requiring recipient, uh, recipients to have liquid assets of less than $10,000, because that's simply unfair to so many people saving to try and buy their own home, for example, and remove the criteria preventing people in income support from accessing the payment. I ask the Senate to support the Green Amendments so that we can fix this bill and ensure the disaster payment is accessible to more people and to help ensure that they are not thrown into poverty 
every time there is a lockdown or every time they have to dip into their savings for a home. And yesterday, or the day before yesterday, we had a debate on the housing crisis. On Tuesday, we had a debate on the housing crisis in this country. So here we have people saving, desperately saving, to get a deposit for their first home, for their first term, which we know is increasingly harder in this country. And what the government's saying is, well, you pay out of that money when a lockdown, due to no fault of your own, when a lockdown is imposed, because it has to be, because of the current failures in quarantining and in our vaccine program. You pay for it out of your deposit for your first home, which we already know that you've struggled to put together that deposit. And you're actually struggling to find to be able to afford a home because we know of the, gr of the growing un uh, unaffordable housing market in this country. But it's okay. You dip into that and you pay for lockdown. That is not fair. That is not what I would call a fair Australia. That's why we will be moving these amendments to make this bill and payment fairer, so that fewer people in this country are condemned to poverty and this crisis doesn't fuel the poverty crisis in this country where we know more and more people are now falling below the poverty line and this payment will mean that more people do fall before, below the poverty line we will be supporting labor's second reading amendment I ask the Chamber to support the Greens amendments in the Committee of the Whole to make this bill fair so more Australians are supported rather than the least do the, so we can do the best we can for people if they have to go into lockdown, not the least, which is what this bill does. Senator, what's the point of order? Or? Uh, uh, I realise I've spoken already, um, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The one thing I forgot to do was to move my second reading amendment as well. If I, if I could just ask for leave to do that. Thank you. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. So um, you have leave, but I didn't hear you. I didn't listen. I didn't hear a movement. Uh, I move the second reading amendment circulated in my name. Thank you, S Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise too to speak on the COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill 2021. The first part of the bill creates a special appropriation to draw funds from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the payment of COVID-19 disaster payment. The second creates a reporting requirement for payments through the special appropriations. I would like to first note that this bill would not have been necessary if the government was in fact a competent government. The Australian people know too well that this tired old Morrison government has mishandled the pandemic from the very outset. They have mishandled the rollout of the vaccine and have mishandled quarantine. To this day, only 3 per cent of Australians have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. The only reason this legislation is before this place is because of the Morrison government's many failures to bring this pandemic under control. Whether through the vaccine rollout, hotel quarantine, cutting off of JobKeeper in an ongoing pandemic, this government has failed Australian workers. They have failed Australian businesses. Now, we also have seen firsthand the ongoing failure of this government when it comes to them cutting the supplement that was being paid to aged care workers to prevent them from having to do what too many of them do on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is work across multiple aged care homes. That supplement was there in recognition, I might add, that this government has done nothing to raise the remuneration of these frontline, hardworking, committed workers in the aged care sector. So they gave them a supplement 
during the pandemic uh, initially so that they wouldn't be forced to work across multiple aged care homes to try and assist with containing uh, the pandemic. But they lifted that far too early. And then what did they have to do when Victoria went back into lockdown? They had to re-engage uh, and uh, go back to funding that supplement. Now, every Australian has felt for the Victorian community in as far as they have had now a number of lockdowns. But what we have seen is from this government that the money that was allocated to the Victorians was less than $3 for each Victorian who was forced to lock down. So for many uh, Victorian workers, and again, for very many, particularly small businesses in Victoria, that was far too little, far too late. And those Victorians, as fellow Australians, deserve so much better from this government. Now, Mr Frydenberg has only coughed up a fraction of the $100 million a day the Treasury Secretary warned could be lost because of this lockdown. Victorians shouldn't have to be out of pocket because it was not their doing uh, to have to go into their fourth lockdown. It has clearly been the Morrison government's responsibility to roll out the vaccines in this country. It took them a while to admit actually that that was their responsibility, particularly from their aged care minister. But they also have the fundamental responsibility of quarantine. And they again have failed in both of those. Now, we've heard Mr Morrison say on a number of occasions that the rollout of the vaccine isn't a race. Well, hello, Mr Morrison. There's not another Australian out there in the community that might be in part of your um, party room that would believe that there isn't a race to roll out this vaccine, because, in fact, it is a very important race that we get ahead of the pandemic, because the pandemic has two fronts to it. One is the health outcome, and we've seen Australians die. The second is the effects of this pandemic on our economy, on Australian workers, on Australian jobs. Now, only 3 per cent, 3 per cent of Australians have had both jabs and are fully vaccinated. Again, a failing of this government to meet its own announcements of when this rollout would be completed and they would be able to vaccinate and keep Australians safe. Australians want to return to normality. That's what they want to do. We want visitors visiting my island state of Tasmania, hotel workers, people in the hospitality and the tourism sector, they want to be able to know that they can go back to running their business and employ their workers and know that there's not going to be any further lockdowns. But to ensure that that happens, the government should have, from the outset, addressed the reality that hotels, as they are everywhere else in the world, are built to accommodate people for either business or holidays, but they're not actually built for a pandemic, when there's a pandemic as severe as what we have now with COVID-19, and now the uh, mutations of that is proving that hotels are, in fact, the worst place in inner cities around this country, the worst place to house people that are going into quarantine. So this government, again, has failed to provide around the country purpose-built quarantine facilities. Now we have one, and there's not been one outbreak from that centre. Surely even the slow learners on that side of the chamber and the slow learnings of the Prime Minister can see that that's a failure, a failure to continue to 
have quarantined in our cities, in hotels. And what we've seen over the course of this pandemic from those opposite, they love to come in to the chamber and blame Victorian state government for the quarantine failures here. Well, yes, there were learnings. There were learnings in relation to those people that was meant to be providing uh, security. But those lessons around the country by the state governments have been overwhelmingly learnt. But this government has not learnt the lesson to ensure that Australians are kept safe while they try and roll out the vaccine, which they have bundled. It's almost like everything these people touch, they stuff. But they haven't learnt the fundamental responsibility that they have, and that is to ensure there's adequate, safe, purpose-built quarantine in this country. Now, what we have also seen from this government in a very important sector in this country, one where there's a lot of vulnerable Australians, and that's the aged care sector, haven't ha been able to roll out the vaccines for workers in the aged care sector, nor in disability sector, and they still haven't got a reliable uh, methodology of getting reporting of tangible evidence of how many workers in either the aged care sector or disability that have been fully vaccinated. Now, I'm a proud Tasmanian and I live in the north of the state. And what I've had reported back to me from my electorate office during this week alone, and it's been happening week by week, but this week we've had a gentleman from Georgetown, beautiful place, Georgetown, on the Tamer River, rang frustrated and concerned that he wants the Pfizer vaccine. And he has been, as all Tasmanians have been, urged to get vaccinated. But what he's reporting to my office is there is a very slow rollout and people can't access the phase uh, the Visor vaccine. Now, that's anecdotal evidence, but it seems to me that when you have a number of people from the same community making contact with your office, there's got to be something in it. Now, I also um, had a, a lady ring the office this week concerned about how effective and the efficacy of AstraZeneca vaccine. She too wants the Pfizer vaccine. So what we've seen from this government is, because they've failed in a timely manner to get more Australians vaccinated, what we've seen now is people say, no, I don't want um, AstraZeneca. I want to wait for Pfizer, which means the whole herd immunity that we have been trying to encourage Australians to be part of it's going to be delayed. We already have an issue with younger members of our community in their 20s, 30s and 40s who don't really want to have the vaccine because they're concerned that the information that's coming out to them gets changed. So even people that have had the AstraZeneca, who have had their first jab, uh, which I have had myself, but others are now questioning whether they should have the second jab. That should be a major concern for this government. What we haven't seen from this government is an effective advertising campaign that is encouraging Australians to get their vaccine, to reassure them that these vaccines, whether it's Anna's, whichever one it is, are safe and gives you protection. Now, there may have to be boosters. That's probably likely, like we do the flu vaccine each year. But the reality is this gay government doesn't matter where you look, they keep failing at a time when we can ill afford for this government to fail. Now, we have seen, unfortunately, too many Australians over the course of the last 12 months or so pass away from COVID-19. We have learnt those lessons and I, I think in terms of um, those people in residential aged care that have been vaccinated, uh, those figures are far better than what they were even a month ago. But what we have still failed to do is to ensure those people who are benefactors 
of being assessed for home care packages that those workers that are going into those vulnerable older Australians' homes have been fully vaccinated. And again, there is no evidence that this government has any real-time data to give that reassurance back to the Australian community. And I have a particularly strong concern for older Australians, and particularly coming from Tasmania, when we have, you know, per demographic, we have the oldest population. So we, our Tasmanian community and our seniors are more vulnerable. Not, not that much more, I'd have to say. It probably equates to the Northern Territory and um, our First Nations people. But this government has brought in this legislation primarily because they have bungled this. They have bungled it. As I said earlier, this supplement that was being paid to aged care workers to ensure that they were not having to work across various homes because their salary is not enough for them to provide for their families. In my view, that supplement should not have been removed from aged care workers around this country until we were through and have dealt with this pandemic. That would have been the sensible thing to do. I mean, the fact that an aged care worker can't provide for their family on their salary when they are on the front line, they are the people on a day-to-day -day basis that is giving the care and support to some of our most vulnerable members of our community, is a, a real disgrace, a real disgrace in this country. It's a disgrace because this government did not support them when they were seeking to have their wages increased to enable them to be able to provide for their family. Now, we have known for a long time now, since Mr Morrison has been the Prime Minister of this country and leader of the Liberals, that he is a man who is very loose with the truth. Any commitment that he gives can be taken with a grain of salt. But this is a government that is driven by ego. It's a government that is driven by self-interest and it's driven by the lack of compassion and leadership that this country so desperately needs. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Deputy President. So I too rise to make a contribution to this legislation. And the only reason this legislation or this bill is necessary is because the Morrison government has failed on many fronts to bring this pandemic under control, whether it's the vaccine rollout, hotel quarantine, um, cutting JobKeeper off, particularly to early childhood educators uh, in an ongoing pandemic, whether it's Australians, including children stuck overseas, whether it's um, uh, international students not being able to come um, back to this country, whether it's migrant workers or whether it's um, Australians uh, with um, fiancés on PMV 300 visas. On every single level, the um, Morrison government has failed in this pandemic. And further than that, it steadfastly refuses to speed up the vaccine rollout, and uh, it is um, completely denying that we need proper quarantine facilities. It had two jobs uh, rolling out the vaccine and establishing good, safe quarantine, and it has failed um, miserably on both fronts. And I think at the moment we're up to almost one, um, one, one breakout a week from hotels which are not quarantine facilities. They are not designed for that purpose. And of course, there's a human element to, to every single step the government fails to take, whether it's children being stuck in India, and that's not the only country they're stuck in, but that is disgraceful. And why the government simply can't act to bring those children home is beyond my comprehension. It is not a hard problem to solve, um, and, it, and it should certainly be expedited. 
But I want to just illustrate the damage that can be done when uh, political parties seek to politicise this pandemic. And, uh, um, certainly it's not something that Labor is seeking to do. But earlier in the week, um, the Australian Greens put forward a motion calling for holders of PMV 300 visas to be exempt from inbound, inbound travel ban. That was a good motion. Uh, Labor supported it. But those of us in this place know that motions have very little effect. Uh, they, are not, they don't have an actionable outcome. And what we know on this side is that, in true Greens fashion, the Australian Greens wanted to use this motion as a wedge, particularly, I suspect, against the Labor Party. So there was the usual email campaign, uh, presumably targeted at Labor senators, where the Greens had obviously indicated to their supporters that we wouldn't support this motion and that we needed prompting from voters. And of course, uh, it was an opportunity for Greens to gather email addresses for future propaganda purposes. But what the Greens failed to realise, or they completely ignored, with this motion comes the pain being experienced by these Australians with loved ones stuck overseas. And yes, sheet the blame home to the Morrison government, but realise what damage your motions do to individuals who think that because I've supported a motion that somehow that forces the Morrison government to act, because we know in this place it doesn't. And yes, I'm really angry about this. Because yesterday I had uh, an email from one of those women who came back to me and thanked me for supporting the email. Now, it wasn't part of the Greens campaign. She was just grateful that I had supported that email. And she said she'd searched everywhere on the internet and in the parliamentary papers to see when the action was going to take place, when her fiancé stuck overseas as a result of the Morrison government, but rescued apparently by a Greens motion, was going to be allowed in this country. And I went back to her and I said I was extremely upset that the Greens would be so short-sighted to cause that woman further pain, to raise her hope that somehow their motion in the Senate was going to result in her fiancé being able to come down to this country. And I said, I'm really sorry you were misled by the Australian Greens, but there's no doubt she was. She came back to me then and said, I'm really sorry I misunderstood. I said, you did not misunderstand. You did not misunderstand. You were misled by the Australian Greens. And all they've done for that woman is cause her further disappointment and pain. They gave her false hope, running off the back of this COVID pandemic. The Morrison government's at fault too because they've failed to act, but clearly to politicise this situation in the way the Greens did to give false hope to people with goodness knows what consequences is a disgrace. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill 2021, and I want to associate myself with the comments made by my colleague, um, Senator Seward, um, on this bill. Of course, we should be providing support um, to people who need this in these dev devastating circumstances. But as Senator Seward has said, we should be providing them to every single per person who is living here and who is facing economic and social impacts uh, because um, they don't, this government basically has locked them out of support payments and they're living on the poverty line. And we will be moving amendments to that effect. And while it is good to see that this bill extends COVID disaster payments, we know that this government has completely failed on the vaccine rollout. And because of this, New South Wales, at this moment, is on the brink of another lockdown. It's been 15 months since we first went into lockdown, and there is still no plan to open our borders. There are hundreds of thousands of families who are separated. There are gut-wrenching stories everywhere. I haven't seen my mum and daughter since 2019. Seeing, the Prime, seeing Prime Minister Morrison gallivanting around 
UK while he dodges responsibility for the vaccine rollout and refuses to safely open borders has been the daily pain of not being able to see my family so much worse. When I shared my story of being separated from my mother and daughter for two years now, there was an outpouring of grief and anger. So many people shared with me their painful stories in response. And here are some of the most heartbreaking stories of what turning this country into so-called Fortress Australia has done to its people. I do want to share some of them with the senators in the chamber. Sonia told me that she had to watch her father be buried via Facebook Live with her mother sobbing and none of her children there to hold her. They all live in Australia. And now it's sounding like it will be another year and a half before they will be allowed to see her. She's grieving on her own when she would have such comfort being surrounded by her daughters and grandchildren. Ro shared a painful story, but one also of the extremely cold and cruel rejection of her multiple requests for exemption to be with her family. And I quote Ro, last year I applied for exemption to leave Australia to help my parents as they were in lockdown. In my exemption letter, I mentioned that they didn't have anybody to help them. My exemption was rejected. My brother and I applied again and wrote to the exemption team that we were desperate to leave Australia as one of us needs to be with our parents. Again, rejected. My father contracted COVID and I reapplied and begged the team to allow me to leave Australia and again, our exemption was rejected. My father passed away and my mother was in his funeral alone. How can I have my mum in Australia for some time to mourn together and to offer her help and my emotional support? How can I relieve this crippling burden from myself that has taken away my functioning when government doesn't allow family reunification after horrible things that have happened to families during the corona pandemic? Carissa said, it's almost two years since I've seen my parents in the USA. They are fully vaccinated and would be overjoyed to quarantine for three or even four weeks at our home with us. This government and its supporters have zero appreciation for the empty aching feeling we experience as immigrants and the skills we contribute to this country. This is what Sue said. I haven't seen my mom and dad for four years due to health issues and my dad has Alzheimer's and leukemia and time isn't on my side. So being prevented from seeing them is heartbreaking. Time isn't on my side either. Mr. President, my mom is 84, and almost every day that I speak to her, she says she, her desperate wish is to see me before she dies. Steffi said, I am an only child, and I haven't seen my parents in, in almost two years. My three-year-old daughter doesn't even remember being hugged by them and thinks they only exist on screen. We are considering giving up our lives and good jobs here soon in order to be with family. This situation is mentally unbearable for so many of us. Parents are immediate family. Chitra said, thank you, Senator Marine Farooqui for raising this issue. My mother is living alone in India for the last 18 months after my father died and I am her only child. She is fully vaccinated I am waiting desperately to hug her and hold her, but there is no date I can give her without the government putting out a plan. Let's push for the government to put forth a plan to reunite Aussie families. Jitesh said, our 10-month-old daughters never seen her grandparents, and we are going through such emotional and difficult phase without our parents. Don't know why this government doesn't understand that parents are first in immediate family. Laura said, we have an 18 month old baby that none of our family have met. They will never get to hold him as a baby. My heart is broken. Julia said, I can feel you 
I miss my parents. My three-year-old daughter cries at every plane, screaming for her nonna and nono. She said that she wants real cuddles, no phone cuddles. This is cruel. I can't breathe. I'm constantly sad and hopeless. And there are dozens and dozens of more stories, Mr. President. And I think it's pretty shameful for Labour senators to stand up here and say that we're politicizing this issue in some way, shape or form. There are thousands upon thousands of families who have not been able to see each other because this government and their prime minister has botched up the vaccine rollout for COVID-19. So Scott Morrison, stop dodging responsibility for the vaccine rollout. Your incompetence is preventing families from reuniting. Try to conjure up even the smallest bit of compassion and start taking seriously this country's vaccine rollout so we can safely open up our borders and families can hug and see each other again. Senator Ayers. Um, Mr. President, I um make this contribution uh, and thank you, uh, Senator Faruqi, for uh, reading out the accounts of, of the many, uh, some of the many thousands of Australians who are in um, that position. Um, and there are many people in this, uh, in this building uh, who are in uh, very similar positions. And of course, this debate about this bill occurs as uh, my home state of New South Wales is teetering on the edge of uh, a much broader uh, set of public health responses. Um, hundreds and hundreds of people now in uh, isolation, uh, scores of infections, uh, and the New South Wales Parliament itself, um, senior minister in the Berejiklian government, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, infection. Uh, uh, many ministers and MPs now in isolation and staff, of course, and I want to send uh, a message of uh, solidarity and support to them as that, uh, as that parliament works its way through how it should respond. I want to pay tribute in particular to uh, Chris Minns, the new Labor leader, who saw the responsibility early and clearly to act in the public interest and has cancelled the budget reply speech uh, that he was due to deliver today. Uh, that was going to be an important moment for uh, Mr Minns to set out uh, his vision for the future of New South Wales as the new Labor leader and shows that he has got his priorities right and the interests of the people of New South Wales in his heart rather than the narrow political interest, and I think he's to be commended uh, for taking uh, that approach. Um, in contrast, I, I don't believe that the Morrison government has ever really grasped its responsibility, has ever really grasped its, its responsibility in public health terms, in economic terms uh, or indeed in social terms uh, in this crisis. Like Mr Minns, Mr Albanese and Labor over the course of last year uh, took a constructive approach uh, to the coronavirus crisis. But all the way through last year you could see that the seeds of the government's failure in 2021 were being sowed by the inaction uh, and incapacity of the Morrison government to do the things that are necessary to put Australia in the right position now. Why is it, 15 months later, 15 months later that there is no system of quarantine in each of the states and territories that is credible, that we are still relying upon hotel quarantine? which is a stopgap solution. Hotels are not hospitals. 24 outbreaks in hotel quarantine. Why is it that 15 months later 
with the opportunities that were lost 12 months ago when representatives of the government met with Pfizer and lost the opportunity to secure sufficient doses to make sure that Australians had a choice of vaccines. See, in the United States and the United Kingdom, where variously 35, 40, 45 per cent uh, north of that in some of, our, uh, in some of the European countries, they have got a series of options, a series of vaccine options. The Morrison government squandered that, bet the House on one product essentially, AstraZeneca, Pfizer an afterthought, and now the vaccine <coughs> rollout, absolutely mired in failure, are unable to get past the starting gate, still less still just a little bit over 3 per cent of Australians fully vaccinated. Now, Australians deserve much credit uh, for our progress through uh, the coronavirus pandemic so far. Australians themselves, the state governments, businesses, trade unions, working together to solve problems, looking after each other. But the Morrison government itself has been entirely absent uh, in terms of a position of public leadership. Now, of course, there is an alternative plan. These kind of stopgap measures, these kind of stopgap measures are necessary, but they're necessary because the government hasn't executed its proper responsibility. There is an alternative plan. Anthony Albanese set it out very clearly. Number one, Albo to me, uh, Senator Abetz. Um, number one, get the vaccine rollout right. Get it right. Get needles into the arms of Australians across the country. Make sure that we have a population that is resilient and safe. Uh, execute the vaccine rollout safely and sensibly, like every other country. Why are we a hundredth in the queue? Why are we hundredth in the queue? Why is Australia a global laggard instead of at the front of the queue? Get quarantine right. Build quarantine in every state and territory and make sure that Australians can return safely. The problems that were being outlined earlier this morning can be resolved with getting those two basic Commonwealth responsibilities right. Effectively manufacture vaccines in Australia, safe vaccines, build the relationship with our research facilities, make Australia a leader and, finally, get a public health campaign that's actually convincing. This is a Prime Minister who only understands one thing self-promotion and advertising. That's all he understands. He has not been able to bring his instinct for advertising to advertising for public health, for the safety of Australians. Now, you have a look at the French campaign, the French campaign about opening France up, about encouraging French citizens to get the vaccine and get vaccinated. There is no Australian equivalent and why? It became clear why there isn't a campaign. Despite the Prime Minister's overwhelming instinct for advertising, the reason there isn't a campaign is because it would lay bare. It would lay bare the lack of supply of vaccines. The public officials finally told the truth earlier this week. Uh, Senator Abetz would have been listening. Finally told the truth. There will be no public advertising campaign until the government's vaccine supply failures are finally resolved, because they know, they know that if they advertise, people will line up for vaccines, and when they line up for vaccines, there are no vaccines available. Order, Senator Ayres. You will be in continuation when debate resumes. I shall. Um now proceed. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none.
Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I present the seventh report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. It is. Senator Smith. Thank you. I move that the report be adopted. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. I um, move an amendment to the motion that the report be adopted. And do I need leave to do that, or I'm just doing it? Okay, I'm just doing it. And um, the amendment is very straightforward. It's been circulated in the chamber, but it is to refer the bill to the Education and Employment Legislation Committee for inquiry and report, rather than the Legal and Con Legislation Committee. We think it's more appropriately fits there because the fair work uh, legislation normally goes to that committee. question is the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will now put the motion. The uh, Selection of Bills Committee report as amended be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Senator Smith. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Henderson. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Henderson for today for personal reasons. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I also seek leave to move a motion of uh, to allow leave of absence for a senator. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that Senator Pratt be given leave for yesterday, the 23rd of uh, June 2021. The question, the, quest, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Um, I move that a government business orders of the day, as shown on today's order of business, <coughs> be considered from 12.45 p.m. today. b government business be called on after consideration of the bills listed in paragraph a and considered till not later than 2 p.m. today. And c general business notice of motion number 1174 be considered during general business today. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. Mr President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notices number one and two postponed to the next day of sitting. General business notices of motion 1097, 1133, 1172, 1180 and 1182 all postponed to the next day of sitting. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 7 of the order of business. Question, and I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall move to the discovery of formal business. And I'm going to commence with Senator Abetz on matter number 1171. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I advise uh, the Senate that Senators Kitching, Macdonald and Dean Smith have added their names to General Business Notice of Motion number 1171 relating to the retirement of long-serving Comcar driver Mr Tony Harriot, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Abetz. I thank the Senate and I move the motion standing in my name and the name of Senators Kitching, Macdonald and Dean Smith. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd also like to seek leave to have my name added to that motion, if it hasn't been already. So, if that's okay. So done. Senator, thank you. I'd just like to seek leave to make a brief statement in relation to the motion. Leave is granted. Senator Steele John. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Tony Harriot worked for the Australian Government for 56 and a half years, uh, having started in the surveyor department uh, after he left school. Uh, and he is probably uh, the last of a generation of com car drivers uh, that uh, will clock up 50 years, given uh, that the casualised contractual arrangements they are now uh, under. Uh, he is also celebrating uh, 53 years of marriage uh, to Rosemary, um, during which time they have together raised a much-loved family um, of three children. Uh, eight grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Uh, Tony often speaks of much pride and love of his family, uh, and it is definitely uh, time for him to pack up his golf clubs and set off on a few travels with Rosemary and his sister Janet. And to this purpose, we uh, commend him all the very best and thank him for his dedicated and good-humoured service. <laughs> A 
So, in, in, in putting the motion, I'll acknowledge the presence of Mr. Harriot in the chamber. Welcome to the Senate again. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Congratulations. Senator Abetz. Um, can the Hansard record disclose that the motion was in fact carried by acclamation? I'm sure it will do so now that you've made that observation, Senator Abetz. So we'll now go to government business. Senator uh, matters number one. Senator Rustin. Um, I ask that government business uh, notices of motion numbers one and two be taken together as formal. Is there any objection? There being none. Senator Rustin. I move that the following bills be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 and for other purposes, and a bill for an act to amend the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act 2010 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I present the bills and move that these bills may proceed <coughs> without formalities, be taken together and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Bill 2021, Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill 2021. Senator Rustin. I table the explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Leave granted. It is. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned until 3rd of August 2021. Senator Rustin. I move that these bills be listed on the notice paper as a separate orders of the day. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number three relating to the consideration of legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Dunningham. Oh, Senator Dunningham. Uh, I move the motion. Senator Waters. Uh, yes, President. I seek leave to amend the motion to exclude the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production Orders Bill of 2020. Not sure if I need leave to do that. Is leave granted to move that amendment? Yeah, leave is granted to move the amendment. So thank you. I'll well, I so move, move the amendment, Senator Waters. Thank you. I so move an amendment to remove the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production Orders Bill 2020 from uh, the exemption of bills from the cut-off order. So, and I also wish to make a brief statement. Is leave granted? For one minute, Senator Waters. Thank you, uh, President. Look, what's happened here is last night a bill was rammed through the House, and the government in the House sought leave to move amendments one to five hundred and two together, and then forced the House to vote on it shortly thereafter. Now, this is an unprecedented move to not only ram through a bill uh, in breach of the cut-off order, but to ram through a bill that has been so extensively amended without anyone having the time to actually properly read those amendments. There were 46 pages of amendments, 502 of the amendments in total. This is an absolute farce. You cannot ram this bill through the Senate with such extensive amendments. This is why we are seeking to remove this bill so that it can have the proper scrutiny and consideration that is warranted for a bill that vastly increases the surveillance state powers of this totalitarian government. Senator Patrick. Uh, I seek leave to make Order. a short statement. Is leave, leave is granted for one minute, Senator Patrick. Actually, it's really just more of a question. I'd, I wouldn't mind the minister standing up and just ex and advising why it needs to be, um, why the cut-off needs to be uh, abandoned. Uh, that would be helpful for me um, in making a decision. Before we get into an issue of debate, I will call the minister. A statement was tabled with respect to this um, with the motion yesterday. Um, a statement of reasons is tabled pursuant to the standing orders. I will invite the minister, if he if anyone wishes to add to that, they need to seek leave to make a statement. Um, the, the, reasoning, so the reason you've given no. would have been the same one I'd have given. So the statement has been tabled yesterday in the Senate. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
paper. Thank you, Richard. I'll give you your notice paper back. Lock the doors. The question is, the amendment moved to government business. Motion number three, moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell of the ayes? Senator Urquhart, tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is the government business motion number three be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Sorry, Senator Waters. Question be put separately on the telecoms bill. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just taking some advice then from the clerk. We, we've actually just sought to separate it effectively by excluding the second bills. That would effectively be the same question um, on advice from the clerk. Um, so we've just determined that question. Senator Waters. Thank you. It's just that we wish to vote differently on the bills. I think my advice from the clerk, and I'm going to ask him, is that, it, it, that we just expressed that you have a different position on that bill in the debate just conducted and the vote. So that's already on the record in the sense that the position of those who wish that bill to be treated differently is already expressed in the Senate record. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you. Well, can I just ask that Hansard record that when we have this vote that we also don't want the telecoms bill to be ran sure. through today? Uh, thank you. So the question is that government business motion number three be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. And I will note the rec request of the Australian Greens that they attempted to amend it to exclude that and disagree with that bill being included. So it being Thursday, I'm going to run through these on the order of the notice paper. I'll commence with Senator Brown, number 1160. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1160 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? I'll now go to one one sorry, Senator Gallagher. I'd like to deal with that motion now, Mr. President. Yep. I Sorry, Senator I, Gallagher. I move that, pursuant to contingent notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Wong, that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without. That is 1160. Uh, moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Now I'm going to use my discretion as the chair to offer those. I don't record as who objected to that motion being taken as formal, because if we proceed this way, we will end up dealing with substantially fewer motions in today's order of business uh, than we would otherwise. So, if those, I, that's okay. I, I'm happy to put it. I was offering senators that courtesy. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith, teller for the ayes. Senator Lambie, teller for the noes. And note this does not require an absolute majority.
The result of the division is ayes 45, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. You can do it from there if you wish, Senator Gallagher. Okay. I'll call Senator Gallagher to move, uh, Senator Urquhart to move the motion. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move motion number 1160. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson, number 1164. After you, if you don't. Um, thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1164 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to? So, oh, Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation will support this motion. Hemp is a variety of cannabis that does not contain high levels of the psychoactive compound called THC. The war on THC also referred to as marijuana, has caused hemp to be stigmatised without reason. Hemp is a modern commercial crop for use in paper, fabrics, natural pharmaceuticals and, as Senator Wish Wilson pointed out, in food. What I would like to add to the debate is to point out that hemp is a fast-growing crop which makes it suitable for op opportunistic planting after rain. Used in rotation with grain crops, hemp can condition the soil and improve yields across the planting cycle. Hemp is deeply rooted which remediates soil and provides a crop to stabilise and protect topsoil in areas where erosion can be a problem. Hemp is being trialled as a forage crop in Tassie. Those are going to be he healthy, happy cows. I urge all Australian farmers to take another look at hemp and join a world market expected to be valued at about $50 billion by 2026. The question is the, the, order. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters, is it your intention to deal with 1167 in a formal way? Thank you, President. I would like to seek to. I ask that general business well, notice of motion the, number 1167 at, be taken as point, a formal Senator motion. Waters, um, I'm not going to put that question to the Senate. Pursuant to my ruling the other day with respect to Standing Order 86-1, this matter has been considered by the Senate twice in the last week in two separate circumstances, one upon its introduction. Uh, and I ruled the other day that um, following its introduction it was published, which gave senators the opportunity to see the bill, and that I've, I, my ruling was that was a different circumstance. Um, this is the same motion as appeared the other day, where the first reading was denied by the Senate, and I believe that is covered by Standing Order 86.1, which I'm happy to read out again if necessary, but I'm conscious we're limited for time. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Well, pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders, in particular standing order 86.1 that you've just referenced, be suspended as would prevent uh, the motion, namely the first reading of this bill, uh, being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Thank you. And that motion is entirely within order. So I will put the motion moved by Senator Waters, because that would suspend standing order 86.1. Therefore, the ruling would no longer be relevant. 86.1 is the same question standing order that you can't put the same question. Um, 86.1 says, a question shall not be proposed if it is in the same in substance as any question which has been determined during the same session, unless the order resolution or vote on such question was determined more than six months previously or has been rescinded. So I think my ruling is quite clear. Senator Waters is taking the appropriate response, which is to move to suspend that standing order to allow reconsideration of the bill. Senator Gallagher. To make a short statement. Leave is granted. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr President. Look, this is a difficult one for us in the sense that we, um, we acknowledge and support back in your ruling on the matter, but we have voted consistently with the Greens to allow for this legislation uh, to be introduced. Um, that doesn't indicate our position on the bill, but we believe you do have the right to introduce legislation um, and have supported you throughout. But I think in light of the fact that you have made a ruling, Mr President, it is important for us um, to uh, indicate our support for your ruling, acknowledging that our preference would have been that, we, that Senator Waters would have and should have been allowed to introduce her legislation in accordance with convention of this place uh, several times this week. Um, 
I appreciate the expression of support. I should clarify, maybe I wasn't clear. I wouldn't consider this to be a dissent from my ruling at all. Um, this is not a matter of supporting my ruling or otherwise. This is the appropriate mechanism to suspend the standing order upon which I am basing my ruling. So this is not the same as moving a dissent in the chair's ruling at all. It's merely saying, well, this rule shouldn't apply for this matter, and that is entirely appropriate for consideration by the Senate. But it is, de it is dealt with without debate under the provisions we've adopted. So I appreciate the support, but I wouldn't take it as a dissent from my ruling if, it was a, if this motion was supported. Senator Hanson. I would like some clarification. This has been raised a few times in the, in the chamber now. You've made a ruling on it under what it states under the standing orders. Now, is this going to happen every time that next sitting of parliament we're going to have the same piece of legislation get up? Is it going to be the same again that we're voting on standing orders overruling what is in 86? So is this going to come on every time, every day? in this chamber? So that is an interesting question, Senator Hanson. There have been previous rulings from the chair, both from myself and my predecessors, that repeated attempts to suspend standing orders are out of order. And we've dealt with that particularly, I'd like to say, on Thursdays when we've been dealing with uh, lots of legislation at once. This is not a repeated attempt. This is the first attempt to suspend the standing order that prevents the Senate considering this discussion. So that's why it's not a dissent from my ruling, and I wouldn't view it as such. The Senate is always capable of suspending its own standing orders to deal with a, a matter it considers should be dealt with separately. However, if the Senate did vote to not suspend standing orders here, um, repeated attempts, and I wouldn't say it would only be a second attempt when we resumed in August, but it would be out of order if every day an attempt to suspend standing orders to deal with the first reading of this bill. But it does need to be repeated attempts, and my recollection has usually been um, after two or three attempts, the Senate has determined, and the, or the chair has determined, no, there have been multiple attempts to suspend standing orders to deal with the matter that way. We will not entertain any further measures. So I hope that answers your question, Senator Hanson. Senator Dunham. Absolute clarity. I was just seeking some clarification around. I presume it is a contingent notice that Senator Waters is relying upon to do what she intends to do now. Is that um, right, it was, uh, I think Senator, Senator Waters did say contingent notice. What did, uh, in the name of yourself, was it Senator Waters? It is. I'm looking. So um, the clerk's nodding to me. I think that means it is a contingent notice. It is, which means it requires a majority of the Senate, not an absolute majority of the Senate. But I appreciate the expressions of support and the queries. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to, to suspend standing orders. The, those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Oh, yeah, one minute. Lock the doors. Question is, the motion moved by Senator Waters to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt tell if the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell if the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 10, noes 37. The matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now come to matter number 1170, Senator Patrick. Thank you. You can do it from there, Senator Patrick. Mr. President, I, I seek leave to postpone that motion. You, sorry, you. I seek leave to postpone that motion to the next sitting day. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. We'll now move to uh, 1173 in the name of Senator Dodson. Senator Urquhart. So general business notice of motion number <coughs> excuse me, 1173 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. Sure. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Rustin. Um, the Morrison government has moved immediately. Uh, oh, sorry, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. It is for one minute. The Morrison government has immediately supported 25 of the 38 recommendations of the second year review and commends the work of the independent reviewer. Notably, the review did not recommend an increase to the maximum redress payment. To implement the immediate recommendations, we have committed $80 million to improve the survivor experience and process the redress scheme, including advance payments of $10,000 to specific cohorts. Any major design changes of the scheme's legislation in response to the review would require the approval of the scheme's government's arrangements with states and territory redress ministers. This includes the remaining 13 recommendations, which are noted or supported in principle uh, due to this requirement. Um, I am working actively with the states and territories to seek their support to amend the legislation which underpins the scheme. The question is, motion moved by uh, number 1173 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I now come to number 1176, Senator Lyon. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1176 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. There is. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Mr President. I move that pursuant to contingent notice of motion Number three, standing in the name of Senator Wong, that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent motion 1176 being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell of the ayes and Senator Patrick tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 47, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Gallagher, uh, I'll ask you to move number 1176. Number 1176. Senator Dunham. Relation to this motion. Thank you. The question is that motion number 1176 be agreed to. Oh, Senator Hanson. I wish to uh, seek leave to table a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Thank you. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I'm going to put that again just to look. To, uh, those, of, in, those in support of the motion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1176 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes and Senator Davey tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the negative. We now come to matter number 1178 in the name of Senator MacDonald. Senator MacDonald, you can do it from there. President, I act that general business notice of motion number 1178 relating to affordable and accessible insurance in Northern Australia be taken as formal. Did everyone hear that? About 1178, Senator Macdonald is taking it, seeking leave to have it taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. Senator Dunningham. At the request of Senator Birmingham and pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders uh, be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately. This motion 1178 and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion moved by Senator Dunningham to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion number 1178 be agreed to. Those of that opinion, Senator Watt. Yeah. I seek leave to table a short statement. Leave is granted. Senator Waters. Senator well, Waters seeks statement. leave. Is leave granted? It is. I will now put the motion number 1178. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes because we're past the half hour in respect of the whips. Four minutes.
sports break. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1178 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Davey teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Urquhart, are you in a position to move 1181? But I am. Yes. Thank you. Uh, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I inform the chamber that Senator Sheldon will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1181 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? 
There is. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move, Mr. President, I move that pursuant to contingent notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Wong, that so much of the standing orders be suspended as was prevent motion number 1181 being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Bells ring. Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith, tell of the ayes, and Senator Lambie, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 49, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Urquhart, I'll ask you to move the motion. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is motion number 1181 be agreed to. Senator Dunningham. I table the government's statement in relation to this motion. Statement is tabled. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. It being 12.45, we'll move on to business. Senator Patrick. To, um, to introduce a bill and discharge one from the notice paper in accordance with motion 1184. Okay, Senator Patrick, that's quite a courageous move um, after the last hour. I remind senators that any senator has the opportunity to deny leave. 
is leave granted? I must say I am sorely tempted to do it from the chair, which I'm entitled to do, Senator Patrick, but I won't, in deference to the Senate. Senator Patrick. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 1184 for, uh, for the introduction of a bill and the discharge of an order of the day relating to an earlier bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. Ayes have it. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. Senator Patrick. Um, I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Patrick. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave continue granted? My remarks. It is. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So I'll now call the clerk to call on business. Government business, order of the day number five. Uh, number six, we'd, excuse me, Senator, we do number six first. They're in a different order. On the business order of the day, Farm Household Support Amendment Debt Waiver Bill 2021, second reading debate. And I have uh, Senator Brown. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Labor will be supporting this bill as outlined in the uh, EM. The purpose of the bill would waive the repayment of certain classes of debt in relation to the farm house household allowance through amendments to the Farm Household Support Act 2014. The Farm Household Allowance Program provides time-limited, means-tested income support to farmers and their partners experiencing financial hardship. Farmers are eligible for the Farm, house, farm Household Allowance for a maximum of four years, recorded as of the 1,460-day clock in every 10-year period beginning the 1st of July 2014. These days do not need to be consecutive and can be taken only if and when needed. The EM states that previously farm household allowance recipients' income estimate was reconciled annually through the business income reconciliation. The business income reconciliation determined whether a recipient received a top-up payment, no adjustment or incurred a debt. The business income reconciliation was removed from the um, Farm Household Scheme Act which, with effect from 1 July 2020 as part of a process to simplify the farm household allowance following a 2018 independent review. While the bus uh, business income reconciliation was removed in 2020, some farm household allowance recipients incurred debts from this process between 1 July 2015 and 30 June 2020 or have not yet been assessed. According to the EM, the bill would permanently waive the repayment of certain classes of debts from farm ha household allowance recipients arising from the business income reconciliation process for farm household allowance payments between 1 July 2015 and 30 June 2020. The bill would assist farmers suffering financial hardship and eliminate the negative effects of the business income reconciliation process. The EM states that to enhance fairness, it would ensure that any farm household allowance recipient who already had a business income reconciliation debt does not also receive the double benefit of having their clock recredited if they choose to have their debt waived. As stated in the EM, the bill would also provide an end date of the 30 June 2023 for farm household allowance recipients to supply their full financial statements for the business income reconciliation process. Any farm householder, household allowance recipients who do not provide this information would have their payment for the full financial year raised as a debt. Business income reconciliation dates for the 2014-15 financial year 
were previously waived through a legislative instrument in 2016 and would not be affected by these amendments. Acting Mr. Deputy Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to take this opportunity to put on record the challenges facing farmers and regional communities. The Morrison government's inaction on many of these issues are very concerning. Big on announcement, unfortunately not a lot on delivery. Last week we had another big announcement, but not a lot of detail on the delivery. The Agricultural Workers Visa. This latest announcement comes three, three years after the Nationals first said there would be an agricultural visa, so farmers won't be holding their breath for action soon. With Morrison's, Morrison's faltering uh, vaccine rollout and quarantine phase set to keep borders closed on, for the foreseeable future, it's difficult to see how any new visa will fix labour shortages crippling Australian farmers now. The Morrison government must come clean with more details. Any proposed visa cannot mean more shocking exploitation on workers on farms. The Morrison government has a terrible tra track record on fixing workforce shortages shortages on Australian farms. Mr Morrison is still yet to respond to the recommendations of the National Agriculture Workforce Strategy handed to it in October. Producers have already faced losses of more than $50 million from rotting crops due to workforce shortages on farm. The Morrison government has failed to take responsibility for labour shortages. Farmers just want this fixed. Acting, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Mor Morrison government is also dragging its feet on the challenges farmers face around biosecurity. Further reducing confidence was the recent publication of the Australian National Audit Office published its audit report around biosecurity. The findings of the ANAO report are scathing and extremely concerning. The ANAO concludes that the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment's arrangement to respond to non-compliance with biosecurity requirements are largely inappropriate. Clearly, we do not have a fit-for-purpose biosecurity system. What does this say about the Morrison government's interest around biosecurity risk? The ANAO's findings in relation to the inadequacy of Australia's biosecurity system must be taken seriously. A biosecurity system that is deemed to be inappropriately managed has massive implications for the agricultural sector and it puts Australian farmers in a very vulnerable position, which is totally unacceptable. Incursions of pests and disease are of great concern to farmers who know the significant risks if and when Australia's biosecurity system uh, fails them. The Morrison government must do better for the agricultural sector when it comes to Australia's biosecurity system. And atop of bushfires, drought, the COVID-19 pandemic and the workforce shortage, we know, we know another crisis that farmers in regional communities have had, had to face, and that's the mouse plague. The mouse plague is now impacting across multiple states. Is there a national response from the Morrison government? No, there is no national response. Labor's call for a national response plan has been ignored. The New South Wales Agriculture Minister also wrote to the Morrison government asking for it to provide assistance with the mouse plague. New, the New South Wales Minister's request for a national response plan ignored. Labor is concerned about the impact the pl plague is, is and will continue to have across Australian farms. New South Wales farmers have already estimated that the plague has already cost it $1 billion cost $1 billion to lost winter crops. The Morrison government must do better to help farmers. In closing, Mr Acting Deputy President, we will keep an eye, a close eye on how the Morrison government continues to manage its changes in this legislation and the other concerns I've raised today. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week, the federal court backed, down, backed um, the people from Robo, who were affected by the robo-debts and handed down its judgment on the robo-debt class action that found that the Commonwealth unlawfully raised $1.7 billion in debts against 443,000 uh, people. In his judgment, Judges, Judge Justice Murphy criticised the federal government's massive failure and said that the court heard heart-wrenching stories of pain and anguish from victims of the, robe, the Centrelink debt recovery program. Justice Murphy said it should have been obvious 
to government ministers and senior public service that the debt raising method central to the system was flawed. He said that the proceeding exposed a shameful chapter in the administration of the Commonwealth Social Security Scheme and a massive failure of public administration. The bill we are dealing with today will waive the farm household allowance debts of 5,300 farmers and their partners. It will waive $51 million in income support debts. I will say right now that the Greens think that farmers and those people in regional areas should be supported by the government and that these debts should be waived. However, the point I'm making is that it should be blindingly obvious to anyone the stark contrast between the way people on other income support payments were treated through the robo-debt disgusting disaster and the way that people are now being treated appropriately um, in, for those that have, have debts through the farm household allowance. It's startlingly obvious the difference between the way the two groups are handled. And of course, we support those um, people that are on farm household debt allowance debts. We support this bill. The government argues that the waiver for farmers is appropriate because they were acting in adverted commas good faith. If only the government gave other people on income support even some of the benefit of the doubt. It's truly outrageous when you compare the different approaches. When it came to robo-debt, income support recipients were, were assumed guilty simply for being on income support. There was none of this presumption of innocence approach by the government. The government pursued people for debts they did not owe when they should have known if they didn't know that it was illegal. Now that the government doesn't want to hand over documents that, evidence, that, that tell the community when and what they knew and who knew. It is almost impossible to account for the social and economic costs of the government's punitive robo-debt program. This program has caused so much pain and distress to so many for so long. The government knew this and continued it anyway, treating people appallingly. This program literally cost people's lives. It ruined many others and caused so much pain and anguish. This is a shameful chapter in our history. People should not be treated this way. I'm glad the government has seen the light, and I encourage them to apply it to everybody on income support. Thank you. Uh, Senator, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Greens uh, support the principle of uh, helping struggling farmers. Of course, we support the principle of helping any uh, Australian who's in need. Um, we support the principle of uh, government playing a strong and active role in our lives. I just wanted to highlight, highlight briefly a few points from the second reading speech from uh, Minister uh, Michael Sucker from the other place. Um, Sucker, I saw, I, I saw your expression, uh, Deputy President. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't deliberate, because um, it's very obvious when you read uh, the minister's speech, uh, and he goes on to explain why why farmers are having their debts waived, why they need the relief. And I'll just want to read a couple of brief um, excerpts uh, from his speech. He says um, farming income is volatile. And uh, I know the senators in this chamber who uh, are from farming families. And as I said yesterday, my father was a farmer and I've indeed been a farmer myself. So I appreciate that farming in income is volatile. Uh, I also appreciate what the minister said, that based on uncertain yields and prices and unpredictable weather, farmers have to make difficult predictions about the income for the year ahead. I wanted to underline that bit there about the, uh, the unpredictable weather. There's, it's been a big uh, debate in this chamber this week that climate change is one of the key risks that Australian farmers face. And this bill is a recognition of that. Uh, this is primarily designed to help farmers who have dealt with drought and have dealt with floods. And the minister goes on to actually say this in the, sec the second last paragraph 
uh, of his speech. Summing up, he says, though the quantum of the debts to be waived through this bill are modest, this measure will provide breathing space as our farming families recover. Underline, recover from drought, bushfires and floods. And he also says global pandemic that they've experienced over recent years. So there you have it in a nutshell. Farmers suffering from drought, bushfires and floods. Could you be any more circumspect about the risks that are facing our farming community? Every farmer knows that the weather and climate is one of the most variable factors that they face. They're trying to make a living, uh, a sustainable livelihood, uh, working, working the land to feed the nation, to grow a whole range of different products. And to have a national party in this place that purports to represent farmers, that has as its new leader an individual, Mr Barnaby Joyce, who openly denies climate change, openly denies climate change. And others in this chamber, like Senator Canavan, uh, that are openly also on record with uh, dismissing the need for climate action. And of course, it's no secret uh, that the National Party are hijacking this government, preventing it from even putting in place weak 2050 targets. When all of us who understand climate change, based on the best available science, the whole world knows this, that we need strong 2030 targets. And I just wanted to just finish on that point. Without climate action, there's going to be significant costs and risks to farmers. That's it. Uh, and farmers understand that, and they deserve better, Acting Deputy President. They deserve uh, their representatives in regional areas uh, to take up this case in this place and take the strongest possible action on climate. And the Greens will do that. The Greens will always take the strongest possible action on climate because we understand that doing nothing risks everything. And we're going to see a lot more of that in this country in the future if we don't take the necessary climate action on behalf of farmers, indeed all our communities across this country. Thank you. Uh, Senator Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank senators for their contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Farm Household Support Act 2014 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I call the minister to move the third Thank reading. You. Minister. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question before the chair is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye, or those against, the ayes have it. Eyes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Farm Household Support Act 2014 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 5, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures number 4, Bill 2021, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Labor supports the Treasury Laws Amendments 2021, Measures number 4, Bill 2021. There are six Treasury measures in this bill, a number of schedules implementing budget measures from the last two budgets. The most substantial measure is the one-year extension of the low and middle income tax offset for the 2021-22 financial year, Schedule 6, at a cost of $7.8 billion. The offset provides a tax of offset of up to $1,080 for individuals with low to middle incomes. At a time when the nation is still experiencing a global pandemic and the related effect on the economy, this will be a welcome benefit to individuals and families who have been stretched over the past year. This is only a temporary measure, though. We know that there are Australians who are struggling. Labor supports this measure because it puts more money into the pockets of Aussies doing it tough. Tax relief for low- and middle-income Australians is not only fairer, it is also more effective than tax relief for high-income earners because of their higher propensity to spend. Simply put, recipients use funds to secure the extras they need from groceries to household goods to clothing and to much-needed repairs, which, which helps stimulate the economy. 
at the same time as this temporary measure for an estimated 10.2 million taxpayers who will benefit from the extension of the offset, this government persists with a permanent tax cut for some of the Australia's highest income earners. Labor knows that when, when it comes to tax relief in the budget, priority should be given to those who need it most. Schedule 3 implements the 2020-21 budget measure to provide a targeted exemption for granny flats from CGT events that occur on entering into, varying or terminating formal written arrangements under which an older person or a person with a disability acquires, varies or disposes of a granny flat interest. The creation of a formal arrangement that could incur a capital ga uh, gains tax consequences has meant that families have pref preferred informal agreements re regarding granny flat property or dwelling sharing arrangements. This measure seeks to avoid the capital gains tax events occurring with formal written arrangements when an older person or a person with disability acquires, varies or disposes of a granny flat interest. This change goes some way to reducing the risk of exploitation for older and vulnerable Australians. The other schedules in the bill cover a fringe benefits tax exemption to support retraining and reskilling at a cost of $9 million over the forward estimates, an extension of the operation of the junior minerals exploration incentive for a further four years from 2021-22 at a cost of $39 million over the forward estimates, amendments to the way ASIC and the product inter intervention regime works to address unintended outcomes, ensuring that the unique circumstances of COVID-19, where New Zealand sports team and staff may have to spend more time than usual in Australia, do not have an adverse tax impact in regard to determining whether income derived in such competitions is taxable in Australia. Although the bill extends the low and middle income tax offset, it makes sense to consider the wider context of this bill. As my colleague, the member for Rankin, said in the other place, the Morrison government is one of the two highest taxing governments of the last three decades, with the Howard government being the other. COVID is the pandemic that, of course, none of us wanted. But in it, we have had an opportunity to reassess the way we have done things in the past, a chance to build back better. The government so far has failed to take this opportunity. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, corporations and consumer credit and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. Just clarifying, we are at the closure of the debate. For uh, you're, you're going to move the third reading. Oh, I move the third reading. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, corporations and consumer credit and for related purposes. Clark. Yes. I'm just going to do messages first. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the following bills. Broadcasting Legislation Amendment 2021, Measure No. 1, Bill 2021, Financial Regulator Assessment Authority Bill 2021 and Online Safety Bill 2021. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Mutual Recognition Amendment Bill 2021. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to four laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. Thank you. We are now going to move on to COVID-19. No, sorry. 
Whip. Clark. Thank you, the clerk. Yes, sorry. Yes, Sandra. Uh, by leave, uh, on behalf of the uh, Senate Select C Committee on the Multi Jurisdictional Management and Execution of the Murray Darling Basin Plan, uh, myself, I seek leave to move a motion to enable the committee to meet during the sitting of the Senate today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the Senate Select Committee on the Multi Jurisdictional Management and Execution of the Murray Darling Basin Plan be authorised to hold a private meeting otherwise than in accordance with Standing Order 331 during the sitting of the Senate today from 3.05 pm. I would now put that question. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number 2, COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill 2021. Resumption of the debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Watt. Thank you. I have Senator Ayres in continuation. No, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Much Acting better looking to. Deputy Walsh. President. Uh, I rise to speak about the COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill of 2021. And the government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to support workers with these payments in the latest round of this COVID crisis. Casual workers in Victoria were left waiting by this government in the last outbreak, waiting without income, waiting without support, until the federal government finally, finally delivered this payment. And this government has got form on leaving casual workers behind. During the pandemic, Prime Minister Morrison he was pushed into a nationwide wage subsidy for Australian workers and businesses. Uh, and at that time, who did he choose to exclude? He chose to exclude thousands of casual workers, gig workers, uh, arts and entertainment workers and more. Um, workers in some of the hardest hit and most insecure industries. Uh, but at the same time, while this government was leaving vulnerable casual workers behind, big and profitable businesses like Harvey Norman, they were able to pocket the JobKeeper payments uh, and they still don't have to repay the millions of dollars the government handed out to them. So it is an absolute disgrace that the government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to this much needed disaster payment. Uh, and of course, the government has form on excluding casual workers, on punishing insecure workers, because after excluding so many insecure workers from JobKeeper payments, the Prime Minister uh, told those workers to smash open their piggy banks and raid their own super to get through the pandemic. So instead of sharing the burden equally amongst Australians, instead of helping all Australians, the Prime Minister chose to tell some of our most vulnerable people, our most insecure Australians, that they needed to fund their own pandemic support. So it's no surprise that when these latest COVID breakouts happened, that the government took its time to support casual workers again, because this government has shown absolutely no urgency during this crisis. Um, according to the Prime Minister, financial support for casual workers after they decided to end JobKeeper early, what's the hurry? What's the hurry in that? The vaccine rollout, well, apparently the Prime Minister thinks that that is not a race. Purpose-built quarantine facilities, well, they can wait too. Um, but our doors are open, according to the Prime Minister. If the, if the states want to take responsibility for quarantine, if the states want to come up with proposals for purpose-built open-air quarantine, uh, the, gov the government is willing to hear those proposals. Well, what a slow and heartless response to this COVID crisis from this government. Uh, and this government should be absolutely embarrassed about the bungled vaccine rollout. They should be ashamed at the pace of the vaccine rollout in this country. Embarrassed and ashamed at the bungled vaccine rollout. 
because Australians entered 2021 expecting a fast and efficient vaccine strategy, vaccine rollout from their government, only to be given the opposite by this federal government. Uh, and I was there last winter with Victorians as we faced a winter with the virus spreading throughout our community. And really, back then, one of the only things that gave us hope was that the federal government would get itself together and would be able to do a fast and efficient and effective vaccine rollout once we got through the COVID outbreaks of winter, that they would do that in 2021. Uh, and here we are again. Here we are again. This time, this winter, it's not Victoria facing the crisis. It's not Victoria in imminent crisis. This time, it's New South Wales facing another winter with this virus yet again, trying to spread its way throughout the community, a community that, because of the failings of this government, is almost entirely unvaccinated, entirely unvaccinated, because today only 3 per cent of Australians are fully vaccinated. This government should be embarrassed. They should be ashamed. Uh, and we are currently millions of doses behind the government's own vaccination targets. Not their first target, that one got passed. Not their second target, they threw that one out. Their third target. Uh, and this government just keeps dropping the bar lower and lower uh, and still missing the mark on their vaccination targets. And they still, even this week, cannot tell us when all aged care workers will be vaccinated. They can't tell us. This government's vaccine strategy it is a complete and utter shambles. Um, one day they're telling over 50s to go get uh, the AstraZeneca virus. Um, the next day, they're saying people can wait for a Pfizer uh, until, the end of the year, until the end of the year if they're not comfortable getting AstraZeneca. Uh, and now we know that AstraZeneca is only safe for those over 60 years old. Uh, and this is all because the government decided to put all of its eggs in the AstraZeneca basket. This government has messed up this vaccine rollout from day one. They should have done what the experts recommended. They should have done what Labor called for, and that was to source multiple vaccine contracts right from the start. Uh, and it is Australians who are suffering because of the incompetence and bad decisions of this government. Uh, it is Australians who are suffering because of the tragic decisions of this government. And Australians. They had to dig deep to get through the last year. They have sacrificed so much to try to beat this virus back. And they should have been able to come into this year with the confidence that the Australian government had their backs, that the Australian government was going to roll this vaccine out comprehensively and effectively. And they have done the exact opposite. Australians should have been able to come into 2021 uh, and in the middle of the year see um, a real plan, a real plan that ensured that Australians would be able to beat this virus and that they would be safe, that people wouldn't just be going about their daily lives waiting, waiting for the next COVID outbreak to hit their community. Um, people of Australia should have been able to hope that we would all be vaccinated, that quarantine would now be safe. But this Morrison government has failed on both counts. They have failed Australians. And they have had months and months to effectively roll out this vaccine. And they have had months to get safe national open air quarantine facilities up and running. Uh, and have they done either? No. No, they have not. Throughout this pandemic, the Morrison government has denied its responsibility for quarantine. It has failed to set up appropriate national standards for quarantine. Uh, and all the while, they sit back and they critique what the state governments are doing. They critique state government responses to breaches in hotel quarantine. Uh, and everybody knows, everybody knows that hotels are not fit for purpose, that hotel quarantine was okay at the start of this pandemic. But 18 months on, 
It is a complete failure. The Prime Minister, though, he doesn't see it that way. He said on hotel quarantine back in April that this is a system that is achieving 99.99 per cent effectiveness. Uh, it's a very strong system and it's serving Australia very well. Um, well, 24 breaches later, and it is difficult to take those statements from the Prime Minister seriously. Uh, it is difficult to take those statements as anything other than a complete abrogation of this federal government's responsibility for controlling this virus, for establishing safe and effective open-air, purpose-built quarantine facilities. Um, tens of thousands of infections in Australia, more than 800 tragic deaths last year. That is not a system, a quarantine system, that is, a, that is serving Australians well. Uh, it is a system that is struggling to keep up. Uh, and when, Australians are asking themselves, when will the Morrison government get it? That hotels are built for tourists, that hotels are built for short stays. Hotels are not built for virus control. Uh, and of course, the government was told this way back in October. They were told this by their own hand-picked advisor, uh, Jane Holton, uh, that they needed to build fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities. This was months ago. This was months ago. Uh, and the Victorian government handed them a proposal for a new purpose-built quarantine facility um, back in April. It took the Victorian government to take on the federal responsibility um, of setting up safe and effective quarantine and come up with a proposal which they presented to the federal government back in April. And when did the Prime Minister finally agree to build a facility in Victoria? Well, it was in June. In June. This was a completely reactive decision. Uh, this was in June, while Victoria was battling with new COVID outbreaks due to yet another fail in the hotel quarantine system, this time a leak from the South Australian hotel quarantine system. Now, this government just doesn't think ahead. They are completely reactive. They don't plan. And when they are finally dragged, kicking and screaming, to act, too often it is already too late, um, because it is impossible for a federal government to deal with a pandemic if they have the attitude of this Morrison government. This is a government that does not believe in proactively taking charge of this emergency situation. They don't even believe that they have responsibility for federal quarantine. Uh, and if they do believe that they have uh, responsibility for the vaccine rollout, they are showing absolutely no urgency, no urgency in getting it done whatsoever. And part of the problem with this Morrison government is that it is impossible to deal with a pandemic if you don't actually believe in taking responsibility, if you don't actually believe that it is the role of government, of your government, to keep people safe. Uh, it is impossible for the Morrison government to deal effectively with this pandemic if they don't even believe in governing in the best interests of Australians at all. Uh, it is impossible to deal with this pandemic effectively if the government's strategy is to wait to be dragged kicking and screaming to do anything, to do something. It just doesn't work. And as a result of this government's failures, this government's failures on vaccines, their failures on quarantine, their failure to take responsibility, Australians are now exposed. Australians are exposed. And it doesn't have to be this way at all. It doesn't have to be this way. If only this government actually believed in taking responsibility, if only they believed in governing in the best interests of all Australians, if only they would act ahead of time instead of react when it's already too late. And until this government does act, all of the hard work that Australians put in to get our country moving again, it is just waiting to be thrown away. 
It is Australians who have sacrificed so much. It is Australians who have done all of the work to defeat, to defeat this virus. Uh, and until this government starts to be proactive, until they start to put systems in place that keep people safe, all of the hard work that Australians have done, all of it is going to be squandered over the course of 2021. Now, Labor knows that if we are to beat this virus and to keep Australians safe, there can be no more delays of the type that this Morrison government engages in. It is Labor that would build dedicated quarantine facilities in every single state and territory. Labor would fix this bungled vaccine rollout. Labor would start a mass public health campaign around vaccines. Where is the public health campaign around vaccines in this country today under the Morrison government? Labor would make it a first priority to manufacture new vaccines right here. Uh, and it is Labor's plan that is the only pathway forward towards a real recovery that leaves Australians secure in getting on with their lives. That is the kind of leadership that Australians need. That is the kind of responsibility that Australians need. And the Morrison government is offering the opposite. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I rise to speak on the COVID-19 disaster payment funding arrangements bill of 2021. The amount of money this government has spent in response to the pandemic is truly breathtaking. It boggles the mind. More than $300 billion. It's very clear that successive Australian governments never anticipated such an event and certainly never had any kind of practical response planned. We wouldn't be in this situation otherwise. We're talking about generations of more debt, locking in welfare dependency, massive buckets of money thrown at big business which didn't need anywhere near as much as they received. Workers receiving subsidised wages for beyond what they were actually earning. The government had no problem chasing debts by hounding welfare recipients prior to this pandemic, but there appears to be no comprehensive plan to recover a lot of money wasted in the pandemic. We are dooming generations of Australians for, to paying for these mistakes in the future. We may be a trillion dollars in the red in a few short years. We may be able to lessen this burden on our children and their children if only the government will forensically examine where this avalanche of funds has gone, where much of it wasn't needed, and move to recover it. This response was not thought out. It was rushed and expensive mistakes have been made. I've heard from businesses which have received thousands of taxpayer dollars despite telling the government it was no longer required. Some companies claiming JobKeeper have actually improved their earnings during the pandemic and continued to pay big dividends and executive bonuses, and all they've risked are their reputations. Why? Because JobKeeper is based on a company's revenue and not on whether the company actually needed it. This economic response has been heavily rorted. It's been a scammer's paradise. In March, the Australian Taxation Office said it was still owed hundreds of millions of dollars from companies who roared a job keeper, even from companies which agreed to hand back money to taxpayers. At the time, the ATO said it had recovered about $135 million, with only some of this money related to deliberate defrauding of job keeper. And shockingly, the ATO agreed not to recover about $50 million from about 12,000 businesses who made honest mistakes. Some businesses claimed wages for employees who did not exist in order to qualify for a taxpayer boost to their cash flow. The ATO said only one large company had been referred to, to potential prosecution and only a handful of others were being considered. As early as August last year, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission confirmed to a parliamentary committee it had received COVID-19 scam referrals from nine different agencies. It noted property crime, government program fraud, identity theft linked to the stimulus, suspicious international payments and money transfers, 
fraudulent websites providing misleading information and unlicensed advice about JobKeeper and fraudulent claims for small business support. It also flagged concerns about early release of superannuation, such as real estate agents encouraging tenants to use it to pay rent, credit providers advising it be used to pay off loans or fund house deposits, and people being charged fees to access it. This may be only the tip of the iceberg when the government is writing blank cheques, everyone, everyone wants a piece of the action. The Prime Minister may say the, the economy can't run on government handouts forever, but will be paying for the response forever. In any case, the economy has been too dependent on massive government spending for too long anyway. Australians long for a government that will get back to what it's supposed to do, govern fairly, justly and efficiently. This pandemic has instead given governments the green light to do what they couldn't do before, exert a level of control over Australian citizens not seen since the Second World War. And it's going to allow successive Australian governments to shift blame for their fiscal failures on the pandemic for a very long time. It's inevitable. But if we get serious about investigating, auditing and recovering as much of the wasted money as possible, we can reduce the burden on future generations. There has been talk about the vaccines, and especially we hear from, from Labor, and they're saying that the vaccine rollout hasn't happened. And the last speaker said, well, Labor would put in new vaccinations that are made here. New vaccinations. Can I tell people the TGA usually takes seven years for any vaccination to be trialled? And here we have, we've got vaccinations in Pfizer and AstraZeneca that is only 10 months old and we're encouraging people to tell it, to actually take the vaccination. But new vaccines? Oh, it's all right, just go and line people up, jab it, we don't even know the effects, the long-term effects with this. The TGA report on the 27th of May of this year stated there, following immunisation, there has been 210 deaths, 109 from Pfizer and a further 94 from AstraZeneca and seven from unspecified vaccinations. Now, this was in the TGA report. Following immunisation, these deaths had occurred. Now, we rely on the TGA and their recommendations, and they backed these vaccinations, I remember. Um, when it first came out. They may complain about Scott Morris and how he's handled this and saying that it is a federal issue and he hasn't handled it properly. Well, I tell you something. When I look at how the premiers of Victoria, Queensland and Western Australia have handled this, at a drop of a hat they close their borders, shut people down in their own states, and it's been absolutely ridiculous how that has been handled. And if that's the Labor premiers, how they've handled it. Hotel quarantine, Victoria was a rabble. That's where it all started. That's where the deaths happened in Victoria. Not under Morrison's watch, the Prime Minister's watch. It was under Labor, the way that Daniel Andrews and his health ministers handled it. So to be hypocrites in this place and say that you blame Morrison, you know, I have no allegiance to the coalition. I have no allegiance to to the Labor Party. I have no allegiance to anyone. But let the facts stand for itself. And they're criticising um, just because we've got an election in the air and you're trying to boost your own numbers and that you're, you're credible? Not what I hear in this place. You're not credible at all. Another thing that I have a pro problem with is wearing of masks. Is that you wear a mask at the airports, but you don't wear a mask to, say, the state of origin or huge big matches. Sporting, you don't have to wear it. Shopping centres, you don't have to wear it. And wearing a mask in an airport, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And I go back to the time when this all happened and people were still flying on airport at the aeroplanes. And they said, it's very safe on an aeroplane. The, the air is continually circulated. It's probably the safest place you can be. Now you're wearing a mask. So information has changed over a period of time and which it will continue to change because I don't think anyone really has an idea what they're talking about. This is completely new to us. 
And uh, I think until we have the true facts, as far as the deaths that they say have occurred, and I've questioned this constantly all the time with COVID, the number of deaths. You know, it's it, it's okay for them to say, oh, well, they've died from it, but it was it was known this was happening around the world that if you died in a car crash and you were tested positive for COVID, that's a COVID death. There was problems with, and I remember there was one person that actually had uh, died in the country, I won't state which state, and it was a COVID death. But that was actually um, known that it wasn't a COVID death, it was actually suicide, but because we had to keep it and couldn't because of, it would upset the, the family for this to be get out. How much of the truth have we been told? How much of the fear factor has gone on here with this COVID? That's what I question. Now, you can't tell me these, all these people were actually um, autopsy was done on them to find out exactly the cause of death. Because if you're over a certain age, you had COVID, you tested positive for COVID, that was a COVID death. The fear mongering is unbelievable what's going on. I can see the problems that have happened in other countries around the world with COVID deaths. Yes, it has been a, a pandemic. We don't have a pandemic here in Australia because overall, we have to say it has been handled very well when we look at other countries under the circumstances. And I will say, based on what's happened in the Labor states and the shutdown, especially Victoria under Labor Premier, I may not always agree or like the, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, but I tell you what, I'm glad he's in control and not a Labor Prime Minister as in Albanese to actually run it and, their, um, and how they would have dealt with this, the whole pandemic. There is, um, so that's, that was about the vaccines, and I've said to people, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, I'm pro-choice. And as I said to people, go out and do your research, understand what you're doing, what, un have an understanding of what you may be putting into your body, because I can tell you, I don't believe it's been thoroughly researched. We don't know the complications that's going to happen down further down the track. And another thing is, you can have your vaccine, it's happening these days, you can have your vaccine, but guess what? It doesn't stop you from being locked up into quarantine. They're still insisting that you be locked up. What about all the people in Victoria that have had the vaccination? Why were they locked up for days on end still? If it's safe to have the vaccination, what's for the purpose of what? You're still going to be locked up, you still have to go in quarantine, you still have to wear your mask, and you're supposed to be safe. So to say in here, vaccinate everyone in the country, you will be safe. Safe from what? It reduces the symptoms that you may get. It doesn't stop you from actually getting the COVID. So this is the facts that the people need to know so they can make a well-informed decision of whether they want to have the vaccine or not. Now, I put it on the record, and I probably those people should take medical advice. I'm not a doctor. Take the advice from the doctors because there are people that have respiratory problems, heart problems, and they probably may need to have the vaccine. But those people that are healthy, and we've seen healthy people in the 50s, only just recently, die after having the vaccination shot for COVID. They didn't think that be, they, once they got that jab in their arm, they'd be dead within a few days, possibly next day. They trusted the government. They trusted our health bureaucrats. And I don't think they've been advised correctly. Now, I'm not, as I said, I'm not a doctor. I just want people to be well informed before they actually go and get this, this vaccination so they know what the impact may have on them. And people say, and, and the medical profession are saying, oh yeah, but in relation to the numbers that have died and in relation to the numbers, you know, that vaccination, what it will help for other people, well, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to them because it's not their loved one. It's not their wife, their child, their husband, their brother, their sister. That's why it doesn't matter to them. They don't care. I think it's very important that we advise the people correctly on which way to go with having this. We don't know what's going to happen down the road. And I hear people, you know, another senator, Faruqi, saying that she hasn't, you know, um, 
expressing today about international and you can't, people aren't coming back in the country and we're not having time together and it's really heartbreaking. That's even happening in our own country when the borders are shut down. Daniel Andrews, families couldn't see each other and they're only a few kilometres away. And what about the, the woman who wanted to go to the father's funeral? She couldn't go. Even in a full PPE, she couldn't go to the funeral. She had to see him later, after, by herself. The woman that was pregnant with, with twins, one of them died because the Queensland Premier wouldn't allow her over the border to go to the hospital. Case after case after case, there has been no real compassion whatsoever that's shown that is reasonable and common sense. All I see is power and control of the people through this whole COVID rubbish that's been gone on. That it needs to be, you know, you deal with the issue. You don't destroy people's lives. And as I said earlier in my speech, the handout of money was unbelievable. And when this first hit in April of the first last year, 727,000 people on New Start allowance got double their money. No, their circumstances didn't change. Not one iota. But then we doubled their money. The whole lot has been handled atrociously in so many areas, and the taxpayers are going to be paying for it for a long time to come and future generations until we can rein this back in. So instead of criticising each other as leaders of this nation, I suggest you start working together for the people, because this is not about election issue. This goes on far beyond that. This is about the people of Australia and being looked after. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, and I also rise just to speak on the uh, COVID disaster payment funding arrangements bill of uh, 2021 this afternoon here in the Senate. And look, um, I guess there's been no shortage of debate in this place, as well as in the other place here in Parliament House on, on, um, on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that's currently uh, before us, not just here in Australia, but right around the world. And um, I guess the, the contributions by many senators in this place, Mr Acting Deputy President, including the one that we just heard, you know, everyone um, I think is trying to put forward, rightly or wrongly, their, their own thoughts and, and ways on how we can overcome um, the crisis that we are facing, both economically but also the health crisis that uh, every state government and, and, and the Commonwealth government is trying to handle right now. Um, but I, I must say, though, um, for, for members to come in here, senators to come into this place and, and to say on one hand that it's not about the politics, you know, to, to claim that they're not a doctor but still provide that medical advice. All I'll say to people is that if you're listening to today's debate, you know, always take the advice of your GP. Make sure that you go and talk to your doctor. At the end of the day, what uh, we are trying to do here is to facilitate the best um, vaccination that we can give the Australian people um, through their GPs, through uh, the many vaccination programs right around, right around the country. Uh, and I really do think that if anyone was listening to the contributions before by Senator Hanson, that I really would urge them to talk to their doctors, because at the end of the day, their doctors are the best place to have that discussion. After all, all we can do here at Parliament is to support um, our experts whether they be in the Department of Health, uh, whether they be uh, the various state governments who are doing a very good job at trying to manage uh, the situation uh, that is COVID. And we know today that the New South Wales government might be entering a period of uh, uncertainty, just like the Victorian government. Back in my home state, the state governments had to manage the situation. And I do take exception, though, uh, of some of the contributions that were made before suggesting that somehow it was the Victorian government that started this pandemic here in the country. Uh, quite frankly, if it wasn't for the work, the cooperative work and the good work by all premiers um, to ensure that we lock down Australia and protecting our citizens, we wouldn't be in the position that we are today. Look ar around, right around the world and you will find that Australia is now the envy, the envy of the world. Why? Because our state governments have taken the hard decisions, the, good, the right decisions, to protect its citizens. And, and it's good to see that the Commonwealth finally come to the table, finally come to the table and start to work with the various state governments, whether they're Labor or Liberal, 
in making sure that Australians do have the freedom of movement. Um, and I know there are lockdowns, there are lockdowns, and it may be an annoyance for some, but quite frankly, I would rather be in a lockdown than having thousands of people dying every single day. And that is what is happening right around the world, Mr Acting Deputy President. Now, drawing, um, uh, speaking on the bill that is currently before the chamber, the only reason that this legislation has become necessary is because of this government's many failures to bring the pandemic under control. Now, whether it's been through the rollout of the vaccination program or, or uh, the lack of having a, a national quarantine uh, program, or even cutting off uh, the JobKeeper payments early, you know, these are a number of issues that the Labor opposition has been asking this government to consider for some time. Now, the government has finally uh, agreed to support a uh, number of people um, who are currently um, in, in need of support um, where there is a lockdown. And I understand that uh, $500 a week has been offered for people who are engaged in paid employment for less than 20 hours a week and $325 a week for people who are engaged in paid employment of less than 20 hours per week. Now, in Victoria, this is very important. You know, currently, uh, you know, we're facing quite uh, substantial issues where many Victorian workers and small businesses need support, need support from their federal government. They've had the support from the state government and it is now time that the support is offered by the federal government. But I would say to you, Mr Acting Deputy President, that uh, unfortunately the support is a little bit too little and a bit too late. But it is good to see that the government has finally come to the table. But the uh, Treasurer has only managed to find about $100 million a day uh, $100 million out of the $1 trillion deficit that they've been able to rack up in the last budget uh, to support Victorians, the many small businesses, the many workers who are in need of financial assistance. Um, but for us to, to look at this bill, the, um, the government will have the discretion to ensure that only this payment is on offer where there is one week of lockdown each month, and that is what's been assumed as part of its budget costings. Now, the failed uh, by this government to deliver a successful vaccine rollout and to secure quarantine program is hurting not just businesses and workers but also consumers and uh, people who do want to be able to help ensure that there is a speedy economic recovery. At the end of the day, once the economy is back on track and we are able to reopen and, and uh, have a successful growing economy, the sooner that all workers can go back to their, to their offices, can go to their factories, can just carry on with life as normal. But it is imperative that we are actually all getting vaccinated. And, and that is ultimately the key here. The reason why that we do encourage people to get vaccinated is once we do get to a certain level, and whatever that level is, and I've heard figures of around 70 to 80 per cent, uh, we're then able to avoid having lockdowns. You know, and, and until that situation occurs, until the federal government actually starts to find other providers of the vaccine, you know, it's not good enough that they've come here and saying, yes, you know, we're, we've got some contracts for the vaccine, for COVID vaccine, but to find out that it's taken them some time to um, actually land deals with many vaccine providers right around the world. Uh, yes, we've got the AstraZeneca um, and Pfizer, but where are the others? Where are the others? And I have, I've had many meetings this week with uh, multiple groups who are very promising, and, and, and it looks promising that we'll have a lot more vaccinations by the end of the year. But this, these discussions should have occurred 18 months ago. They should have occurred 18 months ago. But yet it seems like the government has taken the cheap and easy option. We'll just do, go with one or two providers who will give us the vaccine and everything will be fine. And it hasn't actually been that case. You know, we are not on, on, on our way to uh, to the government's targets of trying to have everyone vaccinated through the one dosage by the end of the year. And it looks very much like it may not be till the middle of next year, uh, which is quite disappointing, because until we can get people to a certain level uh, where they are vaccinated, the sooner we can do that, the sooner we can start opening our economy and not, and not be in a situation where state governments have to run our national economy, because unfortunately the federal government, through the national cabinet process, hasn't been able hasn't been able to deliver nationally consistent rules on how we can have a quarantine program in this place. But having said all that, um, you know, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, it should be no surprise that we've had to have Channel 9 and others 
who have had to roll out a national campaign uh, in terms of public awareness of the vaccine program to providing access to straightforward information on who is eligible and who is not. Um, and really, that point is really important because if you keep shifting the goalposts, keep shifting the goalposts of who is eligible for what various uh, vaccines, you then start to undermine the system. And that is something that we are trying very hard to avoid. Uh, unfortunately, the government you know, has its press conference one week, and that will change with the information that is, a, that, that is provided to the Australian public. Um, we really do need this government to make sure that there is a national campaign that is rolled out as soon as possible, because the sooner we provide the Australian people with the confidence that the vaccinations program is safe, the sooner we can actually increase the number of people who are eligible to receive that. We've even had the uh, Royal Australian College of General Practitioners um, raise uh, concerns uh, and say that the new targeted advertising campaigns, uh, well, that, that the new, new target advertising campaigns are desperately needed to tackle the vaccine hesitation. Um, and we heard earlier before from other, uh, from other senators in this place about the unease that a number of people have towards uh, finding, I guess, the appropriate jab for them. And I, again, could not stress enough the fact that they should go and speak to their local GP, make an appointment today. If you're listening to the Senate here, please go speak to your GP, make that appointment and have a good chat to them about the risks of taking the vaccine jab. At the end of the day, um, what we all want to see is us you know, talking about other issues as well, you know, how we can better in put investment in health and education, grow in our economy. But until we can do that, until we can get the vaccination rates up, you know, it is going to be very difficult for this government uh, to justify how we get out of the mess that they've created. Um, but let's also not forget that JobKeeper and, and you know, the government uh, and I finally came to the table with the JobKeeper support payments. No, oh, come on, Senator Rustin. Um, let's also not forget that you know it did take a while for the government to come to the table and offering uh, many people that support that was desperately needed, especially in my home state of Victoria. Now it is, um, uh, and I should also just add, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President that the, um, you know, the state government, uh, through the acting premier, has also been calling on this government uh, for, some, from, for a couple of days of this week uh, to come in to the table to clarify where are the vaccines for the many disability uh, workers uh, working in aged care uh, in terms of getting priority for groups 1A and 1B. Um, and it, we still haven't been able to have any clear answers from the relevant ministers in this place, and I don't also believe in the other place to date. So I would just urge the government, please you know, listen to the contributions that have been made here in this place today. Please get on with finding more vaccines, because the sooner that we can get more people vaccinated, the sooner that we can open up the economy and move on to bigger and better things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank senators who have made a contribution to this debate. Uh, thank them very much for that contribution. Uh, the bill appropriates uh, from Consolidated Revenue Fund for the purposes of making the COVID-19 disaster payment during the 21-22 financial year. The bill also provides that the National Recovery and Resilience Agency will report on the COVID-19 disaster payment in their annual report. Australians are a resilient people, but sometimes they need the support in difficult times. The appropriations ensures that the COVID-19 disaster payment will be available and fully funded should additional lockdowns occur, which of course we hope they won't. And I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Watt on behalf of the opposition be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is, the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone teller for the ayes, Senator Brockman teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now put the question that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to make provision in relation to COVID-19 disaster payments and for related purposes. I'll give senators a moment to resume their seats and we'll, as we move to questions without notice. Senators to resume their seats as quickly as possible. Senators. Everyone is everyone prepared? Senators, please resume your seats. 
questions without notice. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. New South Wales is sadly facing another devastating COVID-19 outbreak as a result of an unvaccinated airport driver contracting, contracting COVID-19. Jane Halton, the Morrison government's hand-picked advisor, warned of this in her report last year and this morning said, and I quote, I actually drew people's attention when I debriefed them to this particular issue. I actually said this was a potential hole and people needed to be very, very aware that these people and their transport arrangements had to be a high priority. Why are the people of New South Wales now suffering for the Morrison government's failure to act on warnings and recommendations delivered eight months ago? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Camilli, for the question. Mr. President, um, the national hotel quarantine system is operating based on the decision of national cabinet and the agreements of national cabinet to manage hotel quarantine for Australia's, Australians returning to Australia. Mr. President, uh, I am as concerned as Senator Keneally and anyone else in this chamber that the driver was not vaccinated, Mr. President, but the responsibility for those frontline workers managing hotel quarantine are based with the states, based on the decisions of National Cabinet, Mr. President. And as we heard from the Chief Medical Officer, uh, the recommendations of the Halton Review have been implemented across the states, and, and Ms. Halton has made a number of recommendations and public comments urging states to ensure that their hotel quarantine systems are complying with those processes, Mr. President. And Mr. President, as the CMO indicated to us at estimates recently, the management of hotel quarantine and the national system for managing returning travellers is a standing agenda item at every AHPPC meeting. Uh, which is attended by the chief health officers of each state uh, to ensure that they continue to implement all of the learnings that have occurred even since the Halton Review comments over the last 12 months to ensure that the, ho the hotel quarantine system does perform at its, possible, its best possible way to ensure Australians remain safe from the virus. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do. In facing another COVID-19 outbreak, the New South Wales Liberal Premier Gladys Berejiklian has said, and I quote, until the vast majority of our population is vaccinated, these threats will be real and ongoing. When will the vast majority of the New South Wales population be vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, the objective of the government is that every Australian who wants to have a vaccine will have the opportunity to take one up by the end of this calendar year. So that includes all New South Wales residents. It includes everyone across the country, Mr. President. We released yesterday the data, Mr. President, to indicate the vaccine supply availability that will facilitate that. Each of the, uh, the vaccine types that will be available to Australians to access a vaccine by the end of this year, Mr. President. So we continue to work cooperatively with the states. Well, Mr. Mr. President, it is actually happening, Order. Mr. President. Uh, there were close to 140,000 Australians who took up a vaccine just yesterday, Mr. Order. President. Just yesterday, Order. close to 140,000 Australians took up a vaccine. Senator Over 1.1 million Australians have taken up a vaccine in the Order, last 10 Senator days, Mr. Colbeck, President. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Premier Berejiklian also said, and I quote, New South Wales has, a re has had a real sense of urgency in relation to the vaccine rollout. Given Mr. Morrison has said that it's not a race, why has the Morrison government not shared Premier Berejiklian's real sense of urgency? Senator Colbeck. 
Mr. President, will I agree with uh, Premier Berejiklian with respect to her, the work that she's doing? And, and I congratulate the New South Wales government, Mr. President, in particular, for the magnificent job that they have done in managing COVID-19 uh, throughout the pandemic, Mr. President. It is clear from all of the evidence that we have that they have been the best at managing outbreaks and working their way through the challenges that we have all faced in uh, the period of the, co of the pandemic, Mr. President. So we are supporting every state and territory with the supply information that was provided to them through National Cabinet Order. on Monday, Mr. President, uh, and we will continue to do that. And as vaccine supply arrangements are confirmed, they will be firmed up and the supplies provided to the state so that we can continue to support Australians. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please advise the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting jobs and investment by delivering on our plan for economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank Senator Bragg for his question. Indeed, uh, a passionate advocate, Senator Bragg, for investment in our economy, for the strength of Australian business, and what uh, what we have been able to achieve in Australia amongst the most uncertain and challenging of global times is very much the envy of the world. Australia has managed to save lives and livelihoods like few other countries in the world. And indeed, for nations of our size, scale and standing, we stand head and shoulders above the rest of the world for the saving of lives of Australians through the management of this pandemic and through the saving of livelihoods through the management of this pandemic. It has been the largest economic shock to the world since the Great Depression, Mr President. But pleasingly, Australia is recovering strongly and creating more opportunities for Australians. Under our economic recovery plan, the Morrison government has committed a record $291 billion of support to the economy to protect the livelihoods of Australians, to keep businesses in business and Australians in jobs. Our plan, laid out in successive budgets last year and this year, creates jobs, guarantees essential services and builds a more resilient and secure Australia. Our plan is based on ensuring lower taxes create the opportunities for investment, investment by households and investment by Australian businesses, putting more money in the pockets of hard-working Australians, enhancing reward for effort, supporting household demand, creating investment incentives for business, which are leading to more investment, more productivity, but most crucially, more jobs for Australians. And that is the number one dividend that we wish to see Order. and that we take pride Senator in. Ayres. More jobs for Australians at record Order. levels. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, can the Minister please inform the Senate about recent economic data and reporting and what these figures demonstrate about the success of the government's plan in creating more jobs and supporting our economy. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, last week we saw unemployment fall for the seventh consecutive month to 5.1 per cent, smashing all market expectations in seeing unemployment fall to such a low level. 115,000 new jobs created in that month, around 85 per cent of which were full-time jobs. Now, it's not that long ago that the Leader of the Opposition and those opposite were, call, were suggesting that the economic roof of Australia would come crashing in at the end of JobKeeper. But since the end of that program, we've seen 84,000 jobs that have been added to Australia's economy. Since the peak of the pandemic, 987,000 jobs have been created, with employment now surpassing its pre-pandemic levels. The March quarter national accounts saw growth of 1.8 per cent, again beating market expectations. In fact, the last three quarters of economic growth have been the strongest in Order. more than 50 years. Senator Birmingham, Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Minister, uh, finally, can the minister outline the importance of lower taxes, reducing red and green tape, and a technology-not-taxes approach to emissions reduction? 
in generating jobs and investment? Order. And are there any risks to Australia's continued economic recovery if these order. measures order. Sorry, are Senator not— Bragg, please, please. I asked yesterday for silence during questions. I need to be able to hear the question. Please continue, Senator Bragg. And are there any risks to Australia's continued economic recovery if these measures are not— Senator Green. If these Senator measures Gallagher. are not implemented. Senator Birmingham. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. Indeed, our government has invested significantly in having lower taxes to help ensure households and businesses can drive the economic recovery of Australia. Because we know that a genuine economic recovery comes from Australian business. It comes from policies that support business to invest and to hire more, more people and more Australians. That's why our government has got a commitment to lower income taxes. And we can guarantee that we will deliver those lower income taxes now and into the future. Those on the other side won't make that same commitment to lower income taxes. We've delivered lower taxes for Australian businesses to encourage investment. Those on the other side have always stood against lower taxes when it comes to investment. And of course, Australians can be thankful that we won the last election and are implementing those lower tax policies, or else we would have seen the $387 billion of additional taxes those opposite had taken to the last election implemented Order. at precisely the wrong time, time for Australia that would have jeopardised. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister of Health, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the documents tabled by Senator Colbeck yesterday entitled, and I quote, COVID vac vaccination allocation horizons. <laughs> Why is there no mention of the word target and what precisely is meant by the new term horizons? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, no order. Mr. Mr. President, order. The, the document that I tabled yesterday that was provided to the states uh, by uh, Lieutenant General Fruin on Monday was to provide to the states and territories an indication of the vaccine volumes that will be provided to them on a weekly basis between now and the end of this calendar year. That is the point of that. That is a terminology that is a part of that document, Mr. President. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, it is about providing information to Order. the states and territories so that they can adequately and appropriately plan their requirements for people to vaccinate Australians as the am amounts of vaccine be uh, begin to grow towards the end of the calendar year. Mr. President. This is about working with the states and assisting them with their planning in relation to the workforce they will need to roll out the vaccine so that Australians, as we have said on a number of occasions, have the opportunity to access a vaccine before the end of this year. The document Mr. President, provides information as to the amount of vaccines of various types that will be provided to the states. It provides information about the, the volumes of vaccines that will be provided to GPs and through those various pathways that Australians will be able to access to get a vaccine by the end of this year, Mr. President. This is about Order. providing information to assist the states and territories and those that are working with the government on vaccinating Australians with the information they need for their logistical planning. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. How many aged care workers and disability workers have been fully vaccinated in New South Wales? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in respect of the um, aged care residents, Mr. President, can I say to you that of the I think you asked me for both. Okay, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, so in, in, in respect of the, the residents of aged care in, Vic, in New South Wales, every, every aged care facility in New South Wales has had 
uh, a first dose visit. Order, and, Senator uh, Colbeck. I have Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Senator Gallagher. Point of order on um, direct relevance, uh, Mr. President. There was no preamble. It was a very direct question. And um, if the minister misheard, it was specifically relating to workers in aged and disability sector. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. I, I have ruled previously that when questions are very strictly worded and seek a statement fact, that the test of direct relevance is very strictly applied. Um, the question I had, and I've allowed you to remind the minister, did refer, I believe, to aged care and disability workers uh, uh, in New South Wales. So I'll ask Senator Colbeck to uh, turn to that very specific question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, in respect of the vaccination of uh, residential aged care staff, um, there are 20,375 who have received their first dose and 11,000. 196 who have received their second dose, Mr. President, in New South Wales. In New South Wales, uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I don't Order. have with me, Mr. President, I don't have with me the data for um, for NDIS or disability workforce. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government has broken its promise that all Australians would be vaccinated by October, that 4 million would be vaccinated by the end of March, that all 1A would be vaccinated by Easter, and that 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by the 10th of May. Can the minister confirm a horizon is actually never reached, just like every <laughs> single vaccine target the Morrison government has set itself? Order. Order. I'll, I'll call Senator Colbeck when there's silence. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. It's at times like this you think that the opposition's ears might be painted on, Mr. President, because we have explained a number of times, Mr. President, uh, that as the rollout Order. of the vaccination process has occurred, Order. that as the rollout of the vaccination process has occurred, uh, we have had to change our order on my change the, the way the rollout is occurring Long. based on the circumstances that have occurred. It's all very well, Mr. President, for the opposition to repeat something that happened or was said in February and ignore everything that's happened between now and order. then, Mr. President. In fact, it's quite dishonest that they continue to do that, Mr. President. We order. have had to make some adjustments to the rollout as, a, as circumstances have changed, order. Mr. President. We've had to do that, and we, Mr. President, continue to work with the states and territories using the information that we provided Order. to them yesterday, so that Australians can get access to a vaccine. That what, those that want one can do that by the end Senator of this calendar is. year. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to uh, Senator Hume, uh, acting on behalf of the Environment Minister. Senator, the Great Barrier Reef suffered its first mass coral bleaching in 1998, the first in recorded history. Even though our best climate models at the time predicted it wasn't possible to have back-to-back -back mass coral bleachings, they did occur in 2016 and 2017. We had a fourth mass coral bleaching in 2019-2020. The reef is believed to have lost half of its coral cover. Your own internal reports in 2019 downgraded the status of the reef from poor to very poor. Last year, UNESCO downgraded the status of the reefs to critical. Minister, do you agree the Great Barrier Reef is in danger? Good question. The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator, for your question. The Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. Benchmarked against global standards, Australia's management of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered and is considered by many to be the gold standard for large scale mar marine protected area management, according to that same UNESCO report. The centrepiece of Australia's reef protection efforts is the Reef 2050 Plan, jointly developed with the Queensland Government. The plan is being delivered and it is achieving results. We have reduced pressures on the reef, built reef resilience and strengthened partnerships for the future. Australian and Queensland governments are now investing more than $3 billion from 2014-15 to 2023-24 to implement the Reef 2050 Plan. 
More than $2 billion of this is from the Australian government, which is an unprecedented investment. They are big numbers, but what does that mean at the ground level? It means that the custodian of the Lady Elliot Island, Peter Gash, can continue 20 years of work transforming order. a former Senator island Hume, mine. I have Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Point of order on relevance, President. I, I did state un indisputable facts, and I asked the minister if she believed personally, if she believed the reef was in danger. Okay, she hasn't Senator, answered, come Senator, anywhere near answering. Senator, it's the same response order. she gave to Senator, Senator Waters Wilson, earlier this your week. Seat. Senators will note that in the previous series of questions, I reminded senators that when questions are very strictly worded, the test of direct relevance can easily be strictly applied. This question contained a preamble, and I believe the minister is being directly relevant in stating facts that are relevant to assertions you made in your preamble, Senator Wish Wilson. You've reminded the minister of the last part of your question, but she is free to continue being directly relevant to parts of the question as well. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. And I will remind Senator Wish Wilson my first sentence was, in fact, that the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef and that we fully recognise that the Great Barrier Reef is indeed facing serious pressures from climate change and other impacts, which is why we are, de which is why we are delivering the 2050 plan, which is jointly developed with the Queensland government. The big numbers in that plan mean that the custodian of Lady Elliot Island, Peter Gash, can continue 20 years of work transforming a former island mine site into a world-famous uh, ecological sanctuary. It also means that a continued conservation work with sea turtles at uh, Mon Repos and Rain Island. It means that five control vessels are continuing to protect reef resilience by culling coral-eating crown of thorns starfish on critical reefs in the marine park. And it means that Order, world Senator leading Hume, time for the answer has expired. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Chair. UNESCO is an authoritative, science-led, evidence-based body. Order. Based on an evidence process. Sorry, Senator Wish Wilson, please. President, oh, oh, I Senator, don't think order. the death of the Senator Wish Wilson, please resume your seat. I'm order. That's it. Order. Seriously, I'm asking people, please resume your seat, Senator Wish Wilson. I was attempting to give you the silence you deserve to ask your question, and I was attempting to call those on my right to order. Heckling during questions is utterly disorderly. Order, Senator Wish Wilson, please. So I'm going to ask the clock to be reset. I'm going to ask the clock to be reset, and Senator Wish Wilson to commence his question, which she has every right to be heard in silence. Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Do you agree with UNESCO's recommendation to the World Heritage Committee to downgrade the status of the Great Barrier Reef to in danger, World Heritage in danger? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, as I said, the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef, and we fully recognise we fully recognise that the Great Barrier Reef Listen. is facing significant pressures from climate change and from other impacts. Order. We do not. We do not support the recommendation to immediately place the reef on the list of world heritage in danger, and we will strongly oppose that recommendation. <laughs> Mr President, we think that this recommendation is premature and doesn't recognise the enormous efforts of the Australian and Queensland governments working with farmers, working with tourism operators, working with traditional owners and working with local communities up and down the reef coast to protect the reef and to support them with a $3 billion joint investment. This government has been stunned by the backflip on previous assurances by UN officials that the reef would not face such a recommendation prior to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee meeting Order. hosted by China this July. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Uh, Dr Fanny Duver, the head of UNESCO's World Heritage Marine Program, has completely rebutted any backflip. Minister, what are you going to do about the Barrier Reef? Are you going to, as Dr Diver suggested, stand together with the international community rather than fight this and address the issue at hand, which is that without climate action there is no future for the Great Barrier Reef? Senator Hume. 
very much, Mr. President, and I will reiterate exactly what we are doing about the Great Barrier Reef because the Morrison government, I reiterate again, is deeply committed to protecting that reef. That is why the Australian and Queensland governments are now investing more than $3 billion from 2014-15 to 23-24 to implement the Reef 2050 plan. More than $2 billion of this is from the Australian government, which is an un unprecedented investment. Australia's practical action on emissions reduction goes hand in hand with our practical action on reef protection and climate adaption. And this includes efforts to improve the health and the resilience of the reef to climate change by reducing local and regional pressures and leading the way in reef adaption science through measures like $150 million of reef, reef restoration and adaption program. That's a world-leading investment pro project to find innovative ways to, for the coral reef Order. to adapt to the impacts of climate change, an issue that I know is so dear to your heart, Senator Wish Wilson. Order. Senator Wong. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. The Leader of the House advised the House at the commencement of Christmas time that Mr Joyce would be absent from question time as he is a close contact. Minutes later, the Deputy Prime Minister showed up. Can the Minister advise why? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Wong for that question. I would point out that since that's been happening, I have actually been here in the chamber in question time myself, so I'll have to take that question on notice and get back to you. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Can the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister advise whether the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia is a close contact or not? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, my previous answer stands is we'll have to get uh, advice on that and, and advise you back. Order, Senator. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, in a week of chaos. Order, order Senator Wong. I'm going to. I'll give you the chance to recommence. I can't hear the question, and it's from both sides of the chamber. Senator Wong, restart the clock. Thank you. Uh, in a week of chaos from this coalition government, we've had the Nationals under Deputy Prime Minister Joyce attempt to tear up the Murray-Darling Basin plan, National Party talking points saying the science no longer supports fresh water for South Australia, and now we have confusion about who represents the Prime Minister in the House question time. All the while, three capital cities are facing COVID-19 outbreaks and facing restrictions or lockdowns, a complete rewrite of the vaccine rollout and no plan for fit-for-purpose quarantine. What confidence can this government, Order. can Australians Senator have in this chaotic government? Order. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I take most of that as largely as a political statement from Senator Wong. But I can tell you there is no chaos or confusion on this side of the chamber. You have a look. We have been Order. focusing on the health of Australians, Order. on the economy, on jobs, Order. on education, on, my left. Uh, on disability. So this week has been you know, the national order on my left. There is just... Sorry, Senator Wong, Senator Polly. There are too many names to call out, Senator Wong. Sorry, Senator Watt. I meant to say on this occasion. My apologies. Senator Reynolds to continue. Thank you. There is no confusion on this side about what is important for this nation. As I've said, it is all about the economy. It is about protecting Australians, keeping them safe, and keeping them healthy. Thank Senator you, Mr. President. Senator McAllister. Senator, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, can I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to Senator Wong's primary question? Leave is, leave is not granted. Order. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Special Minister for State, Senator Birmingham. At Senate Estimates in May, I asked the Electoral Commissioner Mr Tom Rogers, a simple question, quote, who conducted the audit on the software used by the Australian Electoral Commission, how much did the audit cost and what was the result? The answer was, quote, if you are trying to suggest there is a problem, I don't understand why you would do that. Let me ask again, who conducted the most recent audit of the AEC election software, how much did it cost? And what was the result? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks Mr. President. Um, uh, thanks, Senator Roberts, for uh, the question. I can't quite recall whether those details were actually also taken on notice 
uh, during the estimates hearings. It, uh, it would not be a surprise uh, to, uh, to the Senate that, in terms of uh, those contract details, I don't have them precisely to hand in the chamber. Uh, so I will take them on notice here, noting they may already have been taken on notice through the estimates process. Uh, but I would also state uh, our complete confidence in the integrity and operation of the Australian Electoral Commission. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. The Australian National Audit Office audited the results of the 2016 federal election and has not been asked back since. If the Australian National Audit Office were not asked to look at the software in the last four years, who has? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, we are talking about two entities that, uh, that operate with, uh, with independence uh, from government, the Australian Electoral Commission and the Australian National Audit Office. Uh, in terms of the interaction between those entities, I can take it on notice to seek information from them. Uh, but, Mr. President, uh, I'm not able to, uh, to provide Senator Roberts with uh, details uh, and myself of those interactions. They're certainly not interactions directed by the government. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. In March and again in May this year, I asked the following question and on both occasions did not receive an answer. So I ask again. In 2019, how many physical paper ballots were compared back to the electronic data record after the initial data entry, which would be an essential part of this auditing, auditing we are assured is going on? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, my recollection is that the Australian Electoral Commissioner did talk through uh, some of those issues in the recent estimates hearings uh, with you, uh, Senator Roberts, and, uh, and that uh, that uh, was addressed in those estimates hearings. I know you have been exploring those issues for a period of time uh, and that some responses have been placed on notice, uh, but I also recall in relation to the comparison between paper ballots and data processing and the steps that the AEC undertake in that regard that the Commissioner did take you through um, uh, the explanations during those recent estimates hearings. I'd refer you to the Hansard in that regard. Uh, if, following review of that Hansard, you have uh, additional aspects that are unclear, uh, then of course I'm always happy to work through them with you. Senator Patterson. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister advise the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting Australian businesses and business owners to get on with what they do best? so they can grow, prosper and create more jobs for Australians. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Patterson for the question. And Senator Patterson, you are right. That is the priority of the Morrison government, to support employers out there, to support businesses, to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs for Australians. And certainly COVID-19 has had an absolutely devastating effect uh, on businesses out there. But because of the economic policies that the Morrison government put in place, what we have seen is the economy rebound back. What we have seen is businesses utilising the policies that we have put in place to prosper, to grow. And as we know, based on the employment figures, in particular the most recent employment figures from May 2021, they are certainly creating more jobs for Australians. And Mr President, what we know in government is that businesses don't create jobs, uh, or government doesn't create jobs. Businesses do. Governments put in place the economic framework, the economic framework that businesses can utilise to prosper and grow. And certainly at this point in time, we are ahead of almost every other country in the world, Mr President. We now have in Australia more people in employment than we did prior to COVID-19. That is a good thing and it is something that we are proud of as a government. And Mr President, it is because of the policies that the government is putting in place. We have delivered record business confidence as a result of our government's economic measures. And when you look at those economic measures, Mr President, the budget's expansion of the full expensing measure has seen the strongest numbers in machinery and equipment investment in 17 years. The strongest 
the strongest numbers in machinery and equipment investment. That's because, Mr. President, what we're saying to business is, if you have the capacity to invest in yourself, we will back you every step of the way. Because we know when you invest in yourself, you grow the business and you employ more Australians. Order. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Order. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I just really appreciate, as a Victorian senator, hearing Senator Watt's interjections about the cost of lockdown on small business. Uh, Order. Yeah. Order on my left. Order. Sorry, we're going to restart. You can take your seat, Senator Patterson. Order. Order. Senator Watt, Senator Carr. If you don't interject, you don't get retorts like that at the start of the question, even if they're not helpful. If the bait is not laid, it is not taken. Senator, Senator Patterson, I'll recommence the clock. Thanks, Mr President. Grateful for that. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is continuing to move bureaucratic red and green tape for Australian businesses, both big and small? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And red and green tape, what it does is it stops businesses from taking on their first employee. Red and green tape, it stops businesses from prospering and growing. Red and green tape, it stops businesses from expanding their businesses, growing and employing more Australians. And that is why we are focused, the Morrison government is focused on getting rid of as much unnecessary red and green tape as we can. We understand that you need to take the regulatory burden off businesses, off employers, so that they can unlock investment, grow their business and create more jobs. Mr President, one of the things that we've achieved as a government is we've made it easier for Australians to work across state borders. That is a good thing, in particular when Order. you look at tradies. Senator tradies on Watt. the Gold Coast can now go just a few kilometres down the Order. road to Tweed Heads and do the same job without paying for a different trade licence. We will look at where we can, removing the regulatory burden on businesses Order. so Senator that— Senator Cash. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister outline the importance of these measures to support businesses and any risks that Australian businesses face as we continue our economic recovery? Order. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, on this side of the chamber, the Morrison government side of the chamber, we are focused on putting in place those policies which will ensure that businesses are able to prosper, grow, create more jobs for Australians, and ensure the continued return of our economy. In terms of the biggest risk to supporting Australians, it's of course the imposition of higher taxes. And you heard the Minister for Finance refer to what the Labor Party promised the Australian people when they last went to the election. $387 billion in higher taxes. As we know, those opposite have never found a tax or a regulation that they haven't loved and they haven't thought to put on business or the Australian people. Well, Mr President, in on our side of the chamber, the Morrison government side of the chamber, we have it in our DNA to lower taxes because we understand it's your money and we need to give you back your money. Whether you Order. are a business or whether you are a tax-paying Australian, you need to have in your pocket Order. more Senator of what Cash. you Time for the answer for. has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister and the State of South Australia. Earlier today in the House of Representatives, talking points in relation to the Murray-Darling Basin were distributed by the party responsible for the government's water policy. It claims that South Australia no longer needs fresh water. Does the minister believe that science no longer requires fresh water for South Australia? Order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, I've, I've not seen the talking points that Senator Hanson Young refers to, Order. but very clearly fresh water is important to the survival of uh, all civilisations, Mr President, to, uh, to state Order. the obvious. To state the obvious, uh, and indeed, fresh water flows are important to the health and sustainability uh, of river systems. Uh, and as Senator Hanson Young well knows, the operation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan under the Water Act 2007, introduced by the Howard government, uh, was established uh, to try to put in place sustainable diversion limits for the first time ever across the Murray-Darling Basin, and it's been very successful to date 
in doing so. In doing so, the Basin Plan has managed to recover some thousands of billions of litres of water that is now held under entitlements by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder for the more efficient and effective management of environmental assets across the basin. In doing so, consideration is given uh, particularly to matters around flow rates uh, and ensuring that in terms of those flow rates uh, there, is, uh, there is a system as well managed as can be possible, noting the significant challenges the significant challenges in a system that now is much more highly regulated uh, than it was at its, uh, in its natural state and, of course, that has many demands placed upon it, and quite, and quite reasonable demands in that sense too. Uh, that water is not only essential uh, for human consumption and for environmental sustainability, it is also essential for food production, for agricultural productivity and that these are important considerations across the basin as well. Uh, and that is why uh, our side of politics has always sought to Order. seek to ensure that we have a system Order. that is sustainable Senator and Birmingham also respects the, the needs and interests of all expired. basin. Order on my left. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you. Um, a supplementary. Given that the National Party's water policy is so wacky, dangerous, anti-science, how can the Prime Minister allow the National Party to remain in charge of his government's water policy? How on earth can the Prime Minister keep the National Party in charge of the water portfolio? Good question. Order. Order. Senator Ayres. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, it's the policy that matters, and the policy of the government is clear in terms of its continued support of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan uh, to be implemented, to be implemented cognizant of all of the matters that have been discussed by the Murray-Darling Basin Ministerial Council over the years. Now, those, Mr. President, who pretend uh, that the settlement of the Basin Plan by then Minister Burke uh, was simply a binary, straightforward affair, are ignoring the fact that there were considerations given at the time to ensuring uh, that there was uh, that water recovery, particularly in relation to the so-called upwater, as it was described at the time, uh, was to be undertaken and must be undertaken in ways that are mindful of the social and economic impacts uh, of such recovery. Uh, they've always been important points. They remain important points in terms of ensuring that the basin plan is implemented in a way that is as respectful and effective for all the communities Order, who Senator rely Birmingham. upon the river system. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. The National Party are wanting to hold Adelaide's water supply to ransom. Yep. When will the Prime Minister stop negotiating with these water terrorists? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, uh, I refer to, to all of my previous answers in, uh, in that regard and, uh, and, and reject uh, the premise of uh, the question that Senator Hanson Young has, uh, has put there. These are and always Order. have been very serious issues. The government's commitment to ensure the Murray Darling Basin is managed in a way consistent with the Water Act and in a way consistent with the Basin Plan is resolute. The government's respect for the importance of that and for our community, Senator Hanson Young in South Australia, is also resolute. The government has made that very clear in the last 24 hours. Now, the advocacy uh, of senators and members of parliament for their own communities is also very important and something to be respected across this place. Uh, it is the advocacy that I bring and you bring in relation to South Australia, but it's the advocacy that others bring in relation to their communities as well. I acknowledge and respect that, but the policy Order. position Senator of the government Birmingham. remains Time clear. The answer has expired. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The former Deputy Prime Minister, Mr McCormack, was a member of the Cabinet Task Force created to oversee the status of women in Australia, tasked with, amongst other things, the government's response to the Foster Review and the Jenkins Inquiry. Will newly appointed Deputy Prime Minister Joyce replace Mr McCormack? Senator Birmingham. Yes. Oh. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. 
The former Deputy Prime Minister, Mr McCormack, was the Deputy Chair of the Governance Committee of Cabinet, responsible for the ministerial standards and conduct of members of the executive. Will newly appointed Deputy Prime Minister Joyce, the only member of parliament to have his own clause in the ministerial standards, replace Mr McCormack? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I haven't seen, uh, seen an update to, uh, to all of the Cabinet Committee arrangements, uh, but I'm sure they'll be published in the ordinary way. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Mm -hmm. Nationals MP Michelle Landry said earlier this week in relation to the prospective reappointment of now Deputy Prime Minister Mr Joyce, and I quote, I think that if he became leader again, there would be women out there that would be unhappy with that. If Mr Joyce doesn't even have the confidence of his own colleagues, how can he have a seat at the Cabinet Task Force on the Status of Women? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, the, uh, the Cabinet Task Force on uh, Women's Safety and Economic Security uh, brings together uh, all of the uh, Cabinet uh, ministers uh, who are women across our government. Uh, along with uh, Senator Hume and Senator Stoker uh, in that task force. Uh, I note that that is a record number of uh, women serving in the Australian Cabinet uh, who, uh, who sit uh, as part of that task force. It is important in terms of the consideration of those matters of women's safety and women's economic security uh, that uh, the leadership of the government uh, across the coalition parties hears clearly on those issues of safety and economic security. That's what the purpose of that task force is for. Uh, it's why the Prime Minister uh, is, uh, is a member of that task force and co-chairs it with Senator Payne. Uh, it's why the Deputy yeah. Prime Minister, the Treasurer and myself as Minister for Finance are all there uh, to ensure uh, that it informs the decisions Order. right across Senator government Birmingham, as it is intended to time for the to answer do. has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. Speaking of women in the Cabinet, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Yeah. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is supporting survivors of institutional child sexual abuse by progressing immediate improvements to the National Redress Scheme? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Smith uh, for his, uh, his question uh, and his ongoing interest in this very, very important issue for many Australians. Um, we know how important redress is to, to survivors of institutionalised child sex abuse, and that's why I'm very pleased to have been able to release the final report of the two-year anniversary review of the scheme, yeah, yeah. as well as the government's independent uh, in, uh, interim response. The report was prepared by independent reviewer Robin Crook, uh, and it outlines um, particularly how she believes that the scheme can be improved uh, and provide a better experience for survivors. Our interim response also ensures that survivors have as much information as they possibly can when they are making that decision as to whether they wish to pursue redress. So, To ensure that the scheme is operating as it is intended to uh, and in the best interests of survivors, in the, in the recent budget we provided uh, an investment of more than an additional $80 million for that purpose. We believe it is absolutely essential that we continue to listen to advocates and survivors because we want this scheme to be the best possible scheme it can be, and particularly that it's survivor-focused. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to inform the Senate as part of uh, our commitment. We have uh, announced that we will be providing advance payments of $10,000 to redress um, survivors who are older or terminally ill. It's something that we heard was very important to survivors, not just because of the financial support that it provides, but it's also an acknowledgement to say uh, that we understand what they have been, uh, been through. Uh, but we can't do this alone. Um, we also have to, in, in the design changes that have been put forward, have to work with the states and territories. Um, to date, we have got more than 65,000 sites on board, more than six and a half applications have been finalised, and more than half a billion dollars has been provided in redress to survivors of institutionalised child sex abuse. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister? outline how the government is encouraging institutions to participate in the National Redress Scheme to ensure all survivors can access redress. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, the government 
absolutely committed to ensuring that each and every survivor has access to redress. And that's why this week I named another three institutions that have failed to join the redress scheme despite having applications lodged against them. These institutions are the Forest Tennis Club here in the ACT, CYMC Basketball Association in Victoria and the Devonport Community Church in Tasmania. Uh, in addition, um, I had already named uh, Kenja Communications, who continues to remain recalcitrant to joining the scheme. Sure. It is totally and utterly unacceptable that yeah, any yeah. institution sure. fails to meet their moral obligation yeah. and sign up to the scheme so that survivors of institutional child yeah, yeah. sex abuse have access to redress. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we will continue to take as actions wherever we possibly can to try and encourage organisations to take responsibility if they have any experience or any history of working with children. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise how the government will continue to improve the scheme for survivors by responding to the remaining recommendations of the review? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you. The most important thing that we think that we can continue to do is to keep hearing from advocates, from survivors or their nominees about how we can continue to progress uh, improvements to the scheme. I can assure the Senate that uh, further consideration and consultation will continue to take place on the recommendations that we need to be working with, yeah. with the states and territories, and we will provide a full response to all recommendations in early 2022. Um, but as I said, the most important thing is to continue with the survivor-focused nature of what we're doing. Most of the recommendations require the support of the states and territories, uh, and so we will continue to work with those states and territories uh, as an absolute matter of priority. It's also, though, we are committed to working with survivors and other stakeholders, uh, and our government is absolutely committed to working with survivors to ensure that this scheme is as focused as it can be on providing them with the redress that they yeah. so justly deserve. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Stirl. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Early this year, at a Senate Select Committee on Job Security discussing foreign flagged vessels, National Senator Canavan identified, and I quote, we have just got to step in and create the circumstances to bring shipping back to Australian flagged vessels. Why is the Morrison government promoting the use of foreign flagged coastal ships, putting at risk the sovereignty of Australia's supply chain, risking jobs and devastating the ability of the inland rail project to attract the required private investment to make it work? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I can confirm that on the 21st of September 2020, the department did release a discussion paper proposing changes to the coastal trading framework for cargo vessels. Uh, the proposed changes are based on stakeholder feedback. The department received 44 submissions, including from shipping companies, maritime industry, unions, and onshore businesses. Nothing in the paper is yet final. The department will continue to work collaboratively to find an outcome that all parties can accept. Uh, under the proposed reform, protections for Australian vessels will be maintained and foreign vessels will continue to need licences. Opening the coast, a strategic fleet or high-cost subsidies will not be considered. The options suggested in the discussion paper are focused on achieving administrative efficiencies within the current system. On the 10th of, July, oh, 10th of June of my apologies, 2021, the Special Recreational Vessels Amendment Act uh, 2021 received royal assent. This extends the super yachts legislation Order. by a further two years and allows additional time to develop a more permanent regulatory solution. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, Mr. President. Um, has the minister explained to the mayors of Albury, Parks, Narrabri and the Scenic Rim? Uh, many of whom are visiting Canberra at the moment, that the expected jobs and investment coming to their regions from the Inland Rail project is being put in jeopardy by the Morrison government's promotion of foreign flagged coastal ships. Have you done that, Minister? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Um, uh, 
<laughs> Senator Sell, I'm, I'm not sure that you actually heard the answer to, my, to the first question, so I might just repeat that because it does actually answer your question. So again, can I just say that the, we did release the discussion paper uh, for the proposed changes to coastal trading framework for cargo vessels. And again, nothing in the paper is final, and the department order. will continue Senator, to work. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Stirl on a point of order. Mr. President, my point of order is relevance. There is no, the minister is going nowhere near the question I asked about inland rail. Um, I would urge you to bring it back uh, to the question. I'm, the supplementary question referred to the mayors of certain towns in New South Wales and investment in an inland rail project. Uh, that's the part of the question I heard. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. I'm not willing to say it's not directly relevant now because the minister is talking about um, the project from my understanding of the answer. Um, I'll let the minister continue, but I will, I'll let you remind her of that part of the question. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And I'm certain when I, I heard the question, uh, there was uh, what I found not to be relevant, as, as you did in terms of rail. But Senator Stirl did also talk about uh, maritime shipping, he which did. is what uh, I am he now addressing. Right. He did. Yes, sir. He did. So, as I had said, under any proposed reform, protections for Australian vessels will be maintained and foreign vessels will continue to need licences. Opening the coast, a strategic fleet or high well, Senate I'll take the interjection Order. from Senator Stirl. You obviously didn't Order. hear the first you know, the first time I went through through this for you. The options suggested in the discussion paper are focused on achieving administrative efficiencies within the current system. Order, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Oh, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll have another crack, shall we, Minister? Why was de former Deputy Prime Minister McCormack pursuing foreign flag coastal ships? And what is the position of the current Deputy Prime Minister, Joyce? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, Mr. President, I can go through a third time what we are doing on this policy for the benefit of Senator Stirl, but I think it was quite clear the government's position on this, and the government's position has not changed. Senator Scar. Mr. Order. Senator the, Scar. The backbench is asking the next question. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please advise the Senate? What the current status is of South East Queensland's bid for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics. The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President, and thank uh, Senator Scar for the question, Mr. President. South East Queensland's exciting bid for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics has received the bell for the final lap, and the finishing line is very much in sight, Mr. President. And Olympics has the potential to be a game changer for Queensland and the government remains committed to supporting Queensland's candidature. Bringing the Games to Australia in 2032 would provide a unique opportunity to motivate and inspire all Australians to get engaged and active in sport. The Australian government, the Queensland government, the Council of Mayors for South East Queensland and the Australian Olympic Committee have worked very cooperatively in developing a comprehensive bid submission to the IOC's Future Host Fund uh, Commission. This included a virtual tour of South East Queensland earlier last month. I'm thrilled to say that on the 10th of June, uh, Mr. President, the International Olympic Committee I, uh, Executive Board agreed to propose Brisbane as the host for the 2032 Games to the IOC membership. This is the final stage of candidature but it does not mean a Brisbane, that Brisbane has secured the, uh, secured the 2032 Games, Mr President. On the 20th and the 21st of July at the 138th IOC session held in Tokyo, IOC members will receive a final presentation on the proposed bid for the 2032 Games. Members will then vote on whether Brisbane is the host for the 2032 Games. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. How will the 2032 Games benefit South East Queensland and Australia? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, of course, the Olympics and Paralympics are an exciting major sporting event displaying the world's best athletes. There are, they are also, Mr. President, um, major social and economic benefits. An assessment by KPMG commissioned by the Queensland Government shows that the 2032 Games will deliver a total benefit of $8.1 billion 
for the Queensland for Queensland and $17.61 billion for Australia. The report found the 2032 Games will create 91,600 full-time equivalent job years for Queensland and 122,900 job years nationally. Mr. President. The report notes significant quantifiable social benefits derived from the 2032 Games including health community benefits order and senator colbeck senator scar a final supplementary question uh, thank you mr president how is the morrison joyce government supporting the 2032 games bid senator colbeck <laughs> thank, thank you mr president the morrison joyce government is strongly supporting the 2032 games bid mr president a national partnership agreement between the commonwealth and the Queensland Government has been signed, which provides up to $10 million to support the bid process. Mr. President. As part of the bid process, the Commonwealth has provided a number of guarantees in areas such as security, immigration and taxation that are vital Mr. President, to the successful operation of such a major international event. And the Prime Minister has committed to funding required for crucial games infrastructure, with funding to be provided on a 50-50 basis Mr. President, with the Queensland Government. These infrastructure investments will, of course, cater for the 32 bid uh, for the Games. But it's the long-term use of these facilities for local communities Mr. President, and sporting organisations that is at the forefront of our planning. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senators, could I make a brief statement before the at the end of conclusion of question time? The Speaker will also be making a similar statement to the House at the conclusion of their question time. As senators will be aware, the Australian Human Rights Commission is conducting an independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins. The review is open to all people who currently work or have previously worked in parliamentary workplaces around Australia. The review is in its form information gathering phase and it is critical that the review is informed by a wide range of perspectives and experiences of workplace culture, whether positive or negative. Everyone is encouraged to participate, no matter what your role is. Members and senators should encourage their staff to participate. Written submissions close on 31 July. Interviews are being conducted over the next five weeks, including in Canberra during the first sitting week in August. Correspondence has been sent to all MPs and Senators on how to participate and all current staff through the Department of Finance and other parliamentary departments. If you would like any further information or have any questions concerning this review, further information is available via the Australian Human Rights Commission and at their website at humanrights.gov.au. Thanks, Senators. Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, I seek leave to answer a question I took on notice from Senator Wong during question time. Leave. Senator, Ren yep, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, during question time, I took on notice a question from Senator Wong um, about the Deputy Prime Minister, and I now have a statement that was delivered by the Deputy Prime Minister during question time. And it reads, uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And with indulgence, shortly before question time, I was alerted that they may, I may have been in contact with a person who was a close contact with a case. I immediately sought further information and advice from Deputy Chief Medical Officer Professor Michael Kidd. As I am not a close contact, I am now able to attend the chamber. Thank you, Thank you. you. Senator Reynolds. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Gallagher and me. Well, as we stand here today, we have three states facing COVID outbreaks, community transmission of COVID. Just weeks ago, we had no community transmission of COVID in Australia. That was the good news supplied just weeks ago. But here today, as a result of outbreaks from hotel quarantine, hotel quarantine outbreaks are now leading to potential lockdowns in New South Wales, significant restrictions in place as we stand here in the Senate today. Three cases of community transmission reported this morning in Queensland and, of course, the uh, outbreak that we saw earlier in Victoria. 
Whose responsibility is quarantine? Well, under the Constitution, it is the federal government, the Morrison government. And yet here we are some 16 months into this pandemic, and we still do not have fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities in Australia. It is a shame. In New South Wales, we have 40 cases of community transmission. This is a highly contagious COVID variant. Uh, we have a significant, significant challenges going on in the people in New South Wales right now. From an airport driver who was unvaccinated, whose responsibility is vaccination supply? The federal government, the Morrison government. So these COVID outbreaks sit squarely at the feet of the Commonwealth government, the Morrison government failing to supply vaccines, failing to deliver fit-for-purpose quarantine. And let us remember what the Morrison government promised as their targets. They promised that all Australians would be fully vaccinated by October. That won't happen. They promised that 4 million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. That did not happen. They promised that all of 1A category would be vaccinated by Easter. That did not happen. And who is in 1A? Frontline healthcare workers, border and quarantine workers, people living and working in aged care and disability settings. They have not been vaccinated yet. And they promised, the Morrison government promised, that 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by the 10th of May. That did not happen. What has happened instead? We have now no targets, <laughs> no promises. We have horizons. We have horizons. And we don't just have one horizon. Oh, no, 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 no. The document that the Minister for Aged Care and the Minister representing the Minister for Health tried to keep secret but finally had to table. It has three horizons for each state and territory. I know, Senator Sheldon's chuckling because it is laughable, isn't it? Three horizons for each state and territory and three horizons for the national government. 27 horizons. Well, horizon, a horizon by definition is a thing you never meet. It's a thing you never get to. It's always out there ahead of you. We don't just have one horizon, we have 27 horizons in this uh, Morrison government supposed vaccine strategy, and we are not going to meet any of them, because you don't meet a horizon, you never get to it. I mean, come on. There's COVID vaccination allocation horizons. What did we hear from the minister today? We heard, we heard that only some 11,000 uh, workers in aged care in New South Wales have been fully vaccinated. That's about 10% of the aged care workers' population in New South Wales. 10%! We have a COVID outbreak going on in Sydney. And we have aged care workers, some 90% of them in New South Wales, not vaccinated. The Morrison government had two jobs. Fit for purpose quarantine, roll out a vaccine. They are failing at both, and they are leaving Australians behind. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I think Australians, what Australians expect from their government uh, during a global pandemic is that they keep them alive. That is what we are doing. That is what we are trying to do. That is what we are trying to make sure that Australians are kept safe and alive. That's what all our efforts are, are focused on. That's why we went through all the costs last year of closing our international borders, of, for a time, shutting down our economy. It was to keep Australians alive. And because the opposition has nothing to say on that matter, they are going for these, all these other issues. But it is important to come back to the fact that this year, this year, not a single Australian who here in Australia has died from coronavirus. Not a single person. Not a single person. Overseas, Overseas, more than 2 million people have died this year. 
from coronavirus. More than two million people. The equivalent of the whole town of Brisbane has unfortunately died from this global pandemic. It is a terrible, shocking and tragic thing that has happened to the world. But here in this country, with the cooperation of Australians, with the working together with state governments, Australians have been largely kept alive. We are very, very lucky. Now, the opposition would like to compare us to sort of Mars or something, where there's no risk. They'd like us to be like an outer planet, where there's no coronavirus and no absolute risk at all. Well, that world doesn't exist here. It doesn't. We have to accept risk. We have to get Australians back home, which the opposition was calling for last year. They wanted more to come home. We have to get them home. And when they come home from countries that have lots of coronavirus, there is risks. There is risks. Now, yes, there has been outbreaks from hotel quarantine, but that is to be expected in a risky environment. More than 99 per cent of people that have gone through hotel quarantine have not led to any community transmission because it's worked pretty well. It's worked pretty well. It's not perfect. Not perfect. It's, no system is perfect. And even if everybody was vaccinated, the vaccines, guess what? The vaccines is not perfect. You can still contract, you can still transmit uh, the coronavirus with the vaccine as well. So we want to make sure we get Australia vaccinated as fast as possible, but we were also right to be cautious with our vaccine rollout, as we have seen with the problems experienced by AstraZeneca. Because the opposition have not been mature about this issue. At every point, they have operated like a panicked child with every uh, bad news story that has come about. At the start of the year, they had the leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, wanting just to vaccinate people as soon as possible, even before our own health authorities had gone through the proper assessments of the vaccines. If we'd adopted those appro that approach, we probably would have ended up with more Australians dying from the AstraZeneca vaccine than we have. Two Australians have died linked to the AstraZeneca vaccine. More have died in Australia this year from the vaccine rollout than have from coronavirus spread. That's a tragic thing. Uh, they, again, the vaccine has risks. Life has risks. And we were right and proper to make sure we assessed those risks proportionally to the risks that we faced here from coronavirus and be cautious about that rollout. When there were issues with AstraZeneca first exposed a few months ago, I called for a pause so we'd look at it and hear it. Then I was pilloried by the opposition. They'd come in to Senate estimates and say what a crazy person that Senator Canavan is. Well, now we know there are real risks. There are real risks and we were right to look very closely at those risks. But again, the opposition, acting like a child, jumps up and down, panics, runs into the corner, uh, rather than dealing with the facts of life. When the facts of life is that there are risks. Our job as a sensible, mature adult government is to manage those risks as reasonably as we can to get them as lowest as we can. But they'll never disappear. They will never disappear. And we have to be up front with the Australian people about the risks we face in a world where there is a global pandemic, but on every score, on every measure. We have kept Australians safe. We have made sure that most Australians, many more Australians that are alive today uh, uh, than, than other countries have experienced over the past year. And that is a great success. Now, I'm confident with the cooperation we have seen from Australians over the last year, we will receive the same type of cooperation as we do get more vaccine doses, as the Pfizer doses come in and Moderna later this year. We will get those vaccination rates. We will get out of this. We will rebuild our country. We will come out of this safer and stronger than we were before. But we'll only do that if we stop panicking, stop being the panic merchants that the opposition constantly Thank do you, when Senator they enter this debate. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres. Last contribution says so much about what's wrong with the Morrison government. You've got a government that is run by an advertising executive and uh, Senator Canavan, who represents the most reasonable sounding of the maddest of the coalition backbench, is the voice in the back of their head. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a race, he says. Don't worry about it. Vaccines could be dangerous. Uh, that's what's wrong with this government. As we speak today, the situation, far from being a panic, the situation in New South Wales appears to be moving quickly and the government in New South Wales is working its way through its response. There are multiple locations, and it's fair to say 
that New South Wales is in a more perilous position than it has been for many, many months. Indeed, the New South Wales Parliament appears to have had a spread inside its own building. And I want to commend two MPs in that place who have displayed remarkable leadership. Uh, firstly, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Minns, immediately upon learning about this put the interests of the state before his own political interests and has postponed his budget reply speech. Now, Mr Minns has recently taken over the leadership of the New South Wales Labor Party and could reasonably have been expected that that opportunity to speak to the people of New South Wales would have been a significant milestone for him. But without question, he put the interests of people first before his own political interests. I also want to commend the Minister for Agriculture in New South Wales, Mr Marshall, uh, who, uh, who has uh, contracted the coronavirus himself and issued a very sensible uh, statement, and I wish him well, an important part of the process when political leaders contract the disease. But I tell you what, while I don't want to preempt any of the decisions of the New South Wales government, and they will have to make some difficult decisions in the days ahead, the Premier of New South Wales has been very clear this week about the problem. She has pointed the finger directly at the Morrison government. Now, Senator Canavan might think that the bungled vaccine rollout is not a problem, but Ms Berejiklian knows that the fact that just over 3 per cent of New South Wales residents are vaccinated, just over 3 per cent, that, that just over 3 per cent are fully vaccinated, that, that their levels of supply are nowhere near the level of demand that is required, and that New South Wales is a global laggard just like the rest of Australia, because Mr Morrison couldn't run a bath. He can't manage his way through this problem. When the country had the opportunity to seize this issue and actually approach a public health issue with the seriousness it deserved, he's entirely bungled the vaccine rollout. It couldn't be in a worse position than Mr Morrison's put Australia in. We are a hundredth in the queue. Other countries overseas with similar health systems, and even the Americans whose health system is in a very poor state, are in the high 30s and mid 40s in terms of the amount of their populations. And guess what? They'll be opening up. There'll be opportunities for their citizens. There'll be opportunities for their businesses because they've got the vaccine rollout right and Mr Morrison has bungled it for every Australian. Then we turn to hotel quarantine, absolutely criticised by anybody who knows anything about quarantine. What have we had? Dozens of outbreaks from hotel quarantine. Fifteen months, fifteen months to prepare for Mr Morrison to build purpose-built quarantine facilities across Australia. And what has Mr Morrison achieved? Precisely nothing. Precisely nothing. He has squandered the opportunity to fix vaccines, to fix quarantine, and he has left Australia in a vulnerable place where we are less safe, where growth will be held back, and Australia will be held back because of his failures, his incapacity to put the national interest ahead of his own narrow political interest. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I mean, like, seriously, I don't know where you guys live because it's certainly not in Australia with the rest of us. And I mean, it's just extraordinary this constant talking down that we see of Australia's efforts around the entire COVID pandemic. I mean, we know that you don't understand the basic economics of the pandemic and all the, the programs we put in place to ensure Australians were able to stay connected to their employers. We've now got less unemployment than we had pre-pandemic. And that was all at a time when over here these naysayers were all, oh, don't end JobKeeper, the economy's going to fall off a cliff. Guess what? Keeps getting better. And that's because of the leadership of the Morrison government with Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. 
Now, when we do come to the vaccine rollout, the 2020 hindsight vision displayed by those opposite is breathtaking. I mean, I am just so impressed at how you are all apparently lounge chair, uh, armchair epidemiologists with, who are experts and knew clearly before the actual experts what was going to happen with regards to the vaccines. In fact, last March, who would have thought we'd have had a vaccine by this stage? This has been the most incredible rollout and uh, efforts by science and research to ensure that we can move towards a vaccine at all. We have four vaccines in Australia lined up, and by the time we get to October, there will be two million doses per week of the Pfizer. Now, I had my first Pfizer jab in New South Wales because Gladys Berejiklian continues to demonstrate a gold standard in every single way. And I am not in the over 50 uh, category. I'd like that on the record. Maybe I should say it again, because I qualified for the Pfizer. And the Pfizer was for 40 to 49. You don't feel as smug about it anymore now it goes up to 59. But uh, back then in New South Wales, the 40 to 49 year olds were entitled to uh, qualify for the Pfizer, of which I've had the first jab, and I'm looking forward to my second jab next week. But that would just make me one of 140,000 Australians who have received a dose of the vaccine, because that's how many received it yesterday. And if today we see another 140,000 Australians receive a dose of vaccine, that will put us at seven million doses of vaccine that have been delivered. Now, we hear over there so much misinformation, and it is absolutely uh, so dangerous to be continuing to propagate these lies and deceit to the Australian people. It is creating more fear and uncertainty, and you should be ashamed. The reality is the vaccine is not available to under 16. So, when we talk about percentage of the population, let's remove the under 16s, shall we? And most states are only making it available to over 50s. So we need to remove everyone from 16 to 50, except you know, New South Wales and I think a couple of other places are allowing 40. But you know, South Australia, have a nice glass of water with it after you've had your vaccine. Not that anyone drinks water from South Australian taps, and I can say that as an old Adelaide girl. But uh, you, know, you have your vaccine, seven million doses. In the last seven days, we've had nearly 800,000 doses given. And like every other country in the world, vaccine rollouts have, have been you know, a, a growth period. They, they're a bit slow when they start out, but they pick up pace exponentially. In fact, to go between 4 million and 5 million doses, it took just nine days. And to go from 5 million to 6 million doses, it took 10 days, but that did include a public holiday. So, you know, maybe we can look at nine being the, the standard for the last two weeks for each million dose. But we don't want to talk about actual figures in reality, because that would mean those opposite need to acknowledge and accept that two-thirds of Australians for those of you not good at maths, because we know, you know what happens any time you guys get near the budget, two-thirds—66.6 per cent of all Australians over 70 are protected. Almost half, and in fact by today it looks like it will be half, of all Australians over 50 will be protected. Now, we also hear scare campaigns they haven't had their second dose. 80 per cent uh, protection at single dose. Stop your smear and your disinformation campaign you, and stop Senator scaring Hughes, Australians. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy, uh, De uh, Deputy President. Well, isn't this really interesting? You know, both Senator Canavan and Senator Hughes have the Monty Python defence. Always look on the bright side of life. Well, the reality of it is, and that is that the bright side of life is seeing the Australian community economically being crucified because the government has not got its act together. We've seen the lockdowns due to the quarantine failures in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. That's where responsibility should be taken for this government to say we're going to rectify. They should be coming in here to say how we're going to fix these problems, not how we're going to turn around and obfuscate 
turn around and avoid taking responsibility for what's been going on in this, in this country right, right now. Now, of course, you know, unless you've been living under a rock, everyone in Australia knows that the Morrison government has botched the vaccine rollout. We have one of the slowest vaccine rollouts of any developed country in the world. And of course, the Prime Minister says it's not a race, because it's a race we are losing because of his lack of, des of uh, desire to make sure we get the right outcomes. He seems to take time off sightseeing in Cornwall, enjoying the benefits of a country which has actually vaccinated their citizens. But then the story is very different when it comes to residents in my state of New South Wales. What Australians don't know is just how badly the Morrison and Berejiklian government have botched hotel quarantine in New South Wales. While the state government has introduced a hotel quarantine process for international arrivals, I have been informed by today by multiple whistleblowers working in the airport quarantine system that the quarantine process for crew from international passengers and freight is a sham. It's a complete and utter sham. This is what I have been told directly by three different whistleblowers working in this process. That buses, which are used to transport international rivals to hotel quarantine, are cleaned comprehensively by cleaners in full PPE and between every single trip. A tick for that. That is best practice. The Australian Defence Force have been brought in to load luggage into these buses in a COVID-safe manner. Actually, a tick for that. That's best practice as well. But for international crew on passenger or freight flights, none of these systems are in place. None. The vehicles used to transport crew from the airport to the hotel are not cleaned. They are not cleaned between trips. In actual fact, you can go out to the airport, Sydney Airport, and see there's a cone between the passenger buses and the international flight crew buses. One gets cleaned, the other doesn't. And until Friday last week, they also weren't wearing masks that were uh, those same people moving international crews. So if a crew member with COVID sits in one of these minivans, then every other crew member who sits in that vehicle for the rest of the day, including the driver, even for even days later, is stepping into a viral bomb. And the Australian Defence Force isn't used to load bags into these vehicles. The drivers are forced to do it themselves, without PPE, except maybe a face mask, only since last Friday. And as one of these drivers who are driving vehicles that are not cleaned, who have to touch all the luggage themselves, who has set off the cluster which is now spreading the, like wildfire across Sydney. And of course, it isn't the first time. The Northern Beaches cluster just before Christmas was also started by one of those drivers who have not got the processes in place. So this government is failing after failing after failing to protect economically New South Wales and the rest of this country. Now, has the federal government allowed two entirely different COVID safety procedures to be put in place at Sydney Airport? One for you know, big buses, maybe that's why they thought it was necessary, and, you know, but none for any other buses, but even they were still transporting international crew around and exposing Australian crews, the Australian community, because those same people, those drivers, once infected, as we've seen, in the New South Wales cluster, that people are infected right across the community. Now, the quarantine and transport hub at Sydney Airport needs to be fixed. It needs to be rectified. And we need to make sure that we turn around and have this whole this government is accountable for what it's doing about wrecking our economy, exposing our people to an epidemic. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson, yeah? Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, the question and answer um, uh, put forward by my colleague, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, earlier today. And that is in relation to the great threat that the Great Barrier Reef is under Sorry, due to— Sorry, Senator Hanson young who was the question to? Uh, it was to uh, the, Senator the Senator Hume representing the Environment Thank you. Minister. Um, 
It was in relation to a question uh, to the Environment Minister uh, through Senator Hume in relation to the uh, great threat to the Great Barrier Reef because of climate change. The UN body responsible for world heritage listing and managing and overseeing world heritage sites has been uh, very concerned with the health of the Great Barrier Reef. And earlier this week, declared that the Great Barrier Reef is under such stress, uh, such danger uh, from uh, climate change, that they want to list it as such. Now, this is one of the world's greatest reefs, one of the world's most precious environmental places, one of Australia's most precious spots. It is what is iconic around the world in relation to Australia. It is what the rest of the world thinks of when they think of the land down under. And it is under threat because of climate change and the mismanagement of our environment. Nemo is under threat because of Mr Barnaby Joyce, his obsession with coal and the fossil fuel industry, and of course, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. In fact, Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Barnaby Joyce, as the Deputy Prime Minister, are killing Nemo on the Great Barrier Reef. That's what's going on here. And the world is watching, and they are horrified. And they know that Australia has understood that this threat has been there for a long time. But of course, when the UN uh, made this uh, declaration earlier this week, we heard from the, the government here and the Environment Minister herself, uh, Susan Lay, that they were blindsided. Well, what absolute rubbish. If you're blindsided, despite all of the warnings from the scientists, despite all of the work that's been going on, despite all of the warning signs, all of the conversations, all of the money that has been spent by this government, then you're either incompetent or you're trying to pull the wool over the eyes of not just the Australian people but the rest of the world. Now, Australia should be ashamed that our government has let the Great Barrier Reef deteriorate to this level, bleaching event after bleaching event. And still, on the international stage, we have Australia's Prime Minister arguing for less action on climate change. We have our Resources Minister promoting selling more fossil fuels overseas. We have ministers in this place pretending that the science of climate change can just be ignored. No one at UNESCO and not many Australians were shocked or blindsided by the decision and the announcement that the Great Barrier Reef is under great threat from climate change. Year eight students at, uh, in South Australia know that the climate is killing our reef. Scientists have been warning the Australian government that this would happen. In this very place, the Greens have been warning the government that we needed to act faster. It is just absolute rubbish for the minister to suggest that she was blindsided. She was either willfully blind or she's incompetent. Make no mistake, as we head to the election either at the end of this year or into next year, Australians will remember that this is the government that has killed Nemo, that has funnelled more money to the fossil fuel industry and that is overseeing the death of the Great Barrier Reef. And while the rest of the world is crying out for more ambition to tackle climate change and to reduce pollution, we have our Deputy Prime Minister side by side with the Prime Minister of Australia taking money from fossil fuel companies and wanting to pollute more, more, more. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So the question is that the motion has moved by Senator Hanson Young to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.
So we'll now move to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Um, we've got two of you jumping up there. Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy <coughs> President. Uh, I present government responses to the following committee reports as listed on the dynamic red. The Economics References Committee inquiry into Australia's dairy industry and the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee's inquiry into the ability of Australian law enforcement authorities to eliminate gun-related violence in the community. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And Senator Davey, were you seeking the call? Uh, I present additional information received by committees relating to estimates. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I present to the Senate uh, the first interim report of the Select Committee on Job Security concerning on demand platform work in Australia, and I move that the Senate take note of that report. Which I was planning to speak to. Yep. Yeah. Continue. Good, thanks. Thank you. Um, now, this first interim report of the Senate Select Committee on Job Security and the context which the inquiry was taking place is important. Australian workers have suffered through record low wage growth under this government over the last eight years. The Australian middle class is shrinking in this country under this government's watch. The government forecasted in the recent federal budget that real wages will decline over the next four years. The Reserve Bank has warned that stagnant wages are a risk for our economic recovery. And it's clear, even before the pandemic, that there is something structurally wrong in our economy when wages have stopped growing. This is where the inquiry into job security comes in. The first interim report is the first ever report by this parliament focused specifically on the impact of gig platforms on the Australian economy and Australian jobs. Next year will mark the first and 10th anniversary of Uber's launch in Australia. Uber now claims to be the second largest employer in Australia, with 120,000 workers across rideshare and the food industry. And not a single one of these 120,000 drivers and delivery riders the front line during the pandemic are classified as employees or have rights as contractors. Entrepreneurs who are each, described as entrepreneurs, each running their own individual small business by Uber. Now, of course, I think that sounds absurd. It's absolutely absurd. When one brave Uber Eats worker, Amita Gupta, questioned this logic in the federal court, Justice White said, and I quote, I'm just wondering whether, whether we're operating in the real world. As the Transport Workers Union revealed at one of our hearings earlier this month, Uber was so scared about the outcome of that case and the precedent it would set, to their, send, set for their operators and their operations that they agreed to settle Ms. Gupta's, Gupta's case for $400,000. When the amount she stood to gain, if she won, was just $15,000 as a maximum. Uber settled at more than 25 times the amount that Ms Gupta was asking for, to ensure that their workers would not be classified as employees. This model, of course, is not unique to Uber. It is the business model for the majority of platforms we hear from. And why? Well, because under this existing industrial relations framework, if you're an employee, you, get, you are entitled to annual leave, sick leave, superannuation, protections from unfair dismissal, workers' compensation and the minimum wage. But if you're an independent contractor, as these companies deem them to be, you're entitled to none of these rights. Companies like Uber and Amazon have made a lot of money avoiding those rights. Now, the inquiry has received evidence from numerous witnesses that the average hourly wage for delivery riders is a disgrace. According to the Transport Workers Union, the average pay for food delivery workers is just $10.42 an hour. 
and as little as $6.67 an hour. The dissenting report by the coalition senators in this committee have contested this figure as politically motivated. But in addition to the Transport Workers Union data, a submission by academics from the University of Sydney, University of Western Australia and Edith Cohen University put the average wage rate at just $12 an hour. Other evidence received by the Centre for Future of Work and separately by the Young Workers Centre makes similar assertions. The only data supporting the claim by Uber and the Uber and the dissenting report comes from Uber themselves. Uber says in its own report of itself that it's paying minimum wage under certain circumstances, not all. In actual fact, when they were cross-examined under in the inquiry, they obviously they very clearly admitted that the rate they were paying did not include that they said was above the minimum wage, did not include superannuation, of course, did not include workers' compensation, did not include other entitlements that we take for granted in um, the Australian community. And of course, I asked Uber if their riders earn outside of peak times, and they refused to respond because they just calculated their underpayment during peak times. They couldn't even get it right. They obviously don't know what the minimum wage is, and even their own evidence, let alone from their experts, obviously don't know what the minimum wage is. Now, companies like Uber and Amazon despise transparency, which brings me to the first group of recommendations in this interim report, which are that the ABS and appropriate regulators begin collecting data on and from gig platforms. And we need their data, or we'll continue to be feared lies and half-truths like Uber has done just here. The next set of recommendations in this report concerns safety and workers' compensation. If you're getting paid just $6 an hour, then you need to rush and take risks on the road. In just a few months, at the end of last year, five delivery riders' lives were taken working for these platforms. Didi Frede, Chao Kai Shen, Xi Shen, BJ Paul, and Ai Wong. And because Safe Work does not properly collect data on gig worker injuries and fatalities, there could be more deaths than ever, never, has never been revealed. There may be people in this country who have gone to work and never come home, and don't, we don't even know about it. That's an absolute disgrace. And recommendation three calls for Safe Work to be empowered to finally collect this data after 10 years. And who knows how many injuries and deaths? It's also a disgrace that the families of these five riders have been denied access to workers' compensation because they are independent contractors, as deemed by their employer. Recommendation six of this report calls for the system to be changed to ensure any platform worker, regardless of their status, receives the basic rights. But we should also not stop there, because in recommendation seven of this report, calls for changes to the Fair Work Act to ensure that workers who fall outside the current definition of employee are not left without basic rights and protections. Recommendation 9, 10 and 11 deal with giving the Fair Work Commission and a new low-cost tribunal. The ability to resolve disputes involving vulnerable workers, like gig workers, against these powerful multinational platforms in an affordable, accessible and fair way is critical. And, of course, speaking of vulnerable and vulnerable people, the most outrageous evidence the committee has received. In the creeping infiltration of our publicly funded, highly feminised care sectors, the NDIS and aged care, big gig platforms like Mabel and Care Seekers, like Uber, that their work say that their workers are classified as independent contractors. Like Uber, these workers are paid below the minimum wage. This is about caring for our most vulnerable Australians, the elderly and the disabled. These are the people that are doing that caring, and how do we treat them? Under this government's watch. And of course, the government has said consistently that it's too complicated to give these workers minimum rights and minimum conditions. Now, the Morrison government gave $5 million to Mabel to provide surge workforce and Anglicare aged care home near Penrith last year. 
Anglicare told the Royal Commission, and I quote, it quickly became apparent that the staff at Mabel could provide, uh, could provide but did not have the skills and the qualifications that were needed. Seventeen res residents died in that home of COVID-19. What this government is paying for is paying gig platforms to rip off workers and deliver inadequate care. And it gets worse. And I thank the Australian Services Union for raising the issue of this inquiry, because Mabel and other platforms classify these NDIS carers as independent contractors. They may not be liable for safety under our workplace health and safety laws. The government is allowing these platforms to offload legal liability to safety to our most vulnerable Australians, the disabled. Neither Safe Work Australia nor the NDIS Quality and Safety Commission confirm whether disability, disabled Australians are legally liable here. It is a horrifying and it's a ticking time bomb. And there are a number of recommendations in this report dealing specifically with reckless spread of gig platforms into our national treasure, the NDIS. This is just the first interim Thank report. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy uh, President. I seek leave to take note of the committee report number two on page 13, which is a report on the um, impact— Sorry, Senator Faruqi, hmm? we're not there yet, so okay. I'll call the government whip. Uh, Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on Aged Care Legislation Amendment Financial Transparency Bill 2020, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings, additional information and submissions. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, Senator Patterson, I present oh, this word again, a corrigendum to the corrigendum to the report of the committee on its review of the relisting of Hezbollah's external security organisation as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I present the report of the Committee on the Future Conduct of Elections Operating During Times of Emergency Situations. Uh, and on behalf of, of the Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, I present an interim report on its inquiry into certain aspects of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Annual Report 2019-20 to relating to Australia's response to the coup in Myanmar, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present the 8th Human Rights Scrutiny Report of 2021. Thank you. And you was, uh, had a motion there on um, the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs. You moved. So the question is, uh, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting um, President. I wish to take note of the interim report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade into Australia's response to the coup in Myanmar. Um, in contrast to the sadly underwhelming response from the Australian government in terms of Myanmar, this report, which was a consensus report, cross-party report, provides a strong set of recommendations that the Australian Greens support. And I encourage people to read the report, but let me just touch on a few key recommendations. Recommendation two recommends that the Australian government should formally engage with groups and individuals representing the legitimately elected representatives of Myanmar, including the CRPH and the National Unity Government. And we think it's disappointing that to date that this hasn't occurred. Before the election took place, the Australian government joined a number of other countries in calling for democratic norms in Myanmar to be respected. Well, it turns out that it's actually easy to issue statements before elections, but when it comes to actually meeting with the actual people who are elected through that democratic process, the, the Australian government have been much more reticent. We support that recommendation and call on the Australian government to meet with their counterparts in the national unity government, including at ministerial level. Recommendation five of this report 
um, states that recommends that the Australian government should explore pathways to permanent residency for Myanmar nationals in Australia, given the uncertain situation they face in Myanmar. Again, we completely support that recommendation. It's something that we've called for previously. I wrote in March to the Foreign Minister calling for people from Myanmar who are in Australia to be offered protection. And then I want to particularly talk about recommendation six, which is about the need for targeted sanctions. And we, us Greens made additional comments which go to that point. The committee's recommendation, which we do support, states that the, recommends that the Australian government further consider imposing targeted sanctions upon additional senior figures in the Tatmadaw and Tatmadaw-linked entities, including the MEC and the MEHL, who have played a role in the overthrow of democracy and subsequent violent repression of protests. It's a tragedy that while people in Myanmar have called for action, and countries around the world have responded, we have seen no action from the Australian government. We've also called publicly for a Magnitsky framework, and that's another area where the government has been dragging its feet. And just last night, we saw reporting in the, Fef in the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald throwing public servants under the bus because the ministers have failed to act on the recommendation for Magnitsky legislation. We know from Senate estimates that the Foreign Minister has written to the Prime Minister, but as of last estimates, the Prime Minister hasn't responded. So, I mean, the political spinners in the ministerial wing can blame the public service as much as they want, but the reality is, in the Westminster system, the ministers are responsible. So the Prime Minister should get on and answer that letter so that we can get on with it and join a number of other countries in creating a framework for targeted sanctions against human rights abusers. But when it comes to Myanmar, actually we know that there is the capacity to introduce sanctions without a Magnitsky framework. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade have told us that. And in fact, we already have sanctions against five Tatmadaw um, people in Myanmar and because of their violent repression and persecution of the Rohingya some years back. So we need to sanction more of those Tatmadaw military leaders urgently, including the leader of the junta, Minong Hlaing. So a Magnitsky framework would be a clear improvement, but instead we've seen nothing but equivocation on the ability to impose sanctions now. So this isn't about a framework delaying things, it's about a deliberate decision being made by the Foreign Minister not to impose targeted sanctions on people who have violated human rights and been sanctioned by a number of other countries, including the UK, the EU, the US and Canada. And as we have noted in our additional comments, people on the ground in Myanmar are calling for sanctions. There was a letter that was sent from almost 400 civil society organisations in Myanmar to our foreign minister calling for sanctions. They said that Australia is lagging behind other Western governments in its response to the Myanmar coup, that Australia must use its middle power status and leadership role in the region to call for strong action against the military regime. And they provide a number of recommendations in that letter, and among them they say that, in particular, the Australian government must enact sanctions against the military, its leaders and its business interests and business partners. This must include military conglomerates, MEC and MEHL, and the National Oil and Gas Company, MOGE. So people on the ground are calling for sanctions, and countries around the world have acted, but Australia has yet to act. And as we highlighted in our additional comments, the Australian Council for International Development has pointed out this discrepancy, that Australia is out of step with international efforts to end the violent coup in Myanmar. Together, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and the European Union have imposed sanctions on a total of 38 individuals and 17 entities associated with the junta. Since Myanmar's military seized power from the democratically elected government on 1 February this year, the Australian government has imposed no new sanctions on military leaders or their business interests. And I want to particularly point out that two of Australia's former ambassadors to Myanmar have pointed out the value of imposing sanctions. Former Ambassador Nicholas Capel wrote in The Australian that the people of Myanmar are looking to the international community for support, especially from liberal democracies like Australia. It gives them hope and encouragement to sustain their struggle. 
And while our neighbours in Asia will not join the chorus, they will not be surprised that we speak out, as they have seen us do on many other international issues, and it will give more leverage to the less confrontational style of ASEAN. That we need to weigh the softly, softly approach with its very remote possibility of influencing the senior general today against the real possibility of damaging Australia's reputation and ability to influence a future democratic government. And similarly, former Australian Ambassador Christopher Lamb said, carefully targeted sanctions can be useful and should be part of our package. So again, I reiterate this afternoon for the Australian government to urgently impose targeted sanctions. Now, I would add that the reasoning by the department and the foreign minister as to why we haven't imposed sanctions so far has been unclear and equivocating at best. I mean, the simple reality is that the Australians deserve better, the people of Myanmar deserve better, and the many people around the world who are campaigning for justice for the Myanmar people on this issue deserve better. And today, in fact, I have lodged a notice of motion for another order for the production of documents requiring a Magnitsky report, and beyond that I will be exploring procedural options to require a statement from the minister on sanctions against the Tatmadaw's key generals who have led this coup. So the report that I am responding to today I think is a very important report. As I said, it covers the full spectrum of this parliament. On the issue of sanctions, it calls on the government to further consider the issue of sanctions. I reiterate the call that Australia needs to be urgently imposing sanctions on the key personnel in the junta in Myanmar. So to those protesting in Myanmar and those supporting their struggle for justice around the world, I say again, we see you, we hear you, and we will do your best, do our best to amplify your message in this parliament. Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'd also like to just make some brief comments, if I can, in regards to the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade's interim report regards Australia's response to the coup in Myanmar. And while not a member of the committee, I do want to congratulate the committee. I have uh, read uh, avidly uh, the transcripts of the hearings that have been conducted, and I do think it's a very, very worthwhile exercise by the committee to explore these particular points. I am someone who is not yet satisfied by Australia's response to the military coup in Myanmar. I want to congratulate the Burmese diaspora in our country, which has a very, very rich history. Many have come to our country in the 1960s. Many have come to our country in more recent times as part of the humanitarian program. I congratulate them on their strong and consistent advocacy, certainly in Perth, but around the country in drawing other Australians' attentions to the very, very important issues in regards to the coup in Myanmar. What is critical for Australia is that if it has strong words to say about democracy in our region, about the importance of the rule of law, then responding to the coup in Myanmar is a very easy and immediate way to demonstrate those values and to put those values in action. Two points have concerned me, and I've prosecuted these politely at Senate Estimates, but two points have concerned me. One is the reticence of officials not to publish details of their engagement with the National Unity Government. In my discussions with senior representatives of the National Unity Government, they have been very willing to have that information disclosed. And I agree that disclosure of meetings or consent of disclosure of meetings between officials and the National Unity Government representatives allows, prepares, is a precursor for official engagement. The other thing that I've been concerned about is I'm not yet convinced that the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has been engaging thoroughly enough with the Burmese diaspora. On that point, I'm still prepared for a period to give them the benefit of the doubt. But if Australia's foreign policy is to enjoy the endorsement and the consent of Australian people, then it's necessary for the department to actively engage with groups of people who have their heritage in those countries. And in this particular case, I think it's very important that 
the department actively engage with members of the Burmese diaspora. I think the view of the Australian people is very, very clear when it comes to the matter of the military coup in Myanmar. They are comfortable. They would like Australia to carefully consider the imposition of sanctions. In fact, I think time is quickly running out and the imposition of carefully considered sanctions in regards to Myanmar and the military coup must be now the highest priority. I absolutely agree that our officials should be working in concert with our neighbours on these issues for a period, for a period and not indefinitely. So I would just also like to echo amplify the comments of former Ambassador Nicholas Koppel, who I had the pleasure of meeting many times uh, on my travels to Myanmar. He is informed. He is a considered person. And I think his contribution in the Australian newspaper by, by way of an opinion piece was very, very well received in this country. And in fact, members of the Burmese people in our country, Burmese community in our country, they think that this matter is so critical to them, is so important to them, that clear and decisive action is very, very important. I've listened to the contributions of others in this chamber. I've read avidly the Hansard uh, record of this particular committee inquiry thus far. I've prosecuted the case at Senate Estimates. Members of the Burmese community, particularly in Perth but around the country, can be very, very reassured, very, very reassured that this is a matter very close to my heart. It is one that I will be pursuing and I expect to have much more to say in coming weeks and the month. Thank you. I'm going to put the motion in that case. The question is the motion to take note of the report be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. Is leave granted? Um, I'll give. Is leave granted? <laughs> leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I move the motion as circulated uh, and ask that the question be put. The question is that the question be put. I have to put that question without debate. Senator Waters. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is moved by Senator Birmingham that the question be put on the motion he has moved. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Davey Teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 39, noes 11. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Davy Teller for the ayes, Senator Seawitt Teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 39, noes 11. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham, can you please move the motion? Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion as circulated. Question. I've already done that, though. Oh, sir. That was what we just voted on, Senator. No, uh, Mr. President, wasn't it? We did the motion be put, then we allowed the motion to be moved. Are we now doing the motion itself? Oh, yes, leave was granted. Normally it's not. I missed that stage. Thank you. Um, we didn't have the multiple. So I'll call the. So we'll continue with consideration of documents because this kicks in at 4:30. So we were we had dealt with the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade report. Um, we've got other documents, either the PJCIS report or the consideration of documents on pages 12 and 13. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Um, in relation to documents on page 12 and shall I do 12 and 13 or just 12 at this stage? Uh, I'm happy to do both. You can do both. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I take note of documents 1, 2 and 4 on page 12 and seek leave to continue my remarks. And I also take note of documents 5, 6, 9 on page 13 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator C is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Seward. I seek leave to take note of documents one oh, we've already done one of three, eight and twelve on pages twelve and thirteen. Do you seek leave to continue your remarks? Leave to continue my remarks. Sorry. Thank you, Senator Seward. Uh, is there Senator Urquhart, do you have oh, I have some committee reports and government responses? I think why don't we, uh, we move on? Are there any is there, any other senator wish to take note of any other document on pages 12 to 13 before we move on to uh, committee reports? No. Okay, so that we will now proceed to the consideration of committee reports, government responses and the Auditor General's report, which are listed on par uh, pages 13 to 15 of the notice paper. Senator Rukert. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I take note of document 12 on page 13 and seek leave to continue my remarks. On page 14, I take note of documents 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 11 and 12 and seek leave to continue my remarks. And on page um, under the Auditor General's reports um, on page 14, I take note of document 1 and seek leave to continue my remarks. And on page 15, I uh, take note of document 2 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Rukit. Senator Faruqi. Thank you. I seek leave to take note of the committee report Sorry. 2 on page 13. Senator Faruqi, uh, leave is granted. She doesn't. Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Uh, Madam Deputy President, this is a report on the inquiry on the impact of seismic testing on fisheries and the marine environment. The inquiry established by the Greens looked into the impact of seismic testing on fisheries and the marine environment, with, with particular reference to the body of science and research into the use of seismic testing, the regulation of seismic testing in both Commonwealth and state waters, and the approach taken to seismic, seismic testing internationally. I acknowledge the work and the passion of my Greens colleague, Senator Peter Wish Wilson, who chaired the inquiry, and like me, cares deeply about our precious marine environment and the protection of our oceans. Many submissions and witnesses shared their concerns about the ongoing risks of oil and gas exploration in our oceans. And I want to acknowledge the submissions made to the inquiry and thank everyone for their contribution and their strong voices to protect our oceans and marine environment from harm. In particular, I want to acknowledge Save Our Coast, whose founder, Natasha Dean, I work with very closely in fighting oil and gas exploration off the coast of New South Wales, and also the Surf Rider Foundation. It's because of the effort of people like Natasha and the community that PEP 11 is basically dead in the water. The inquiry made it clear that the community does not want seismic testing. 
The hearings showed big oil and gas are on one side of the debate on seismic testing, while multi-generational fishing families and communities who live by our beautiful and precious coastline are firmly on the other side. The inquiry heard from many in these communities who do not want our oceans turned into gas and oil fields. In addition to the intrinsic value and beauty of our coasts and marine life, recreation and local fishing industries rely on healthy oceans. The rock lobster, oyster, scallop and bluefin tuna industries have all expressed grave concerns about the impacts of seismic testing. Yet the federal government has refused to act decisively to rule it out. Not only will the oil and gas exploration of the coast damage our environment, if these projects actually go ahead, the drilling and burning of fossil fuels will accelerate the climate emergency we are already in. But we do know that the liberals and nationals, and the nationals especially under the helm of the resurrected leader, Barnaby Joyce, only care about their mates in the fossil fuel lobby, not the community, not the environment. We know big oil and gas have deliberately not funded research on the effects of seismic testing on our oceans and marine environments because they know the results would be damaging. They have been operating in the dark with no science to back their false claims and seismic testing, um, that seismic testing does not cause harm to our marine animals. We know that it does. We know from recent reports that rock lobster populations are being impacted by seismic testing in the Bass Strait. The report rightly makes several recommendations that significant funding should be directed towards additional research to study the short-term, long-term, and cumulative impacts of seismic testing on marine animals and the marine environment. It would be extraordinary for the government to continue handing out permits for seismic testing before more is known. In my home state of New South Wales, communities along the coast are rightly up in arms at the prospect of their beloved oceans and coastline being damaged. They are strongly opposing plans to locate and extract fossil fuel from Port Stephens all along our magnificent coastline to Wollongong. Like the many communities who have put up fierce opposition to drilling in the Great Australian Bight, they have come together to protect our precious environment and push for a sustainable futures. Our oceans and all who thrive by their shores depend on this. At the very least, the risks of irreversible damage posed by seismic testing demand a precautionary approach. It's vital that we stop this destructive offshore blasting. The report recommends that the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources improve the current public consultation process to include all relevant stakeholders and implement mechanisms to enable greater consideration. In total, the report has made 19 expansive recommendations. And in addition to these excellent recommendations, the Australian Greens have suggested another recommendation. The Greens recommend that the Australian Government amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 to allow for a ban on the issuance of any new permits for offshore seismic testing, oil and gas exploration. And I hope that the Government is listening to people who want to protect our oceans, to save our marine life, to protect our environment and to act on the climate crisis. Thank you, uh, Senator Faruqi. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I'd like to take note of um, Auditor General report, uh, which is document number three on page 15. Um, the actual audit report number is 45, uh, Management of Commonwealth Fisheries, Australian Fisheries Management uh, Authority. Back in 2012-2013, uh, senators in the chamber today who, who, who were here would remember we had I think the mother of all fights against two large industrial super trawlers uh, that were brought in by the Liberal Party to uh, plunder Australia's waters. Uh, these same trawlers had been dogged by controversy throughout uh, their, their journeys around, uh, especially West Africa and other countries, uh, depleting the oceans of fisheries. And, um, we ended up banning those super trawlers, which I think was a fantastic outcome. And the Labor government at the time, in 2012, under the ex-fisheries minister, Mr Joe Ludwig, uh, implemented uh, a review of the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. That review was called the Borthwick Review. And one of the key findings of the Borthwick Review was that AFMA, uh, as the authority that manages fisheries in this country, needed to put much more weighting on ecological risk assessments uh, in its overall framework of fisheries management. And what this basically mean was 
meant was they needed to consider the environmental implications of fishing activities. Now that makes sense because if we don't have a healthy ocean, of course our fisheries aren't going to be healthy. So the two things go hand in glove. Unfortunately, I was very disappointed to read this Auditor General's report before us today saying exactly the same thing. Um, the Borthwick Review made a number of very clear recommendations of even the legislative changes we needed to make to our fisheries management framework. Yet here today, uh, and I'm just referring to the executive summary uh, in this report, um, it's clearly said um, it is unclear whether AFMA's ecological risk framework is appropriate. AFMA has documented its ecological risk management framework in the 2000, 2017 Guide to AFMA's Ecological Risk Management. AFMA has not met its requirements to reassess ecological risk uh, every five years. A plan to implement, to implement fishery management strategies which incorporate ecological risk management and are subject to a five-year review period has not been implemented. Now, AFMA agreed with this. AFMA agreed that it had not met uh, any, any of its own objective in relation to assessing the ecological risk of its management framework, uh, and um, they have uh, agreed to do more work in this. So um, it's certainly something that um, the Greens will be keeping a very close eye on. Uh, there are a number of other recommendations in here. Um, there's obviously some ticks of approval for AFMA in certain areas, but I was also very interested in terms of some of the economic uh, objectives that AFMA have set itself that haven't been met. For example, plans and strategies have not been reviewed in accordance with the relevant Commonwealth legislation and policy. Stakeholder engagement with recreational and Indigenous fishing stakeholders has been limited, which is very disappointing because the recreational fishing sector was one of the sectors that drove uh, the need to have better consultation and have their considerations taken into account in commercial fisheries as well. And it says AFMA seeks to meet the requirement to maximise net economic returns by pursuing maximum economic yield for individual fisheries. Mechanisms to maximise economic yield are not mature and progress towards establishing maximum economic yield targets for individual fisheries has been low. Now, I just want to finish on this note. Um, I'm pleased to say and to remind the, the Chamber and Senators that the Greens initiated a Senate inquiry recently through Rural and Regional Affairs to actually review after 30 years uh, the quota management system in this country. So the quota management system was brought in in the 1990s. We've had extensive feedback from commercial fishing stakeholders around the country, especially for smaller struggling fisheries operators in places like uh, King Island off Tasmania uh, and other, other uh, states around the country, that this fisheries management approach is not fit for purpose any longer 30 years later. It needs a thorough review. Interestingly enough, the submissions the committee have had have included a, 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 you know, a large range of economists, scientists, experts, all saying it's high time that this was reviewed. So this goes hand in glove with some of the recommendations in uh, this report from the Auditor General. Uh, and while it might be a little bit wonky to some, if we don't get fisheries management right in this country, um, then we're never going to have healthy oceans. We're never going to be able to sustain uh, the, fishing, the fishing industry, the fishing operators all around, all around this country. Uh, I have got to know some of these fishermen very well over the years, for example, working with them recently uh, on seismic testing, uh, which my colleague Senator Faruqi recently uh, just, just then gave a, uh, an excellent uh, five-minute speech on. Uh, the fishing industry is very concerned about these kind of activities. And as I've got to know them, uh, I've got to understand that you know, many of them actually do see themselves as the custodians of some of their fisheries. They admit that a lot of their practices over the years, uh, in previous years going back you know, many generations, have been archaic. But let me tell you, they know that the ocean is changing. They totally understand that their livelihoods are at stake if we don't change the way we operate, not just in our fisheries, but if we don't tackle climate change in the climate emergency we find ourselves in. Um, Charles Darwin when he was on the voyage of the Beagle, was, had this love affair with giant kelp. And he wrote extensively about giant kelp. And I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he warned uh, in his writings that if we were ever to lose giant kelp, we would lose more biodiversity than in the, the richest terrestrial rainforests that he encountered in Equatorial Guinea uh, and up in Papua New Guinea and the Philippines and other places. Sadly, Tasmania has lost its giant kelp forests. Those habitats and ecosystems that were so important to fisheries have largely vanished from the east coast of Tasmania. Seagrasses around the nation 
are under pressure and are vanishing. Uh, mangroves, thousands of kilometres of mangrove habitat has died back and vanished with warming oceans. And of course, we've had some debate in this chamber today and in, during this week about the sad, tragic decline of the Great Barrier Reef. So, fishermen and fishers, so I should say fishers, right around the country know what's going on in the ocean. They are aware of this. They would like to see climate action. They understand uh, that governments play a critical role in regulating their industry, in stepping in and taking climate action, doing what, doing what is necessary to ensure that we've all got a healthy ocean, doing what is necessary to ensure the future uh, of their intergenerational uh, families that have been in the fishing industry for many years. So um, I think this audit general report is welcome. Uh, it certainly uh, complements the work that we're about to do in the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee, and I look forward to uh, seeing some significant reform in fisheries management in this country. Order. The question is the motion to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators, the time allotted for debate on the bills has expired in accordance with the resolution just agreed to. I will now put the questions on their remaining stages. I will first deal with requests for amendments circulated by the Australian Greens to the COVID-19 Disaster Payment Funding Arrangements Bill 2021. Is it the wish of the Senate that the statements accompanying the requests circulated for this bill be incorporated in Hansard? If leave is granted, it is so ordered. The question is now that the requests for amendment on sheet 1327 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the requests for amendment on sheet 1327 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawatt tell of the ayes and Senator McCarthy tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 34. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for an act to make provision in relation to COVID-19 disaster payments and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Treasury Laws Amendment, COVID-19 Economic Response Bill 2021. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production Orders Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill will now be read a first time and I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, International Production Orders Bill 2020. Minister. I will now call, oh, I'll now call the minister. Um, I, move <laughs> <laughs> I move that the bill now be read a second time. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, International Production Orders Bill 2020. I now deal with the second. Oh, sorry. I, no, my apologies. This is an error on my part. I did. I'm going to have to ask for that to be recommitted because I read an amendment here. For the, not. An, it's actually a second reading amendment from the Greens. So, with the leave of the chamber, I will go back a step and recommit this. My apologies. Um, I will deal with the second reading amendment first, moved by the Australian Greens. The question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1318 circulated by the Greens be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment on sheet 1318 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint. I would normally appoint the. I'll appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the eyes, and Senator McCarthy teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 32. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to have a remarks by Senator Keneally incorporated into Hansard on this is leave, bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I checked. I now put the question on the second reading of the bill. The question is the bill be read a second. Sorry, Senator Waters. On behalf of Senator Thorpe, um, permission to table her second reading speech on this bill also. Leave granted. Leave is granted. The question now is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 32, noes 13. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Oh, sorry, the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979 and for other purposes. The question is the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the remaining stages the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith tell off the ayes and Senator Seawitt tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 13. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979 and for other purposes. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Hazard Waste Regulation of Exports and Imports Amendment Bill 2021 for concurrence. Call the minister. Senator I move that this bill now be read a first time. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Hazardous Waste Regulation of Exports and Imports Act 1989. And for... Question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll now move on to the other items. I'll call the clerk and then we'll move on to the other items. A uh, bill for an act to amend the Hazardous Waste Regulation of Exports and Imports Act 1989 and for related purposes. I call the Minister. I'm waiting on a. Do I, what do you want me to say?
What am I moving? Thank you to the clerk. Um, I've received a message from the House regarding the House uh, Water Legislation Amendment Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021, reporting that the House disagree with the amendments. And I call and this motion requires me to put the motion, I think, Clark, that says the question uh, be proposed from the chair and be put immediately. So I put the motion that the Senate not insist on its amendments on the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. That is to be put immediately. I'll report, sorry, just put, the, report, the amendments the House has disagreed to are the House has agreed to amendments number two and three made by the Senate and disagreed to amendments number one and four made by the Senate. The question now is that the Senate not insist on its amendments. Senator Roberts, I have to put this without debate. It doesn't say that. It says here, can I, I'll, I'll, paragraph D of the motion moved says the question not insist on its amendments be proposed from the chair and put immediately. Immediately. Um, I'm going to I've spoke uh, before I call senators. I will give senator. I will give senators the call. If you will be quiet, I will give you the call when you seek it. But I'll make the ruling that I'm going to adopt the the, the put immediately means immediately. Uh, I, I, I have, there is no other way to read that phrase. Sa thank you, Senator McKim. You raise a point of order. I, I do, Chair. The terms of this motion are very clear. The question should be put immediately. It does not say the words without debate. So you put the question, then the Senate can debate it. That is the only reasonable way to interpret this motion. And the reason that the government has not put those words in is because they did it in such an unholy thank you, rush Senator that they McKim. had stuffed Senator it up. Senator McKim. Again. Um, the, on the point of order, Senator Birmingham. Um, well, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, if it would assist the Senate, um, I move the question be put immediately um, and order. without debate. Thank you. I'm, I'm, going, to make, I'm going to make the ruling. You, I've got to, if you wish to dissent in it, you can. The clerk has agreed with me. Put immediately means put immediately. There's no other way to construct that term. Um, I am putting the question because when we, mo when we move procedural motions, it is that the question be put. So they are the same words. Um, it means it be put to the Senate immediately. If it didn't have that word immediately there, then there would be an opportunity for debate. So I'm going to put that. The question is that the Senate not insist on its amendments, which are amendments um, one and four the House has not agreed to, on the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. Senator Roberts. Statement. Is leave granted to make a short statement? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Mr President, Amendment 1200 simply implements an existing requirement of the Water Act to maintain a transparent register of water trades. This provision of the Water Act has been there for 14 years. As Minister Dutton kindly pointed out in the House of Representatives debate this morning, this amendment has a solid legal basis. The pathetic excuse the Nationals gave that the states each have their own, actual, own register actually supports our case for a basin-wide register. The Nationals have confirmed that there is not a basin-wide register. By taking this action, the ALP, the Liberals and their si sell-out sidekicks, the Nationals, are making it clear that they intend to pick and choose which aspects of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan they intend to follow. So it's a bit like they're saying, I like this bit, let's spend years taking water off farmers, stealing waters from farmers, forcing up the price of water so the holdings of our friends are suddenly worth a fortune. But they hate this bit. We don't want anyone to know what we're doing. On what legal basis are the Order. Nationals, Senator Liberals Roberts, and Labor doing uh, this? One minute has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Well, after 24 hours of absolute chaos in this place and the other because of the rift and division within the government. We are now here, uh, well past the time that this we should have finished, still debating a piece of legislation that this government doesn't even have a unified position on. It is absolute disgrace that in 
on one hand, you want to manage the Murray-Darling Basin, and then you've got members of your own government saying that South Australia doesn't even need fresh water. You are an absolute disgrace, a shambles, and there is no way we should be dealing with this right here, right now, when you can't even get your own house sorted out. Okay. Senator Waters. Uh, yes, President. I just uh, will be dissenting from your ruling that uh, immediately, implicitly means immediately okay. without debate. So I'd like you, um, sure, in, the, so. Uh, in the ordinary course, to, to seek advice from that, because it's okay, a very so dangerous precedent to I set. Have, uh, I have received advice from the clerk, who has advised me the precedent in this case is the Medivac message, and debate was not allowed on that occasion. So if you wish to seek, um, I don't have the script I had earlier today in front of me, but normally it is dealt with on a subsequent day. But if the Senate wishes, a dissent can be dealt with immediately. Senator Waters. Thank you. I'm happy for the dissent to be dealt with on the next day of sitting, as is normally the case. Sure. That's the process I'm using right now. Um, well, there is a mood here to deal with it to deal with it now, Senator Waters, given the legislation is pending. Senator Birmingham. Seek, seek some clarification, because uh, while Senator Waters used the word dissent, I didn't actually hear her move a motion. It sounded like she was inviting you to consider the matter, Mr President. Um, is this a motion of dissent yeah, in your ruling, or is this an invitation for you to consider and come back to the chamber? So a motion of dissent form, uh, is set in writing. Um, and I've I saw Senator Waters' hand, so I took it as a, you wanted to move a motion of dissent in my ruling. Um, that can be dealt with now or on a subsequent day. We're dealing with the legislation now. Senator Waters. President, thank you. If I can clarify, I understand we're dealing with the legislation now. What I've asked uh, to be dissented from and for you to seek further advice on is the principle uh, that moving immediately does not mean moving immediately without debate. I accept that this legislation, uh, as per the hours motion, which we didn't agree to, will be uh, undertaken right now, but I ask for the point of principle to be considered because it's a broader and more important, not more important, well, an important uh, procedural issue yeah, okay. to get Senator, right. Senator Waters, all right, what I will clear. do, what I will take it, I've, I've read out the, my ruling and, uh, sorry, and, 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 and the precedent that the clerk has informed me of, which was the Medivac message and debate on that was not allowed on that occasion. Other word. So what I'll do, Senator Waters, is take it that um, you are flagging a motion of dissent in this ruling. Are oh, you given it? Um, and Senator Wong? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would invite the government to, uh, pursuant to 198.2, to move a motion to determine that dissent today, which is open to the Senate to do so. Mm. I don't think it's reasonable for the, a dissent motion, which is a serious motion, mm. uh, be hanging over the chamber and the president's head for the period of the Senate rising. Yeah. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President, uh, and indeed I concur with the Leader of the Opposition in relation to uh, the benefit of certainty in this matter, uh, particularly given the precedent that exists uh, in relation to the ruling you made, Mr. President, and I do move that the question uh, be put immediately. So, se Section 198.2, for the information of Senators, debate on that motion shall be adjourned to the next day of sitting unless the Senate decides on motion that has now been moved by Senator Birmingham without debate that the question requires immediate determination. So I'm going to move Senator Birmingham's motion that, that your dissent motion requires immediate determination. This is effectively that the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for <coughs> one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is a motion understanding order 1982 that the motion of dissent moved by Senator Waters um, be determined today. Those, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the nose.
The result of the division is eyes 38, noes 10. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, I received further advice from the clerk on this matter, so I need to correct something I said earlier. The clerk says, the motion on the Medivac message allowed a short debate, but the point remains that, quote, put immediately, unquote, means without debate, that is, only statements by leave are in order, which is consistent with, I, with exactly what I said prior to adding the note about the Medivac message. My apologies for that error. The question now is, and I'll use, assume, Senator Waters, that your question is that the Senate dissent from my ruling on put, what put immediately is. So the question is, the Senate dissent from my ruling. Those that, of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 35. The question is resolved in the negative. I thank senators. The question, question is now that the Senate not insist on its amendments to the Water Legislation Amendment, Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill 2021. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is, the Senate not insist on its amendments? The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Brockman, tell of the ayes. Senator Seawitt, tell of the nose. Four nose twelve. The question is resolved in the affirmative. That concludes legislation, I believe, and I call Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I move the motion in relation to um, uh, consideration of formal motions, uh, standing in my name as circulated. And, uh, and Mr. President, uh, in doing so, I wish to provide some context briefly and some explanation. Mr President, in my time in this chamber, the consideration of formal motions has, over a period of time, become one of the most divisive, dysfunctional and disorderly elements of the Senate consideration each day. Mr President, a process— Order. I Order. I started by Senator saying Hanson I was going Young, to speak you make, briefly. Are you seeking a point of order, Senator, Senator You're Hanson up Young? Up twenty minutes now. Senator Hanson Young, on a Just point of order. Point of order. Uh, this debate is only listed for twenty minutes. The minister has been allocated fifteen. I just want clarification. Uh, does, is, is he speaking for the whole fifteen? Uh, well, that's not a point of order. The, the speaking times are set in the standing orders. The limitation of debate was set by the Senate today. I can only imagine that more interjections and points of order will reduce time for debate. But they are the rules, Senator Birmingham. So thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I do intend to limit my remarks. And Mr. President, as I said, uh, consideration of formal business has, over the last 14 years of my time here, become one of the most divisive, dysfunctional, and disorderly elements yeah. of the day. Yeah. The process for formal motions was originally intended to allow the consideration of non-controversial items, to allow consideration relating to the smooth running of the Senate. Instead, it has become a process where we have seen motions used for the purposes of race baiting. We have seen motions that are engaging in the most sensitive of conscience vote issues. We have seen Order. motions in relation to complex foreign policy matters. We have seen significant policy questions that, frankly, are unable to be simplified into a few sentences, and yet senators attempt to do so in putting such motions. The conduct of this section of the day where a sensitive or complex issue can be listed with just a single day's notice and then all, expected, all senators expected to vote on it without any explanation, without any debate or consideration, has become the antithesis of what a parliamentary chamber should be like. Order. Mr President, as we know, the Senate Order. and senators, particularly through the Order. Procedure Committee, has long considered 
and debated ways to try to address the problems with the dysfunctionality of this element of the day. An attempt was Order. made to limit parts of that. Unfortunately, the attempt to limit the number of motions in an effort to try to create a more orderly approach has only resulted in yet more dysfunction and disorder. And so consideration has been ongoing in terms of how to achieve reform that will provide for greater order in the chamber whilst not limiting the ability of senators to make a stance and a say themselves. The proposal order. in the motion if that is put order, forward— Order. Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. It's, there will be more time eaten up if the interjections keep going. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the proposal that is put forward uh, is to limit such motions to their original intent insofar as they deal with procedural questions before the Senate, including the establishment of committees, including holding the government to account through matters such as the order for production of documents. There will be no such limits in relation to those process matters and considerations under the motion before the Senate. The government will still be held to account firmly through those elements. Mr President, what the motion seeks to create is a new half-hour opportunity each and every day for senators to make two-minute statements. In doing so, this will allow any senator to make a statement on whatever matter as controversial as they wish, Mr President. But without expecting every other senator in this place, with no notice or no debate, to have to then form an opinion on that senator's controversial statement. Each senator Order. will be able to have Order, that opportunity. Senator Lambie. It is the government's Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. In order to maintain order, I will use the time-limited clock, and people are chewing up time they have to make a contribution. Senator Birmingham. It is the government's intention, Mr President, to make sure, through the allocation of these spots, that any different party entity or independent entity in this chamber represented who wishes to use that slot during uh, each day has an opportunity to do so. The government will Order do that Senator whilst McKinn. noting uh, that others may wish to claim their right to proportionality uh, within the allocation of those slots. Mr President, we wish to ensure that senators have the chance to have the say without compromising the rights of other senators Order. in the way in which they engage. There are other technical amendments in the motion put forward which ensure that senators' statements times, as they currently exist on a Wednesday, uh, are in no way limited and continue to exist as per ordinary business and similarly in relation to the consideration of non-controversial business. The government will continue to engage in relation to the allocation of these slots and with other senators in good faith about how other parts of the business, such as general business, can be used to provide the best possible outlet for senators to participate in a robust parliamentary procedure, but without compromising the rights of their colleagues. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. And I, I will keep my remarks uh, short as well. Um, but I welcome the opportunity to speak briefly to this motion, and um, the opposition will be supporting it. Uh, this, this motion. Uh, will deal with a part of the program that, as the Leader of the Government has outlined, has been dysfunctional and divisive uh, every single day that I have been in this place, and it is getting worse. It has also been an issue that has been on the agenda of the Procedure Committee for the entire time I have been in this place, uh, on the agenda for discussion and reform, because it constantly gets raised as a dysfunctional and divisive part of the program that does not work. And this proposal actually gives more senators the opportunity to speak, 60 new speaking spots a week, and senators have unlimited opportunity to put, in, to put in motions, Order. unlimited opportunity to put in motions and 60 spots to raise issues on behalf of your community or issues that matter to you on a daily basis that can Order. be dealt with and raised in this chamber. And I hear the interjections about, but there are no votes. And that goes to the issue of how this Senator part McKim. of the program has been used. Senator Lambie. Formal business was used initially for motions that could be agreed across the chamber and put without debate. That was the origins of it. It has been used for the opposite effect, 
for the entire time I've been in this place. It has been used for motions that are complex, that are complicated, that are often deeply felt by senators in this place, and senators in this place are asked, without the opportunity to debate, without the opportunity to discuss, to either get into a yes or no camp without even explaining why they're going there. And then that is weaponised outside of this place to attack other senators. That is exactly what it's about. And we know that's why you're angry. We know you're angry because with the issue of the vote is what you treasure the most, as opposed to actually genuinely raising issues, having the opportunity to speak, which is being provided by this motion. That is what's happening here. We have more spots for speaking, more spots for bank benches that might not have that opportunity to speak are now being provided to people. We have tried over the past year since the other reforms came in to have a sensible way forward on motions. We have raised it. I have raised it repeatedly with people. We have had senators now denying formality for anyone who wants to move one, gagging people, refusing them the right to move motions. That's where we're in now. This deals with that and gives every opportunity for any senator to actually speak, raise their issue. What it doesn't do, what it doesn't do is force people Order, Senator to vote and yes McKim. or no to things that are often contested and often complicated that require debate. It is a dysfunctional part of this program. This temporary order looks to address that, and we look forward to working with parties across the chamber on its implementation and, you know, if it doesn't work, reconsideration of it. But this is, is the most sensible way forward at this period of time. It's a temporary order. and again. The extension of friendship and support goes out to everyone to try and make this work as best as possible because it hasn't to date. Order. Order. Senator Lambie. Senator Seward. is an act of bastardry by the two major parties. That's plain and simple. This motion, complicated motion, came in at 4.45. It's now 5.25. We haven't had time to properly read this. We agreed in procedure committee that uh, this proposal would go out for comment to senators. Guess when it went out? Yesterday morning. And then, yesterday afternoon, what happens? Senator Dunningham comes in with a handwritten note saying he'll bring in a proposal tomorrow to deal with motions. We come in this morning, no motion, nothing, because they were still making it up. And then what do we do? Get in at 4.45, and here is the motion now, where the majors gang up to silence the crossbench. That is outrageous, and they know very well. Labor's already been absenting itself from the chamber when they can't make a decision on these motions. They just disappear out the door because they don't want to be held accountable by the electorate. Now, let's, let's look at some of the things that have been achieved through motions. The Disability Royal Commission, the Banking Royal Commission, action on petrol sniffing. Those are the sorts of things that have been achieved through using motions, because that is how you get pressure on the, on the government, pressure on the opposition, whoever's in government, because this has happened on both times of the chain, when both the major parties have been in government. They don't want to be held accountable, and that's what this is about, folks. And for those listening out there, these two major parties do not want to be held accountable. This is one of the levers that we use through a democratic process to try and achieve change, and we have. We have achieved change that way. We have. We have achieved the Banking Royal Commission by, being, by bringing motions into this place, by bringing motions for a long time on, the disability, on disability, violence and abuse against disabled people and veterans. We wouldn't have got those. We wouldn't have got that action if we couldn't bring those motions to this chamber. This is an act of bastardry carried out by the major parties. It is simply outrageous. And we will fight this. Now we were supposed to be considering this. We were supposed to be considering this at the end of the first week, sitting week in August. But what the government and the opposition, so-called opposition, want to do is deal with it now 
in the dying hours of the last week of sitting in June, thinking that everyone will forget it and not at, before we get back here in August. We're not going to forget it. We're going to make sure the public remember what these two parties are doing to democracy in this country through ramming this through in the last hours of the last sitting day of the winter session. It is outrageous. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Order. Thank you, Mr President. I'll just make a few remarks. I heard Senator Birmingham use the word reform. I've come to realise over the many years listening to governments in this country that that word is used and misrepresents what is going to happen to us. It implies that it is good for us all. It is not. It's misrepresenting. The second point I make, how can we assess the feelings of our constituents and then not express them here anymore? The government does not want to assess, neither does the Labor Party, the feeling of our constituents. The third point I want to make is that we've had no notice on this and control. That's what this is about, control. And always beneath control there is fear. We don't like what happened with formal motions. Our response was not to run away, not to shut down, but to stand up and speak out. Even though it was only one minute, that's what we've done. We spoke, we held people accountable. It doesn't matter whether it's the Greens, we disagreed with them or agreed with them. We had the guts to speak up. The core issue that's driving this is decades of weak governance and no accountability. And this change continues that. We will continue to tell the truth and calmly speak up and rely on data and round you lot up. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Just uh, very briefly, I am disappointed that very little notice was given for this, and I do point out we are gagged in terms of this debate in a, in a, in a sequence of events where we uh, are also gagged on bills, 71 bills in the 37 days that, uh, that uh, um, Senator Birmingham has been leader of the uh, government in the Senate. All of this is just uh, eating away at democracy. I, do, I will point out that in relation to the, the motion that has been moved, one thing is absent that needs to be fixed, um, and that is the ability to test the Senate on, on questions of importance. And I think we need to rethink that uh, uh, in the context of, of moving forward. Senators, given this goes directly to the op operation of the chamber, I'm going to take up the rare option of the chair to contribute to debate under the standing orders. It will only be a minute. From the position of having been here both 13 years and also having been your president for the last three and a bit, this has become an increasingly challenging and, I would put, unedifying part of Senate business. Complex motions, matters indeed matters of conscience, are having votes forced without senators being able to explain their positions let alone debate alternative positions, but senators are not provided the opportunity to explain them. The right of senators to speak is sacrosanct, and that is, in my view, protected, indeed increased by this motion. However, that right does not extend to forcing other senators to vote without them having the same opportunity. At the very least, at the very least to explain their position on motions put before the Senate effectively on less than 24 hours notice. A right to speak does not extend to a right to force others to vote while being denied that very opportunity. Are there any other are there any are there any other are there any other contributions to the debate? We have two and a half minutes remaining. Senator Lambie. Yes, um, thank you, Mr President. I have to say I don't agree with you. As being someone that's a minor on independent up here um, and being feeling like they're being gagged continuously and yet they're the ones stuck in the meat when I'm not doing anything wrong and I'm getting punished. I didn't know this country actually was punishing people for actions that they're not even taking. And there are some of us on this crossbench that don't deserve this reprimand. And that's what it is, is a reprimand on my democracy and the people that I re represent in Tasmania. That's very, com that's very um, that's a very sad day. And you know you want to talk about complex motions. And if you think you can get complexity out in two minutes, then blow me over. Blow me over. You know, you can't get anything in two minutes, and they're right. 
You know, when we put up motions, we want to see what side you are going on. Because I can tell you right now, if I hadn't have been given those motions and pulled you guys up and put you in a corner, those veterans out there, those veterans out there, that Veterans Affairs, that department would still be worse. It will continue to get worse. It would not have any Royal Commission. They would never be able to start to heal the thousands of veterans out there that you are going to see come forward in that Royal Commission because they wouldn't have a Royal Commission. It seems every time it gets too hard for you majors, the first thing you want to do is put a piece of goddamn gaffer tape on us. Well, you know what? It is chaotic in here. And you know why? You are the majority of the Senate, both your major parties. You are the Senate. Take responsibility for your own actions and stop blaming us because it is enough. We have rights just like you do and so do millions of Australians out there. And if they've chosen me to be in here to be heard, that is, what, that is my right. So to you to limit my right is limiting their rights to be heard in here. And it has gone far enough. Because quite frankly, that's exactly what, needs, what, what it seems to me, is that I might as well walk in here with gabber tape on my mouth and say nothing to come here. This is so unfair. And punishing some of us for something we did not do. According to the resolution adopted earlier today, I now must put the motion. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Brockman tell off the ayes and Senator Seawitt tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 40, noes 11. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, pursuant to order, we will now move on to the consideration of general business notice of motion number 1174 for no more than 30 minutes. Senator Seawitt, I will call upon you to move your motion as I assume you are speaking to it. Senator Seawitt. I, I move general business notice of motion number, I think it's 1174. Um, which is, relates to the 2021-22 budget. Budgets, Deputy President, are all about choices. The government's latest budget completely misses the opportunity to address the growing inequality and poverty in our community. In fact, it works to further entrench it. Instead of ensuring everyone has enough to live a good life and ensure their well-being, the government has decided to spend $62 billion a year in handouts to big corporations and billionaires, $8.5 billion in tax cuts, in tax rorts, for property investors with no new funding for public housing and community housing, $213 million and counting on compliance measures for people on income support, and $42 million to further entrench the cashless debit card. The budget should be used to address long-term problems as well as the most immediate issues. Inequality is increasing, wages have flatlined, work is more insecure and the cost of living keeps going up. Too many, far too many Australians are living in poverty. Australia is in the middle of a housing crisis. In a wealthy country like Australia, no one should be without a roof over their head. Instead, there are 116,000 116, people sleeping rough in Australia every night and even more ex experiencing extreme housing stress and also many people couch surfing. What this budget, budget does is further strengthen a housing system that actively impoverishes people and makes inequality worse. Instead of guaranteeing everyone's right to a safe home, the government has given $8.5 in tax breaks to wealthy investors and property speculators in this budget. 
Despite the housing crisis, this budget has not allocated any new funds for public or community housing. Public housing should be universally accessible. It should be so that no one is living without a roof over their head. Housing prices and rents have skyrocketed, particularly during the pandemic, squeezing the most vulnerable into extreme housing stress and insecurity. Home ownership is increasingly out of reach for a majority of young people in this country. In Perth, in my home state of Western Australia, the medium rent is 460 bucks a week. This is not even close to being affordable for someone on income support, and particularly when the payment is $44 a day, or for someone working at the minimum wage. A yearly income of $38,480 a year. This budget gives $62 billion a year in subsidies to billionaires and big corporations. But the government says there's not enough money to increase job seeker to $80 a day, which we know is the level that would lift people out of poverty and ensure they're not condemned to poverty. During the height of the pandemic, the government acknowledged that the rate of the job seeker payment was inadequate and chose to immediately increase the payment above the poverty line um, with the introduction of the COVID supplement. This one decision immediately lifted hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty. They knew they had to do that to ensure that people weren't living in poverty during the pandemic lockdown. It had a remarkable impact on the lives of people receiving income support payments. People were able to eat regular meals, pay off existing debts, save for education and training, go to the dentist. Just something that other people take for granted. When you're living on $44 a day, you can't afford to go to the dentist and afford the essential medications that they had been putting off because they simply couldn't afford it. It is a disgrace that this government does not significantly increase the job seeker payment to ensure that millions of Australians are not living in poverty. It must be acknowledged that people on the disability support pension and carers were cruelly excluded from the COVID supplement, a point where Greens raised in this chamber many times. Despite all evidence that expenses for disabled people and carers increased in the pandemic, they were simply left out from receiving extra assistance. This is despite the government knowing very well that disabled people face additional costs of living generally, and that was very clear from work that AFTO has done on the cost of, leaving, of a disabled person's living expenses. Despite paying more for health care, medical supplies, PPE, transport and utility bills, disabled people and carers are still struggling to make ends meet. There is nothing in this budget to help alleviate these costs. As quickly as the COVID supplement was introduced, it was then taken away. Once again, people looking for work, students and single parents, are forced to live below the poverty line. This is a choice by this government to drop those people back below the poverty line. People on income support payments have gone back to regularly skipping meals to, keep, to try and keep a roof over their heads, missing their medications, all those things that they've articulated so many times uh, to us through various inquiries and that has been spoken around about in this chamber. That's the reality for people looking for work. And this government does not care they don't care for the consequences. This has been their policy choice. Half of all households in Australia who receive the parenting payments live in poverty, with single mothers, because that's the majority of single parents by far, who are, over, uh, who are clearly overrepresented in this group, particularly uh, at risk of financial stress. It should also be noted that parents, when their youngest child over the, with the youngest, when the youngest child turns eight, are put onto the lower rate of the job seeker payment, a policy that has still not been reversed despite its adverse consequences and despite the data clearly showing an increase in poverty for single parents when those changes were made. When the changes were made and came into effect after the decision of the Howard government and after the decision of the Gillard government to move that cohorted uh, the um, grandfathered cohort um, onto the um, then New Start payment, now Job Seeker payment. This 
forces parents into poverty and it significantly undermines their caring work, and we know poverty is a barrier to finding work. There are more than 1.1 million Australian children in homes where there's an income support payment is the main source of income. These children live in poverty. There is nothing in this budget to reduce this shameful statistic. Further, the government's home deposit scheme for single parents will, ho will help very few single parents. How does the government expect single parents to save enough money to purchase a house when they are living in poverty? There is no greater evidence that the government is out of touch than this. Our aged care system is in crisis. With additional resource, while additional resources were committed to aged care, not enough to address the dire need for reform and to do the job properly. This budget does not address fundamental workforce issues or properly fund the recommendations of the Royal Commission into aged care. Older Australians and workers continue to suffer under poor conditions and lack of regulation this government has allowed to fester. Aged care needs total reform, and the government is not acting with the urgency that is required nor committing the funds necessary. We have an ageing population and we don't have the workforce to keep up. No money was committed in this budget to increase wages for the aged care workforce. If the government was genuinely committed to address this issue, to genuinely offer more hours of care, they would have committed in this budget, in this budget, the money for an increase in wages and not hide behind the fair work case. They know very well that this is needed. That some workers are working in aged care on very, very low wages. We need to ensure that our aged care workforce and our caring workforce is paid properly. A sustained commitment to the care sector is fundamental to guaranteeing universal access to essential services for all, regardless of their income or where they live. The budget takes away from employment services. Australia is one of the lowest spenders in the OECD on employment services. Given that that pandemic has resulted in hundreds of thousands more people uh, accessing income support, this government still can't give up on its obsession with making sa savings out of our social safety net. With more than 50 per cent of job seekers on the payment for more than two years, this is also urgent. We need to be putting more resources into employment services, not punishing them through ramping up mutual obligations. This budget, there is very little in the budget to help long-term unemployed people find work. Instead, the budget provides $213 million to strengthen so-called mutual obligations. This is more money to punish, threaten and bully people looking, that are looking for work. This is a budget that continues the ongoing disdain this government has for people doing it tough. People on income support, older Australians, young people, single parents and disabled people. In, a bu in, budget after, in a budgets after budgets, this government fails to address entrenched poverty instead expecting charities and the not-for-profit sector to pick up the slack under increasing strain, while on the other hand trying to have a go at them through their Statement 3 um, in the ACNC legislation, trying to, trying to gag them further. A strong social safety net and probably fu properly funded public services are the bedrock of ensuring equality and opportunity for, everyone's, for everyone. Budget should prioritise this. A budget for the community rather than billionaires would invest in reducing poverty. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Senator Seawitt's motion is that the Senate notes that the Morrison government's 2021-22 budget left people on low incomes behind. I would go further because this budget leaves the whole country behind, and that means it leaves everyone behind. There have been massive increases in debt in the last 12 months without the necessary data, objective data underpinning it. That shows, yet again, poor governance over our country. I've discussed with the Chief Medical Officer and Senate Estimates and the Secretary of the Health Department the seven essential components for a plan for managing a virus. The government is addressing one, state governments are addressing another. That's it. 
and they have been addressed poorly by both the federal and the state governments. I want to discuss the productive capacity, because that's what determines the wealth and the security, the economic security, and indeed sometimes the, the defence security of our nation in the future. The productive capacity of our country has been de declining considerably since 1944, and in fact since 1923, if we want to get into basics, but that's for another day. Let's look at the most important part of productive capacity, the human asset, our people. Look at education, because it's the, the future leaders of this country that will determine the future productive capacity, as well as us determining that capacity today. We have declining scores in education, reading and writing, mathematics and science declining by world standards. We are falling well behind in the core, issue, in the core aspects of education. But we devote plenty of resources, plenty of time, plenty of energy to gender fluidity, teaching kids, misleading kids about gender fluidity, critical race theory, non-gender language a national curriculum that the government forks out money for and yet cannot control what's in. That's what's been told to us by the, by the federal government. We need charter schools. We need parents to have more say in the running of their schools and principals to have more, more say in the running of their schools. Parents to control what values are passed on and parents to decide whether or not their children will be taught about gender fluidity. And I want to compliment Mark Latham in the New South Wales Parliament and my, my colleague Senator Pauline Hanson for the bills that they are introducing and evaluating right now to restore the values and, and uh, common sense to education. And I note that Singapore, Japan and Korea have really moved ahead in, in recent years, as has Taiwan, and they all have solid basic education. What's happened to apprenticeships in this country? Senator Lyons moved a motion today with regard to apprenticeships sadly lacking in WA. Senator Hanson has introduced an apprenticeship scheme, proudly introduced an apprenticeship scheme that the government has taken and refurbished and refurbished and expanded. Such was her, uh, the success of her suggestion on apprenticeships. What's happened to universities? They followed our primary schools and high schools in becoming more woke and uh, driven by anything but education. And as for university education, it is now just uh, pushing an ideology. Our TAFE systems have fallen into disrepair. Our trades qualifications are falling into disrepair. Let's move on then to the workplace. The Fair Work Act is an abomination. It is, so th it is th about that thick in terms of pages printed. It destroys the employer-employee relationship, which is essential for productive capacity. It is difficult for anyone, an employee or a small business employer, who doesn't have access to lawyers and consultants and HR practitioners to work their way through that. How can they possibly be held accountable for that relationship when they can't even understand it and never will understand it? Not because of lack of intelligence, but because of lack of time and surely, and surely being overwhelmed. Again, just like education, this is poor governance to let this get into this state. Then we go to energy arguably the most critical in terms of material resources, because energy has determined the competitiveness of every country. Under President Trump, America reversed its decline in competitiveness because it reversed its increase of energy prices and it started to decrease energy prices again. It became more competitive against its competitors, and America blossomed because of that. President Trump created more jobs than any president in history because of that and because he, he cut away regulations. This government, its predecessors, have fiddled with the renewable energy target, destroying our baseload coal-fired power stations, our grid. The network costs are destroying our grid, making it unaffordable. Un, uh, retail sectors of electricity, just a fabrication. The national electricity market is now a national electricity racket. It's not a market at all. It's a bureaucracy that's interfered with and manipulated by bureaucrats looking after vest, vested interests. And then we see privatisation. The Queensland Labor government is now taking about $1.5 billion every year from people who use electricity—businesses, small businesses and, and families. 
and that is now a tax. We have taxes on electricity. Why is it that the Chinese can, can produce electricity and sell it for one-third the cost of electricity sold in this country when they use the same coal as we do? They take it thousands, thousands of kilometres, burn it and sell the coal, sell coal-fired power to their consumers and it costs us, oh sorry, we sell it for three times as much because of regulations that come out of both sides of this parliament. Then we look at water. The Murray-Darling Basin is being gutted, communities being gutted, regions being gutted, and nothing is happening about it. Today we passed a change, an amendment, to restore compliance with the law, with the Water Act of 2007, with regard to water trading. It was supported by the Labor Party, denied by the Liberals and Nationals. They don't want to comply with the, with the, uh, with the Murray-Darling Basin plan. Went down to the lower house and Labor changed and sent it back here with, in cahoots with the Liberals and Nationals. That will continue to destroy water, tr water allocations in our, in our country because it will continue the corruption and the likely, apparently, uh, very confident of saying the criminal activities going on in the Murray-Darling Basin with regard to water trading and the abuse. Then we see property rights, fundamental to running uh, a farm, fundamental to running a business, stolen capriciously under the Howard Anderson government in 1996, and then progressively with Labor premiers from Queensland and New South Wales jumping on the bandwagon to steal farmers' property rights. Why? To comply with the United Nations Kyoto Protocol of 1996. That's why. And farmers have lost the value of their land. And then we see that extended in Queensland, for example, by the Queensland state government relying on bogus claims about the reef to lock up land. We then see the federal government enacting carbon farming, where vast tracts of land, good farmland, are now laid waste and abandoned and taken over by feral animals and noxious weeds. And the costs of managing them as they spread around the country fall on their neighbours' properties. This is another example of poor governance. The lack of infrastructure in water. The Bradfield scheme crying out for investment. And then we go to the most destructive system of all in our country, uh, yeah, I think the, the Australian taxation system. In 1996 and 2010, Jim Kalali was the assistant commissioner, assistant deputy commissioner, sorry, the deputy commissioner of taxation for large companies and international matters. And he said on both occasions, 1996 and 2010, 90 per cent of Australia's large companies are foreign owned and since 1953 have paid little or no company tax. They use our resources, use our people, use our assets, use our defence forces, use our police forces, use our education system and pay nothing in return and just take. The Japanese, by comparison, have in their large companies 2.5 per cent are foreign owned. The American and, and the uh, British figures were about 12.5 per cent. So who pays for these foreign, foreign companies to use our assets and to make money without paying tax, company tax? The people of Australia pay for that through families paying taxes, through individuals paying tax, through small businesses paying tax, and some large Australian companies paying 30 per cent against the multinational competitors who don't have to pay that. How can we possibly compete? And then we find out in 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, and I've asked the parliamentary library to, to update this figure, that a person on the average income in this country pays 68 per cent of their income to government. government is, the the house, uh, housing is not our largest income, not, not our largest expenditure in life. Government is, through taxes, rates, fees, levies, charges, supercharges, special charges. Joe Hockey admitted when he was, when he was treasurer that 50 per cent of a person's income is taken in tax. He said people work from January through to end of June to pay for government and then they keep what's left. Well, the actual figure when you take in government charges as well and rates and levies and fees is 68 per cent, which means that people are working, someone on the, on the average income is working from Monday through Tuesday through Wednesday to mid-morning Thursday to pay for government. And then they keep what's left from the second 
the two-thirds of Thursday and Friday to pay for their entire life, their retirement, their education, their food, their shelter, their car, their transport, their entertainment. That is not fair. And it shows poor governance. And I haven't got time now to talk about attempts to reform taxation, but both parties, both the Tidal parties, have shown a reluctance to, in, to invest energy and political will and sheer guts. They lack the integrity to tackle tax reform, comprehensive tax reform. I mentioned infrastructure a minute ago. What about projects like the uh, Richmond Agricultural Project? What about the Hewenden in, in, in Irrigation Project up in Hewenden? What about things like the Iron Boomerang, which would transform our country? and make it the most cost-effective and largest producer of steel. Give us enormous security for our manufacturing and for our, for our defence. And then we have things like the tap onto that iron boomerang, things like an inland rail that's being destroyed by the Liberal national government, inland rail that is being uh, sucking up resources and coming up with something that will be far worse than the existing, than the existing installations especially when we considered the blowout in the cost. Again, lack of, lack of data, lack of sound planning. The inland rail and a proper route through to Gladstone would be part then of, an, of a proper national rail circuit. So, Madam Deputy President, I submit to you these points that show and prove that the government here has not only left the poor behind, as Senator Seward points out, the government has put additional burdens on the poor. The government has put a regressive tax on the poor in terms of energy prices. Energy prices are, are increasing alarmingly, and the poor have to pay a higher and higher and higher proportion of their income on a fundamental, which is energy. And then the poor pay for it because they lose their jobs when our manufacturing jobs some of our agricultural processing jobs, some of our agricultural jobs are exported to China that uses our raw materials, gas, coal, to produce electricity far cheaper than we sell it for in our own country. So we're losing out entirely and we lose out in, in the diminishing of our security, our defence security. So I certainly agree with Senator Seward that the Morrison government's 2021-22 budget has left people on low incomes behind. It has left people right across the country behind. It has left Australia behind. Thank you, Madam, Acting, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President, Madam Deputy President. Uh, well, in the time remaining, uh, I will make some comments about the, the budget, because I think the budget was a good opportunity for Australians to see the multifaceted uh, economic plan that we have. Uh, and of course, this starts with being a competitive economy because when you look at an economy um, that is an outward looking economy like Australia's, uh, that we're not isolationists, we're not trying to run a, a rust bucket economy, uh, we need to be competitive, we need to be able to attract foreign investment because foreign investment is something that we have relied upon since the first fleet. Uh, and of course, uh, in relation to foreign investment uh, and being a dynamic, um, open, modern economy, uh, there are many measures uh, to improve our competitive position. In the budget, there was the announcement that Australia will have a patent box system. Uh, there was uh, an announcement that we would modernise the tax residency rules. Uh, there was an announcement that we would um, establish an ATO-style concierge service uh, to, to attract and win that foreign investment because uh, of some of the disruption that is happening in our region, most particularly in Hong Kong. There are more opportunities for Australia to capture uh, growth uh, from the region but we can only capture that growth if we are dynamic and competitive. And so these measures in the budget do that. Now, only in the last few weeks, the G7 has met and there's been a, a discussion about having a minimum company tax rate. As this chamber knows, there have been many attempts to try and cut the headline tax rate for good reason, uh, but it has not been successful. So in an era of lower tax competition, uh, it is important that Australia is right on the cutting edge in terms of having the sort of tax schemes and having the regulatory frameworks which are really, really going to drive uh, that investment. Because we need foreign investment. Because uh, for all the people that come into this chamber and say how much they love superannuation, superannuation does not fund Australian companies. Uh, and if you want to have jobs, you need to get money into companies. Um, the second thing that our budget does is it gets, gets taxes down. Uh, it obviously uh, builds on our prior budgets. 
which reduce uh, the tax rate for small companies with turnovers under $50 million. Now, in this budget, we extend the instant asset write-off. And when you go around and you meet small businesses, whether they're in you know, canoes or whether they're making coffees, um, the ability to access the instant asset write-off has been a real boon uh, because it has uh, improved significantly the ability of a business to make a capital investment because it's effectively saying you can expense your capital investment, which is a very good uh, thing because it stimulates, of course, uh, the economy but delivers effectively an asset to that small business. We've also uh, extended the temporary loss carryback, so that means that if companies have paid tax in a prior tax year, they can offset that against a loss, which gives them a direct refund. Because, of course, the philosophy here is the government has no money of its own. All the, the money the government has to play with it taxes from individuals. And so the idea of uh, the government giving tax back to people and back through to companies is a very sound principle. Now, one thing we understand well and truly on this, this side of the Senate is that most small businesses um, are just people. They're just people uh, who've got an idea who are running a company, uh, could be running a, a sole tradership. And so whatever we can do to support those businesses around the country uh, is very important. Now, the third element in the minute I have remaining is providing more flexibility for retirees, because we think that uh, people should be able to downsize their houses easily. We think people should be able to uh, contribute more to super if they want to voluntarily. And we think that uh, people should be able to use their super to purchase a first home in certain circumstances. Now, it's probably well known that I think we should be extending that even further, but the budget does provide a measure that allows Australians to take $50,000 from their super, uh, it has to be voluntary contributions, and then use that for a first home. Now, we've always believed in home ownership on this side of the Senate, always, because having a home uh, gives you a sense of security, but it also gives you a, a place to uh, to build a family and gives you a greater stake in society. So we're always look, looking for ways to boost uh, home ownership. And there are now more first home buyers in the market uh, than there has been at any time over the last 10 years. So the budget makes Australia more competitive. Uh, it does get taxes down, which is great. Uh, and it does provide more flexibility uh, in that very, very rigid superannuation space, which of course has been dominated by uh, the dreaded vested interests for far too long. So we look forward to people having more control of their money in the future. So the time for the debate has expired, so I'll call the minister. Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek Sorry. leave to Aye. move a motion to vary the membership of committees. So I said I received leaders requesting changes in the membership of the committees. The minister has sought leave to move the motion. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Rustin. <laughs> I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I move that the Senate at its rising adjourn until Tuesday the 3rd of August 2021 at midday or such other time as may be fixed by the president or in the event of the president being unavailable by the deputy president and at the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each senator and Leave of absence be granted to all senators from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I propose that the Senate do now adjourn, unless there's any other business. I propose the Senate do now adjourn. I call Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise this evening uh, to uh, pay tribute to members of the Australian Vietnamese community in my home state of Queensland. On 30 April 2021, I had the great honour of attending the 46th commemoration at Freedom Place, Anala, in my home state of Queensland, of the fall of Saigon, which occurred on 30 April 1975. And it was a very, very moving occasion. And there are three points I'd like to make. Uh, in relation to that event. First, I'd like to place on the record and pay tribute to all those veterans of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam who fought for freedom against the communists in their homeland of Vietnam um, with great courage, with great courage in the force of overwhelming um, opposition 
um, at a time when support from previous allies had been withdrawn, and I pay tribute to each and every one of those veterans who was attendant, in attendance on that day. It was a great honour to share that day with each and every one of you. Secondly, I pay thanks for the fact that so many of those veterans and their families and their descendants found their way to our beautiful country of Australia. Found their way to our beautiful country of Australia. And the Australian Vietnamese community has made an outstanding contribution to this country. Uh, and not only, and we should always remember, not only did they find Australia, but Australia found them. Australia found them. And now they're now part of the modern Australian story. And I pay tribute to that community. And lastly, the last point I want to make, and perhaps the most moving um, aspect of the commemoration day was that senior members of the Australian Vietnamese community raised with me a grave injustice. And that injustice is the fact that national servicemen who, from Australia who performed their duty when called upon it to serve our country, but served uh, in Vietnam for less than 181 days, were denied the recognition of the Republic of Vietnam Medal for their service. And that has caused great distress to some 3,000 national servicemen. And what was particularly moving about this matter when it was raised with me was that those veterans of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, their descendants, their families, so passionately believe so passionately believe that those Australian national servicemen should be given that recognition. 46 years after the event of the fall of Saigon, the Australian Vietnamese community so passionately wants those Australian national servicemen who did their duty when called upon by their country, want that service to be recognised. Now, it is not within my power to give or grant that recognition. If it was, if it were, I would gladly do it. But the one thing I would say to each and every one of those 3,000 national servicemen who, in the most difficult of circumstances, in perhaps the most controversial of armed conflicts this country has ever engaged in, the one thing I want to say to each and every one of you is that your duty, your courage, the sacrifice each and every one of you made in terms of serving your country and dealing with the aftermath is greatly appreciated and honoured by our Australian Vietnamese community, and it will never, ever be forgotten. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I, I rise tonight to speak following the passage of an outstanding South Australian, James Richard Crawford AC, Judge of the International Court of Justice. Judge Crawford died on the 31st of May 2021 at the age of 72. And with his passing, our nation has lost one of its most influential scholars and jurists on the international stage. I note there was a flood of tributes to the man and his work when news of his passing became public. At the outset, I tender my profound sympathies to his family and many friends throughout the Australian and international community, as well as the many people who have been influenced by his scholarship and jurisprudence. I have the pleasure of knowing one of his daughters, Rebecca Huntley, whose incisive mind gives some hint of her kin. James Crawford was educated locally at Brighton High School, as it was then known, and the University of Adelaide. After completing his doctorate in international law at Oxford, Judge Crawford returned to Adelaide to launch an academic career as a lecturer in international and constitutional law. This, in turn, took him to distinguished appointments at Sydney University and then Cambridge. Judge Crawford loved the intellectual rigour of academic life, but he was not satisfied with it. He knew that theory was nothing without application, and he determined, was determined that his career would be uncloistered. He wrote landmark texts, most notably the creation of states in international law, setting out the most elemental and profound concepts underpinning international jurisprudence, such as what is a state and what does it mean to have sovereignty. And he took that work a giant leap further when he was commissioned to the UN International Law Commission to write the Articles on Responsibility of States for Internationally Wrongful Acts, a project which had eluded predecessors for some five decades. 
and he completed in five years. These articles provide the framework for state accountability and consequences for breaches in international law. It's little wonder that in its obituary, the Cambridge Law Faculty described him as a towering figure in international law whose work is unparalleled. As an advocate, James Crawford served as senior counsel, counsel or co-counsel in some 30 contentious and advisory proceedings before the court. These internationally significant cases, including representing Australia against Portugal in the East Timor case, the legality of Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence, and the legal consequences of the construction of the wall in the occupied Palestinian territory. My colleague, the Honourable Mark Dreyfus, QC MP, recalled that as Attorney General he had the great fortune to work with James Crawford preparing for and arguing Australia's successful case against Japan's unlawful whaling program before the Court of Justice in July 2013. Mr Dreyfus described Judge Crawford as one of Australia's finest ever legal minds. In 2015, James Crawford commenced his tenure as one of the International Court of Justice's 15 judges. He was the only the second Australian to have ever been elected to the court and the first for nearly 50 years. And he approached this work following the dictum that has served him throughout his career, committed to international law that is an open system, a practical tool for, tool for the resolution of apparently intractable international problems. Crawford's work broke new ground at home and abroad, and he is most famous for his work in international law. But he was also the commissioner in charge of a 1986 report by the Australian Law Reform Commission on the recognition of Aboriginal customary laws. That report is now considered one of the foundations of the Mabo decision that recognised native title. I was moved to read, read Judge Crawford's work, that from a personal point of view, it is the biggest piece of work I've ever done. It reminds us that there is no greater contribution to make to this country than to our national reconciliation. And it underscores how both on our shores and abroad, James Crawford de dedicated his life's work to helping shape an open and fair system of laws to serve our common humanity. And I end by expressing again my deepest sympathy to Rebecca and to all of Judge Crawford's family and friends. Senator Abetz. Yesterday I had the privilege of addressing a rally outside Parliament House. It was a rally organised by many members of the Chinese diaspora in Australia. They were rallying, calling on the Australian government to boycott the Beijing Olympics. There is no doubt that being given the privilege of hosting an Olympics, uh, Olympic Games provides great prestige and honour. It allows the government to showcase, it, showcase itself to the rest of the world but also domestically. It has the potential to be of great propaganda value for a particular regime. Talking to the regime of which we speak, namely the dictatorship in China, we've got to ask a few fundamental questions. And those fundamental questions revolve around the question, is this dictatorship, with all its egregious human rights abuses, worthy of hosting an Olympic Games. And if the International Olympics Committee determines that it is so worthy, then the question needs to be asked, what should Australia do in that regard? It is my very strong view that a boycott of some form or another should be applied. The reason, quite simple. And might I say, when it is my view, it was also the view expressed by the substantial crowd of the Chinese diaspora that were there outside Parliament House yesterday. The human rights abuses are egregious. They're there for all to see. Be it in Hong Kong, the pro-democracy Hong Kongers being brutally dealt with by the regime. On the back of the regime ripping up an international agreement it signed with the United Kingdom and sanctioned by the United Nations, showing a complete disregard for international law, for international agreements, abiding by their own agreements that they signed off on, and more importantly, a complete disregard for the human rights of 
its own citizens. We then move to the, China, to the Chinese mainland proper, and what do we see? House Christians being persecuted, Falun Gong practitioners being persecuted, Uyghurs being persecuted, one million of them in concentration camps, forced sterilisation, slave labour. There are the land grabs in the South, sea, uh, South China Sea Islands. The list goes on and on. There are the cyber attacks that are, being, uh, that are emanating from China. And in relation to the Falun Gong, there are the very well-established now forced organ harvesting against the practitioners of that particular belief system. The world should not stand idly by and say, we will turn a blind eye to these egregious human rights abuses and say that the Olympics can go on as though there's nothing to be seen in China. We are dealing with a brutal, belligerent regime that has no regard for its international obligations, be it with the United Kingdom over Hong Kong or with Australia, be it in our barley or wine trade, or in relation to uh, intellectual property rights. The list goes on and on. And I simply say to the people of Australia and to my own government, it is worthy of consideration to boycott the Olympics in 2022. Mr President, I have uh, started a petition to entice Australians to give voice to that view, should they be so minded, and to access the petition, Australians can go online to the website change.org and search the words Abets Olympics to find the petition, which they can then sign. I would urge all my fellow Australians that have a genuine heart and concern for their fellow human beings suffering under the brutal regime in China to sign the petition. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, and following on from some of my questions asked during the recent Senate estimates hearings, I ask again, when is a charity not a charity? I'm talking about the business known as the RSPCA. The RSPCA Australia is a body originally set up to provide for animals needing assistance and protection from cruelty and neglect. A worthy notion. In Australia, this organisation has established other networked but separate businesses, including RSPCA Queensland and other state-based organisations. As businesses, these organisations are doing very well. RSPCA Queensland, for example, financial results for the year to June 2020 reveal a surplus of $8.7 million during what was described as a challenging year. This included a $4 million grant from the federal government, taxpayers' money. Revenue for that period was over $58 million. $58 million. This is a multi-million dollar business based on what we are told is a charitable, not-for-profit business that enjoys a tax-free status. What's not generally known in the community is that much of the revenue is gained from seizing animals from their owners under the ruse of falsely claiming that the animals are not being treated appropriately. A common feature of the RSPCA, RSPCA's approach has involved the RSPCA harassing owners who appear to have less means and lack the ability to challenge the RSPCA in court. Inspectors seize the healthy animals of high quality and worth to sell on the open market even where there is no evidence of abuse or neglect and owners are supported by evidence from their own vets. Purebred animals have been seized and then sold for several thousands of dollars each. Pregnant animals have been taken and whole litters sold with no compensation paid to the owners. Puppies are particularly at risk of seizure. RSPCA inspectors who organise the seizures often act as the prosecutors and also as a witness in the magistrate's court. Surely this is an abusive process and represents a conflict of interest. Plea bargains are often offered to have an animal returned, 
and they say, if you pay a large amount of money to the RSPCA, you may have your animal returned. If you do not, we will, if you do not pay us, we will kill your animal or sell it to someone else. These sums demanded by the RSPCA are not insignificant, and I'm aware of demands in excess of $40,000 to have animals returned. If challenged and taken to court, owners are stung for ongoing caring costs, where the cases are deliberately dragged out to extend and increase the bills being demanded by RSPCA inspectors to care for the animals. These actions taken by the RSPCA are arguably criminal and must be cr challenged and investigated. Now, I hold considerable evidence of everything I've said today, and I am receiving new complaints on a daily basis from around Australia about outrageous actions of RSPCA inspectors. I've got complaints from vets, pet shop owners, registered breeders and many animal and pet owners. All are universal in saying that inspectors lie in court and harass owners. I've been told by a vet that one of his clients, an elderly man, owned a much-loved old dog that slept at his owner's bedside. The dog was blind in both eyes, and under the vet's care it had a known but treated heart murmur, and it was seized by the RSPCA. The RSPCA held it for two months at high cost and then operated on the dog to remove its eyes. The poor old dog died under the anaesthetic when its heart failed. The old man's heart was broken as his dog was taken unnecessarily and died unnecessarily, yet no compensation was paid. The RSPCA then told other pet owners not to use that vet as retribution when he complained on behalf of the old man. Another practice to put further pressure on owners to give their animals to give their animals to the RSPCA is to charge family members as co-defendants in the alleged offences of failing to care for their animals. This is a current practice. The RSCQ's role as a regulator and genuine protector must be severed from the commercial functions of the organisation to avoid the currently existing conflict of interest. The RSPCA was set up for genuine charitable purposes. Yet sections of this organisation have gone rogue and must be stopped from stealing animals and oppressing genuine, caring animal owners. Is the RSPCA behaving like a charity? Resoundingly, no. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Tuesday, the 3rd of August at 12 noon. Oh, yay.